So uh, my name is Cliff Weisel, and on behalf of our committee, um, the organizing committee, I want to welcome everyone to our workshop today on the foundation and direction of the lung microbiome research. I think there's a lot of opportunities to learn across this whole group, find out some possible areas of common interest, and look for a few collaborations in this pretty much new and evolving area that um, is just beginning to develop. Um, I wanted to introduce Dr. Brad Hillman, who's our Senior Associate Director for the New Jersey Agricultural Experimental Station, just to give some welcoming comments. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Cliff, and uh, for the invitation to be here on behalf of uh, Dean uh, Bob Goodman. Uh, so I'm Director for Research for SEBS and for uh, the Ag Experiment Station. Uh, so, in, in that context, when I, when I look at microbiology across uh, our school, uh, I count more than 50 uh, people, more than 50 faculty members, who's, who have at least a, a fair chunk of what they do being uh, microbiology associated. And that includes interactions among uh, viruses, uh, bacteria, archaea, fungi, lower eukaryotes uh, in, in general with animals, plants, with the environment, uh, and with each other. Uh, pretty much, so, so uh, complexity is, microbial complexity is pretty much what we do here. Uh, and, and so uh, introduction to an area uh, such as this I think is, is really kind of in our wheelhouse. Uh, and, and so I'm really happy to be here to, to learn more about it. Uh, in, in my own work, I, uh, my, in my lab work, I uh, study viruses and transposons and bacterial interactions of a fungus that infects a plant. And so again, it's the, the sort of complexity thing that, that we're really uh, used to. Uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing about this area that I, I know virtually nothing about. Uh, but that in, uh, I teach a comparative virology course, uh, and in the context of that course, for the first time when I taught it uh, last, last year, an undergraduate course, uh, in, in the introductory part and the first lecture, uh, I included interactions of viruses uh, with the uh, gut microbiome. Uh, and, and so again, I'm looking forward to expanding into, into this area so that my first lecture next year maybe we'll uh, have a little different spin to it. Uh, so thanks very much for, for coming. Uh, uh, I know that some of you have traveled a good distance to be here. Uh, thanks, thanks for making that trip. If you have the time, please uh, take a look around the campus. Uh, you might get over to the Rutgers Gardens, which is less than a mile drive from here, so it's a great time of year to uh, be over there to take a look around. Uh, and uh, with that, um, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and get started because I don't see Kathy uh, here yet. <clears throat> Thank you, Brad. Um, we do have <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one change in our um, program. Unfortunately, Dr. Fernando Martinez um, had a loss, a death in the family and he, this week, and he can't come. So with him not being here, I'm going to give a little bit of a overview of what I'm hoping we might accomplish in, in the workshop. And our second speaker, Dr. Coleman, Ron Coleman, is going to expand his and give a little bit more of an overview of the field. So just to remind people, you know, for many, many years, people thought the lung was sterile, other than when you had an infection. We know that's not true now. And, um, and part of the reason was you can't always culture easily some of these bacteria, although we'll hear that culturing still is a, is a significant thing to understand what's going on. So with the advent of DNA sequencing, other molecular techniques, we've I've been able to identify bacteria that, are, that live in your lung continuously from birth and how they evolve and how they may change. Pretty much there are millions of bacteria over each square inch of your surface, and there are pretty much thousands of species across the skin. And, but we don't know the diversity yet. These are, these are things that hopefully we're going to start hearing about today. Everyone knows this, the, what the microbiome, pretty much all organisms. Right? And they cover a very large group, 
bacteria, fungi, protozoa, virus. There are communities that are living in different parts of our body. They are essential probably to our health. And the human microbiome pretty much includes some bacteria across, some microbes across all the domains. What are their role? This is some of the things that we have to find out. But they certainly seem to be involved in maintaining our health and our well-being. In the gut, it's been very clearly described and linked to the immune system, as well as other systems. Their role in the lung, um, hopefully we'll start seeing more. It does serve as your interface between the body and the environment, since it's cloning so much of the surface. So whatever happens in the environment, and particularly in the lung, we're continually breathing, we know about air pollution and its effects, how that interplays, how it gets affected, how it then affects the body is an area that we are just starting to, to examine. It's formed at birth. There seems to have a core composition that follows an individual and it's different from one individual to another through their lifetime, although there certainly are changes. You can have that diversity disturbed, or stirred, get an infection, but then it seems to come back. Given antibiotics, sometimes they come back. It's the same or sometimes different. And how do we return to healing? Those are some of the things that we need to start understanding. This is a classic um, a slide that I've seen produced. This came off, off an NIH site. I really don't understand this one. I'm not a microbiologist. But hopefully people here will start telling us what some of these things mean. Okay. So I'm going to give you a list of questions that I hope maybe we'll start addressing some of these in, in today's workshop and look forward to how we might go in the future. So first of all, how do you actually sample the lung? Right? The skin we know how to get. You can get a skin sample. The gut, we have you know, some ideas of how to get at that. But the lung, we can't just go in to everybody and pull it out, right? So, and there's also differences between, potentially, between the upper and the lower respiratory tract. We need to understand what we're actually collecting when we're collecting a sample. We need to understand the diversity there. I was talking to Leo. He's starting to understand maybe some of the baselines that we have for people. Until we want to we look at how it changes, we need to understand how we're starting. So we want to understand those, both individuals, populations, ethnicities, you name it. What's some of the differences between the healthy and diseased state across populations and individual? How fast does that diversity change and recover after infections, after treatment? Is there a storage place in the body that re to repopulate the microbiome? And what may be the major causes and shifts that we see? Is air pollution doing it for the lung? We don't know. And so and that's my area of interest, how air pollution may affect the microbiome. How does it affect healthy versus disease individuals? We know that air pollution can exacerbate diseases, as well as potentially cause respiratory diseases. You know, asthma is an area that a number of us have studied a long time. We know that the exacerbation can come. How does the microbiome play in that role? Does it change too? And then how does it go over the life cycles? From neonates to babies to children to teens to adults, how does the microbiome change over the life cycle of a person and how important is that? And then well, I'm hoping that maybe at the very end we can come to say what is, what is some of the state of our knowledge now and what are some of the most promising future endeavors we should be going at? This is something I took from a very recent article from 2013 on some of the unanswered questions about the lung microbiome. What are the bacterial communities and lung established after delivery? That seems to be when you establish the, your microbiome at that point. What are the bacterial communities in the lung and how dynamic are they over time? What is the spatial and how homogeneous or heterogeneous is the spatial distribution? Is there geographic variability of the communities? And how do they influence, and how are they influenced by other compartments in the body? The body is not a static system, it's dynamic. You think about the gut, and you think about the lung, yes, there's a connection point. Right? And so when we sample, are we getting that clear, or is, there, is it also going in? And then how are clinical factors, and how is it affected by gender, our lifestyle, vaccination history? You can go on and on. So with that very short introduction, I think I'm going to ask Jag to come up and introduce our first speaker, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing what has to be said. <laughs>
My name is Jag Sundaram. I'm in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine in Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And I have the great pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Ronald Coleman uh, from the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Coleman is a pulmonary and critical care physician and microbiologist. He has led a research program for many years in basic HIV molecular virology and HIV pathogenesis. In the past several years, he has developed a research program applying deep sequencing and bioanalytical metagenomic ap approaches to understand the bacterial, fungal, and viral microbiome communities in the respiratory tract in health and various diseases. Today's talk is titled Lung Bacterial Microbiome with a focus on healthy and lung transplantation with methods to detect authentic LRT inhabitants. Dr. Colin. So, um, Thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak. It looks like this is really going to be a, uh, a, great, uh, a great session. Um, I, 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 and I look forward to all of the speakers. Um, I, I had the unusual experience this morning. You know, mostly what I do is I put a talk together and then I pull slides out to make sure I don't go over time. And Cliff asked me this morning um, to uh, actually expand the talk. And so um, I added in a couple of uh, other uh, points that I hadn't originally uh, planned to be talking about, um, so if this seems a little bit disjointed, uh, I apologize in advance. Mm -hmm. But really, what I want to do is um, uh, focus on the respiratory tract itself um, and try and understand, because it is such a difficult site to sample, try and understand what are some of the challenges to um, identifying what's really going on in the lower respiratory tract, which is really the challenging area. I'm not going to address uh, interactions between microbiome sites elsewhere, such as the gut and the lung, which clearly are very, very important. Um, and, uh, you know, really what Cliff originally asked me to do was to talk about um, some of the methodological uh, challenges, um, a, a uh, uh, decidedly unsexy topic, but. Uh, uh, hopefully, I'll be able to take you through some of the questions that we're grappling with. And this really is still an area that is evolving, emerging, and there are um, uh, uh, a breadth of interpretations of some of the data. Uh, and as I go through it, I'll try and uh, hopefully highlight uh, where some of the uh, issues lie. So, you know, the, the, the traditional dogma is that the healthy lung is sterile. And we know that we don't culture for normal upper respiratory tract inhabitants. And another point that I want to emphasize is that what is sterile? Does sterile mean uh, the absence of live microorganisms? Does sterile mean the absence of live bacteria? Does sterile mean the complete absence of bacterial products, including bacterial DNA? And that's certainly something that's important as we talk about the microbiome, which we typically um, define in molecular terms. But as we approach the question of what's present in the lungs, and I, I, I talk about the lungs as below the glottis, below the vocal cords, I think we can make two assumptions. And one is that if bacteria are present, they'll be very low abundance. Um, if the uh, lung were like the gut, we would have uh, known about that a long time ago. And the second assumption is that given the geographic connection, that whatever we find in the lung may be derived from and could potentially overlap with microorganisms that we find in the upper respiratory tract. And therein lies both um, uh, uh, an important question we need to ask, which is what's the relationship, and an important challenge that we need to overcome. So uh, the challenge is, obviously, in looking at the lower respiratory tract in living individuals is that if you sample with the bronchoscope, which is really the most feasible way to do it, Passing through the high microbial biomass of the upper respiratory tract has the uh, potential for carryover on a bronchoscope and thereby distinguishing what's authentically present in the lower respiratory tract, especially if they overlap. If they're different, if they're markedly different, uh, uh, that may make it easier to distinguish. But then we have the second challenge, which is that any contamination from an environmental source will be disproportionately confounding in a, no, in a low microbial biomass sample. 
So um, the development of micro, the microbiome field was driven by the gut, uh, the uh, skin, the female genital tract, the oral cavity. These are all sites with lots and lots of bacteria and small amounts of contamination that's admixed in from environmental sources really has very little impact. But if you make the assumption that whatever is present in the lung is going to be at low um, density, that may be susceptible to higher impact. So when we started this uh, uh, project, we tried to figure out what would be the most stringent way of asking the question, what is present in the lower respiratory tract? Is, is there a is there a pointer? Is this? Or is there a, there we go. So we try to come up with a method that could help us understand with the highest level of stringency what's present really below the vocal cords. So we started out in a uh, small number of healthy subjects with uh, uh, a procedure that involved two bronchoscopes. And the first bronchoscope, I keep losing, I keep losing the pointer here. Is there a, uh, a laser pointer by chance? Uh -huh. So um, we first sampled the upper respiratory tract with a number of different um, uh, approaches, looking at the nasopharynx, the oropharynx. Great, thank you. Which is which is the pointer? The center, right? Center. Once this is in. Okay. So we came up with an approach whereby we sampled the upper respiratory tract. <clears throat> and then we took a bronchoscope. We used two bronchoscopes for this approach. We took one bronchoscope and we, um, that doesn't look like this is working. Um, we took the first bronchoscope and we went through the upper respiratory tract and went just as far as the vocal cords. And that gave us the opportunity to sample what was absolutely the most proximal upper respiratory point before it went, a bronchoscope might go down. To, okay, before it might go down to the lower respiratory tract. So uh, we sampled the tip, and then we also sampled the channel of that first bronchoscope. We took it out, and then we used the second clean bronchoscope and sampled the lung, and we did serial BALs in adjacent segments with the assumption that carryover from the upper respiratory tract would wash out as we did serial BALs, and the last bronchial alveolar lavage would be the, mo the most reflective of what's authentically present in the lower respiratory tract. We also did a protected specimen brush, a sheath catheter brush on the contralateral side. And then very importantly, um, we looked at environmental contamination controls. Sterile saline, the stuff that gets lavaged through a scope, may not have uh, growing live bacteria, but it's not necessarily DNA free, and same as the channel of a bronchoscope. So, so this is what we found. In the, uh, um, in the red bars are the channels of our two bronchoscopes. This is a 16S qPCR uh, uh, plot on a log scale a way of quantifying the amount of bacterial DNA present. So in the channel of the bronchoscope, uh, the saline that's lavaged through typically gives very low levels, but not always zero, of bacterial DNA. Uh, in the blue bars are samples from the upper respiratory tract. Uh, one is a uh, uh, swab and one is an oropharyngeal wash. Um, and you could see there are very high levels There we go. And as you can see, there are very high levels of bacterial DNA in the upper respiratory tract. In green is the tip and the channel of the first bronchoscope that just wait, made it to the vocal cords, never went through the vocal cords. And we see that there's uh, several, multiple logs, mm -hmm. less bacterial DNA, but they still have quite a bit of DNA. And this is what a scope is going to take with it as it travels down to the lower respiratory tract. And in blue are our serial BAL samples that we see incremental decrease uh, as we wash out what's carried over. And then in gray is a protected specimen brush of the contralateral most proximal mucosa. And so the lung does contain bacterial DNA, but it's at very low levels compared to the upper respiratory tract. So what does this look like? Well, the first question we asked is, what does the uh, environmental control data look like? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a heat map where uh, 
Each uh, row represents a different bacterial family. Each column represents a different sample. They're grouped in groups of uh, uh, six. Uh, these are the, and the color, the intensity of the color represents the relative abundance of each bacterial family within that sample. And so what you could see is that the lavage saline uh, and uh, just the uh, wash through a sterile scope gives us bacterial DNA sequences. There are low numbers of sequences, but you do definitely get reads from it, and it has its own characteristic pattern of environmental admixture. So we need to keep that in mind when we look at um, uh, uh, what we get from the bronchoscope, from, from the BALs. The bronchoscope channel contributes reagents, sterile water, and actually the DNA extraction kits themselves contain microbial DNA. We uh, uh, spent a lot of time looking at different kits. We came up with one kit that seemed to be the least contaminated, um, but those blanks are really important. So now when we look at our lung sample, our respiratory tract samples, here are our oropharyngeal samples. This is the periglottic. This is sampling right at the vocal cords. And then these are our serial lung samples. And what we could see is that these have a characteristic pattern. Again, these are six subjects uh, for each of the sets of samples. A characteristic pattern, the upper respiratory tract has high levels of violinella, various streptococcal species, exactly what you would expect. Uh, the periglottic region has a very similar pattern to what we get from the oropharyngeal wash or an oropharyngeal uh, swab, although it's not exactly the same. And then as we uh, do our cleaner and cleaner lung samples, it looks very similar to the periglottic and upper respiratory samples, although we start to see some additional sequences poking through as we get to these uh, lower microbial biomass samples. So what exactly are these sequences? This is a principal coordinate plot where the um, composition of each community uh, is uh, laid out on here. This is three different axes that um, uh, display uh, the greatest degree of beta diversity, the greatest degree of difference among them. And in yellow here are our various upper respiratory tract and periglottic samples. In green are our environmental controls. That's contamination that comes into the uh, pipeline for analysis. And in blue is BAL. And what we could see from this is that um, essentially BAL overlaps with what's present in the upper respiratory tract, especially the periglottic samples, but then trails out towards what's present in uh, the environmental contamination controls. So BAL that we sample with a bronchoscope, the microbial inhabitants span the space between what's in the periglottic region and what's actually contamination. So, um, there are a couple of points that come uh, from this. The, the bacteria in the lung, in composition and community structure, are essentially identical in composition to the oropharynx, or especially the periglottic region, but much lower in content. And we interpret this as that um, the low microbial biomass, lower respiratory tract, is largely derived in a passive manner from what's present at the glottis. When there are multiple complex when there are two complex communities that are in very different environments, it would be unlikely to have two communities that are each independently growing in two different niches that reveal the same complex community structure. So um, this then gets to the question of what is a microbiome? Does a microbiome mean just the uh, bacteria that are present? Does a microbiome mean bacteria that are authentic inhabitants that are replicating and self-sustaining? Uh, can a microbiome be the um, uh, reflection of transient entrants that may come in, have either no or very limited replication, and then are cleared? So, um, and then the other point is that low microbial biomass samples are strongly impacted by environmental contamination admixture. But getting back to these samples, the fact that what's present in the lower respiratory tract is likely derived largely in a passive manner from the upper respiratory tract, you know, rather than growing and self-replicating independently, does that mean that they're, not, that they're biologically not important? And I would say absolutely not. What this tells us is that there are uh, some BAL samples 
that actually do contain bacteria that very much mirror the upper respiratory tract. And then there are other uh, subjects whose lung samples essentially have no authentic bacteria and really just reflect cross-contamination. And I want to um, uh, um, emphasize uh, some work that I, I, I hope Leo Segal is going to talk about when he speaks later today. Um, he and his group published a paper a couple of years ago that I think makes very importantly the point that these uh, uh, communities that are derived passively from the upper respiratory tract are not biologically inert and actually are uh, an important regulator of the basal tonic immune rheostat in the lower respiratory tract. So I'd say not everybody really has a substantial lower respiratory tract bacteria. So now, can you find authentic lower respiratory tract bacteria? So when we did this study, um, we wanted to set up as high stringency an approach as we can to ask the question, is there anything in the lung that's not derived either from the environmental contamination or from uh, the upper respiratory tract? So um, we set up a set of stringent criteria, and um, uh, we took all of the OTUs that we detected in all of our samples, and we asked, were there any uh, OTUs, the OTU operational taxonomic unit, sort of the uh, uh, sequence-based uh, name for a uh, bacterial DNA sequence, are there any OTUs that are found only in lung samples, not in any upper respiratory tract samples, uh, not in any control samples, and we had about 400 of those. And then asked, do any of them have more than 10 reads? And we asked that question because there is a problem with PCR artifact. You can get artifactual uh, numbers at, 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 at low sequence, artifactual sequences at uh, low, intense, low density. We got about seven OTUs. And now because we had four samples from each subject, are there any OTUs that are present in more than one sample from a subject, independently obtained, independently analyzed, we found two. One of them actually was present in all four independent lung samples from one healthy subject, uh, all three BALs and one protected specimen brush. And this was Trophorema whippoli. It's the agent of Whipple's disease. This was quite a surprise to us. Clearly lung specific in this individual, one out of six, um, and is uh, not a contaminant. It's not present in the upper respiratory tract. So what exactly, now T. whippoli, this is the agent of Whipple's disease. It's a uh, rare gastrointestinal disease. Occasionally can affect the lungs, although that's even rarer. Uh, what does this mean? I'm not sure we know the answer to that. Um, we, we also at the time were working on a uh, project studying HIV infected individuals in a consortium with the Lung HIV Microbiome Project. This is a heat map in which we have uh, HIV negatives, HIV positives on antiretroviral therapy, and HIV positives not on antiretroviral therapy. And you could see we have uh, this line, this uh, row here is the uh, Trophorema row. And uh, what you could see is that we have a couple of people who are really hot for this T. whippoli. And so some people with HIV infection have very high levels of this agent, not previously recognized as a um, uh, uh, lower respiratory tract uh, inhabitant. Um, and in the larger LHMP consortium, this was found to be the case with all six clinical sites, widespread colonization of the lung and HIV infection that can be detected uh, in the lung and not in the upper respiratory tract. So I want to switch gears and talk about um, uh, states where there are high abundance microbial communities. Um, the, the, the approach that we took using the two bronchoscopes um, revealed that what you find in the lower respiratory tract of healthy people either looks like environmental contamination or it looks like the upper respiratory tract. Now, it doesn't mean that you need to use this two bronchoscope approach with every subject. Um, uh, it just was the most stringent way of characterizing the lower respiratory tract community in healthy subjects and know that what we found really was coming from the lung and not coming from carryover. So we picked lung transplantation as a, um, a disease state to look at. So um, people who have lung transplants are immunosuppressed. They have an abnormal cough reflex. They all have some sort of underlying lung disease that uh, drove the transplantation. Um, 
Uh, there are barriers at the anastomotic site, so a lot of reasons that they would have high microbial uh, burden, and in fact, they do. So this is a 16S qPCR of the oropharyngeal wash, and then this is the bronchial alveolar lavage in two different sets of healthy controls and in our lung transplant subjects. And there are 50 or 100 times higher levels of 16S uh, bacterial DNA in um, people with lung transplantation who are uh, completely asymptomatic. These are not people who are being bronch because they have lung infection or something like that. So this is a state of a uh, high lower respiratory tract microbiome. So, you know, how do you deal with understanding these abnormal communities? So a lot of the work in um, other microbial niches, like the gut, um, focus on uh, population-based changes, the changes that are associated with diet, the changes that are associated with obesity, the uh, patterns that are associated with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, that's actually much more difficult in the lung, and, and um, that's shown here. And, and unlike um, looking for community-based structures, uh, structural changes in the microbiome in, in other niches, in specific disease states, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really talking here about lung transplantation. I think uh, you know there are other disease states like asthma, COPD, that have been looked at in a more um, community-based approach, and I think that um, uh, 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 Dr. Martinez was going to be talking about that, and unfortunately I have, have uh, 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 really focused on the lung transplant subject. But in general, people with sick lungs, things are different. You know, uh, I, I like this quote, all happy families are alike and every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Every healthy lung is similar but every unhealthy lung is unhealthy in its own individual way. So other ways that we can characterize the microbiome, authentic lower respiratory tract microbiome in an individual patient-specific way rather than in a community-based way. You know, so here you can look at this and you can, you know, here are our healthy subjects, upper, lower respiratory tract, and our transplant subjects. So, you know, one thing you could do is look at this and say, well, you know, here's, here's a hot spot, here's a hot spot, here's a hot spot. You know, this kind of looks like the upper respiratory tract, this looks different. But are, are there ways that statistically uh, you can uh, 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 analyze what is authentic to the lungs? So we made, uh, uh, we took a statistical approach. We, we started out with the assumption that uh, bacteria that's uh, actually growing in the lung will be enriched in its relative abundance compared to the upper respiratory tract, whereas bacteria that are present in the lung either because it's just carryover on a bronchoscope or because it's passive aspiration without any actual replication in the lower respiratory tract can be distinguished. And uh, if it's a passive uh, uh, entry, the relative abundance within each community will be similar for each taxon, even if the total amount of bacteria in the lower respiratory tract sample is lower, whereas growth in the lung, it'll be relatively enriched. The, the, the challenge with this is, you know, we all do, uh, you know, we take a sample, we do DNA extraction, we sequence it, and then within the entire um, universe of sequences that we get, we assign a relative abundance. But all of that is subject to stochastic variation. And so we first asked the question, can we define what the stochastic variation is? And this is something that, that, that we pay quite a bit of attention to when we assign a particular relative abundance. How confident are we of that relative abundance? So you know, here's a, a, an empirical study that we did whereby we took one BAL sample, subjected it to three independent, or here are two different BAL samples. We subjected it to three independent DNA extractions and sequences, and for every taxon, we assigned a relative abundance. And here we have extraction one compared to extraction two, one to three, so on and so forth. And this is a subject with a high 16S qPCR. This is a subject with a low 16S qPCR, high and low microbial abundance. And um, what, you could, what, what, what we saw and, and so each dot represents an individual bacterial taxon, the x-axis being its relative abundance within the pool 
uh, in extraction one, the y-axis being its relative abundance in the pool uh, in, in extraction two. What we could see is that, in general, there's a reasonably close agreement at bacteria, at taxa, that have high abundances. So if you get a 90% abundance in one extraction, you're going to get pretty close to that in the second extraction. But at low uh, relative abundances, there's a great deal of stochastic variability. A taxon that's identified at a 0 0.0001 abundance one time may be fairly different the next time. And so uh, this shows us two things. One is that um, within an individual community, uh, the stochastic variability is greatest at lower abundances. And um, uh, individuals who have a low total abundance, the stochastic variability is even greater amongst all of their taxa. So we use this to develop some confidence intervals around the relative abundance that we found for any individual taxa. So to ask the question, in a specific individual subject, can you say what's really growing in the lung versus what's passively entered into your BAL sample? We took um, uh, uh, the relative abundance of every taxon in the upper respiratory sample on the x-axis and in the BAL on the y-axis. And every dot, again, represents a taxon with its relative abundance. And here we have two subjects. These were two lung transplant subjects, both of whom were culture positive for Pseudomonas. And um, uh, uh, if that's a common uh, organism found in the lungs. What does it actually mean? And so here we see there, one of these taxa actually does represent Pseudomonas. If um, there's relative enrichment in the lung relative to the upper respiratory tract, it'll uh, lie within uh, this triangle up here, whereas anything that enters passively will lie along this line of identity with similar upper and lower respiratory tract abundances. And we developed confidence intervals that define the outer 95% uh, 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 limits of confidence. And here, this subject, Pseudomonas, is buried here in one of these uh, OTUs, but it's clearly not enriched in the lung. It's not growing in this person's lung. And then here, this red dot here, this represents Pseudomonas, the Pseudomonas OTU in this individual. And this is clearly highly enriched in the lung relative to the upper respiratory tract. And so this is really growing there. So um, can we apply this more broadly to various subjects? Uh, the answer is yes. This is six lung transplant subjects um, uh, that uh, I, I picked out out of our group of about uh, 25 because I think they illustrate points. Uh, this is the subject I, I, I just mentioned, Pseudomonas, nothing is enriched, nothing's going on. Pseudomonas clearly dominated. This is an individual who grew both Acromobacter and Pseudomonas. And um, what do you target your therapy to? And so this tells us that Acromobacter is hugely enriched in this lung sample. There is some statistical, uh, in, there is some enrichment of Pseudomonas, although in fact this didn't really reach um, uh, uh, statistical significance when corrected for false discovery. So this is being driven by Acromobacter, even though both were cultured. Uh, this is an individual um, who uh, grew this age, who uh, revealed this agent. This is a bacteria called Sneathia, something I had never heard of, but it's actually an anaerobe that's recognized as an occasional pathogen in the female genital tract. Never been reported in the lung, but it's an anaerobe, so it would never be cultured from the lung. Respiratory tract samples are not cultured for anaerobes because the upper respiratory tract is just laden with them. Then this is an individual in which we see statistical enrichment of Prevotella, Fusobacter, there's a Violinella in here as well. This is a polymicrobial enrichment of um, uh, multiple taxa that are normal inhabitants of the upper respiratory tract. So Prevotella, uh, uh, Fusobacter, um, uh, Violinella, they normally inhabit the mouth. But these are found in the BAL, markedly enriched relative to the upper respiratory tract. So, this is the molecular signature of aspiration pneumonia, uh, polymicrobial outgrowth of upper respiratory tract samples. You know, and this, this actually can be quite useful in telling us that even in the presence of a positive culture, there's actually no growth in the lower respiratory tract. So I, I, I just want to um, 
mention one caveat, and this is uh, uh, something that we struggle with uh, quite a bit. In these high microbial biomass samples, lung transplant, it's really quite easy to tell what's enriched and have a 95% confidence that that enrichment is real and it's not just due to the stochastics of extraction. Um, in people who, ha in, in subjects who have low lung microbial biomass sample, mi microbial biomass, what you use as your comparator actually can make a big difference. So the easy way to sample the upper respiratory tract is to you know, do an oropharyngeal swab or to do an oral wash and gargle. But really the most proximal place that the uh, bronchoscope is going to see before it enters the lower respiratory tract is the uh, area right at the vocal cords that, not, that includes not just oral secretions, but it also includes nasopharyngeal drainage as well. And so this is the same outlier plot done in a healthy subject with a low microbial biomass, more, statistic, more, 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 more stochastic variation. And here we have the um, BAL sample uh, compared to the oropharyngeal wash. And here there are a couple of statistical outliers. But if we take this, um, uh, you know, this, is, this label is wrong. Uh, this is BAL compared to the tip of scope one. So when we compare it instead of to the oral cavity, when we compare it to the periglottic region, those statistical outliers disappear. So at low mi mi microbial biomass, you can see what appear to be outliers depending upon what the sample is you compare to the uh, lower respiratory tract. So I want to uh, switch gears for a couple of minutes and talk about uh, fungal analysis. So um, fungal analysis uh, uh, can be done with two different uh, types of primer sets. People either use the fungal 18S ribosomal rRNA gene, um, or you can use the internal transcribed spacer sequence. Um, we use the ITS sequences. Uh, even though the um, 18S uh, primers are very specific for fungi, in a site where you have far more human DNA than you do microbial DNA, with the 18S primers, you still get mostly human sequences, whereas the ITS primers really are quite specific. So this is um, a, a sample of our ITS sequencing of oral upper respiratory tract and BAL looking for fungi. Um, and this is a group of uh, HIV positive and HIV negative sequences. And we looked at this, and you know we see uh, aspergillus and candida, cladosporium, we see a bunch of different sequences, and we say, hey, we've got a really uh, rich fungal uh, microbiome here. Um, and then we went ahead and looked at our contamination controls. And as you can see, the contamination controls uh, don't look all that different from what we find actually in the lungs. So how do you distinguish what is really in these lung samples versus what came in from contamination controls? This is really a challenge. Uh, so, so fungal analysis is much less developed than bacterial analysis. Um, there are uh, a number of reasons for it. Uh, one is that the uh, uh, trees and the uh, taxonomy for fungi is just not as well developed. Doing the alignments and assigning o OTUs, you can see there's a whole lot of unclassified stuff down there. And I think that this reflects the limitation of the databases. But environmental contamination is a big issue as well. So there are a couple of ways that you can potentially uh, approach this. Um, one is to ask the question, uh, on a population basis, um, what is the uh, frequency with which you identify a particular um, fungal uh, uh, taxa in different samples? So here we see in green are contamination controls, uh, in blue is BAL, and in red is oral wash. And so we could see the frequency within the entire population is statistically higher for oral wash and BAL for aspergillus. So this tells us that there is aspergillus in the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract in this mixed pool of samples. And uh, same with a number of other fungi. But it doesn't tell you which is the sample that's actually positive. So um, you know because fungi are uh, so ubiquitous and so um, uh, 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 prevalent in environmental samples, we asked whether you can take this data, so microbiome data is 
typically um, uh, analyzed according to relative abundances. So within the entire community, what proportion is this taxon? What proportion is that taxon? Is there a way that we can assign some absolute abundance to the uh, amount of each particular fungus that's present? So during the process of uh, 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 working up these samples, you generate your OTUs, and then you, assign, you quantify the amount of product that you get before it goes into the sequencing reaction. So what we did was um, we came up with a way of transforming the relative abundance of each fungal taxon into uh, an adjusted absolute amount. So the relative abundance of a particular taxon within a community times the total amount of ITS product that was generated, and we did some statistics to show that within uh, uh, biological samples, there was a linear relationship between the amount of fungal DNA that goes in and the amount of PCR amplified ITS product that comes out. And so we, uh, uh, and this is quantified by pica green measurement. So we created a pica green corrected OTU abundance for every OTU uh, identified in our sample, in our samples. And then we asked the question, in the environmental contamination controls, is there a level of adjusted um, uh, 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 fungal OTU DNA by which we could exclude 95% of all contamination. And so this is the histogram that shows what the OTU, pica green adjusted OTU abundance is of our contamination controls. Most are quite low. Uh, a few are relatively high. And the 95% cutoff here in this particular sample set is 0.3 nanograms per microliter. So any OTU that comes up above this level has a 95% likelihood of being authentically from our sample and not something that just came in with uh, contamination. And so when we took that um, uh, heat map that I showed you a couple of slides ago, and then we adjust it for the amount of uh, absolute uh, OTU abundance, and then we removed everything that fell below that 0.3 uh, threshold, this is what we see. So this is a group of uh, healthy HIV subjects, uh, healthy subjects without HIV infection, and a grab bag of mixed lung disease. Uh, we could see in healthy subjects, uh, in the BAL, one sample has aspergillus that exceeds the level that we uh, can say is a 95% threshold. So there's a 5% chance that this is actually a contamination source, 95% chance it's really from the lung. Uh, in HIV-positive individuals, we see aspergillus, cryptococcus, pneumocystis, microascus, and so this is biologically plausible because these are individuals who one might imagine could be colonized, even if healthy, colonized in the lung by these organisms. And we see a similar population in our mixed lung disease. So this is one approach that one can take to try and identify on an individual-specific basis what is um, authentically present in the lung and not derived from contamination. So I want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about um, uh, the virome uh, of the lung. So uh, you know, uh, viruses don't have sequence tags uh, like uh, bacterial 16S or uh, fungal uh, uh, ITS. Um, so uh, shotgun uh, metagenomics is really the only way that we can approach the uh, virome. Um, obviously, in a highly cellular sample like BAL, uh, the overwhelming majority of sequences uh, will come from a human source. So we take our BAL sample through a uh, particle purification step. Um, we uh, uh, then take those purified particles. Um, we uh, nuclease treat them to try and uh, eliminate any uh, nucleic acid that's not contained within a particle. It goes into uh, an alumina shotgun sequencing. And then our pipeline involves stripping out all the human and bacterial reads, generating contigs by stitching the reads together and aligning with various databases uh, to identify known or potential viruses. And then if we find viruses of potential interest, validating them with uh, qPCR. So here's, uh, this doesn't project very well, uh, here's a set of HIV positive and lung transplant subjects. We got uh, um, a large number of reads. 
And of these metagenomic reads, so after we strip out human, after we strip out known bacterial sequences, um, about 80% of the sequence reads don't match any known sequences. And this is really consistent with what's been reported uh, in the gut, skin, and other sites. Now, what these unknown sequences are isn't clear. Uh, perhaps these are phages, bacteriophages, because that's an incredibly complex population that's just been very poorly referenced. Uh, maybe these are uh, as yet uh, un unrecognized eukaryotic viruses. So a few match bacteriophages, and you know, up to about a quarter match known viruses, a few herpes viruses, a few papilloma viruses, but the overwhelming majority of what we found were Nello viruses. So Nello viruses are um, relatively newly described. They're small circular DNA viruses. They're incredibly diverse. They have multiple subfamilies that differ in their genetic structure. Uh, really not very well known. They're ubiquitous, um, and it's not clear that they have any association with uh, pathogenesis, but really they haven't been studied uh, uh, very well. So the first thing we did was to generate contigs to stitch together the uh, uh, individual reads, generate the con contigs, make primers, and then validate that these contigs really reflected authentic uh, viruses. And we did uh, validate uh, our contigs. Here are um, three different contigs, I think uh, over, uh, up to about 1,000 bases. These cover the ORF1 gene of uh, Anello viruses. And so uh, on one axis here are our, sequ uh, our sequences. On the y-axis is a reference a database uh, sequence for that uh, uh, particular virus. So uh, these validated. And it turns out that these Anello virus populations are incredibly complex. So um, taking our contigs and our sequences, well, I guess the Mac to PC translation didn't work all that well. These are not, these are not actually in Chinese, but uh, the, <laughs> The, the, the specific name of the Anello virus doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, but, you know, we found uh, dozens and dozens of different Anello viruses, and then these are individual subjects. Each column is an individual subject, and we could see some subjects had, you know, two or three different Anello viruses identified in their lungs. Some subjects we had, um, you know, several dozen different Anello viruses based upon reference database alignment. So these are complex populations. We call them viral blooms uh, in, in, in the lung. Um, this is a uh, distribution of the Anello viruses, and you can see the complexity of the family and the distribution amongst these subjects. Now, how about quantification? So if we use qPCR to quantify the levels of Anello viruses, um, you know, the, the metagenomic sequencing can give us a clue to what's present. It's not highly quantitative. But qPCR shows us that healthy people and HIV-positive people who are otherwise healthy do have Anello viruses detectable, but at quite low levels. And then we have many logs higher Anello viruses in the lungs of our lung transplant subjects. Um, are there relationships between different um, uh, 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 kingdoms of life. Well, I guess viruses aren't exactly a kingdom, but are there um, relationships between our different microbial um, types of communities? Uh, in our lung transplant population, the answer is yes. So here's a, a set of a couple of dozen transplant subjects. The bacterial microbiome is plotted in a PCA plot here on the X and Y axis, and then the Anello virus titer is shown by the um, size of the circle assigned to that community. And we took, uh, we, we, we asked, how far is the bacterial community in this subject from a normal bacterial community? So the dot here, right in the center of these lines, is the centroid of what a normal lung bacterial community looks like. The length of the line uh, is a measure of how dysbiotic the bacterial community is of that transplant subject. And uh, the size of the circle is the viral, is the Anello virus titer. And it turns out that there is a uh, correlation between the level of Anello viruses in a lung transplant and the length of this line, in other words, how abnormal is their bacterial community. So this is a novel form of covariation saying that the virome correlates with the bacterial microbiome. 
Uh, these, these viral titers didn't correlate with uh, immunosuppression, pre-transplant diagnosis, or any other clinical factor we could find. So the bacterial and the viral microbiome uh, aberrancy correlating uh, either are both impacted by some uh, yet unclear host factor, or perhaps the bacterial microbiome aberrancy is driving the viral, or perhaps the virome is driving the bacterial microbiome. So um, uh, there are relationships between different communities. So um, just to uh, uh, summarize the key points, uh, healthy subjects, lung, BAL, has a very low microbial biomass. The composition is impacted both by the upper respiratory tract carryover on a bronchoscope and by contamination from instruments and reagents. And in the most stringent BAL we could find, the composition is nearly identical to the most proximal upper respiratory tract. And so we think that means it's largely derived from. And again, it doesn't mean that it's not biologically important. Um, and differences from the upper respiratory tract are mainly driven by contaminants that disproportionately impact low microbial biomass samples. And in these types of samples, the community that you use to compare the lung with can make a difference in what appears to be different in the lung versus the upper respiratory tract. Um, you can find there, there are uh, some unique lung-specific bacteria. Uh, T. whippoli is the one that I mentioned and the one that uh, we've been able to uh, uh, most broadly uh, uh, validate along with the LHMP consortium. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, statistical approaches that account for the stochastic nature of DNA extraction and sequencing really is something that needs to be taken into account when assigning abundances to any particular taxon. Environmental contamination really impacts fungal analysis. That's, that's really a, a major challenge. It's much more stochastic than it is for bacterial even. Uh, it can be overcome by frequency-based analysis or absolute adjusted abundances, which is an approach that we've taken that can be used on a per-subject basis. And that uh, shotgun metagenomics of cell-depleted uh, DNA reveals in our hands anelloviruses, a lot of dark matter, uh, whether this represents novel eukaryotic viruses that uh, have yet to be identified, I think um, uh, uh, remains to be determined, but there certainly is a universe there to be explored. So um, thanks very much. I want to acknowledge the people uh, uh, who do this work. First, my close collaborator, Rick Bushman at the University of Pennsylvania, um, a number of key people. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but uh, obviously uh, many people contributed to this work. So thank you very much. Aldo Segal, and it gives me great pleasure. We've been collaborating. Um, Leo is an assistant professor of medicine at NYU, where he got his pulmonary and critical care training. He got his MD degree and in initial training in Argentina, and since he's been in NYU, he's been doing microbiome research under the mentorship of Martin Blazer. He has a K award studying the microbiome of COPD. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's going to talk about sampling the lower airway microbiome. Who has it right? Leo? All right. Thank, thanks for the invitation. And uh, thanks, uh, Ron, that actually covered a lot of uh, 
the background that I, that I think is very important, and I'm, I hope I don't overlap too much, but I'm going to try to build on, on some of the, the, the concepts that, that he brought in. Um, the title, I'm not going to respond to this answer because I don't, I'm not sure that we have it, and I, I don't see that I have the authority to, to have that answer, but mm -hmm. it's interesting that several years into the microbiome, we're still asking this question when other, when, when other people doing microbiome in other sites are not having this question. And that's for various reasons. Most of them were the one that uh, Ron pointed out before. So we have, very simplistically, three ways to sample the lower airway tract. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk much about surgery. Um, I think feasibility is obviously uh, a challenge. And, and there are other confounders that, uh, like Ron pointed out about uh, considering uh, immunosuppression, considering antibiotic use that are not root, that, that needs to be carefully measured when, when you use surgical approaches, uh, which are mostly restricted to transplant. Um, so I'm going to touch spiro, on spiro mainly on, on bronchoscopy, and similar to, to what Ron discussed before, I think this has to be in consideration of what's of the other two important microbial environments, the upper airway microbiome and the background microbiome. I'm going to get the spirum out of the way quite quickly, uh, not because I don't think that it's useful, but I, but, but, I, but I just want to highlight the challenges here. Um, this is a study um, in PNAS on the spirum microbiome versus versus the tissue microbiome in cystic fibrosis, a disease that nobody will question that they have a high bacterial burden in their lower arteries. As you see, most of the patients are colonized, um, uh, and their lung are colonized with pseudomonas, as uh, represented by L. Um. Which one is the pointer? It's not working. Okay. So L is the, the lung tissue samples. And when you compare this with a, with a throat swab or with, with sputum, you can see that in three out of three of the throat swab, um, uh, in three out of three of the, of, the, of the subjects, the throat swab does not represent what's in the lower airways, what is in the lung. And when you look at the, in the, in the sputum versus the lower airways, you get a flip of a coin. Um, and obviously, this will impact any interpretation of the, that you do on the microbial communities, um, not just taxonomic assignment, but also how to understand the diversity of the microbial communities. So basically, you are dealing with a system where the, you have a lot of overlap and impact on the upper airway microbiome into your, your, lower, your interpretation of the lower airway microbiome. Now, Considering, if you try to consider this in the setting of, of lung health, I just wanted to point out one thing that, that Ron mentioned before. If you measure, quant if you quantify how much bacterial DNA you have, this is a different situation that it is in cystic fibrosis. In healthy lung, you have about two, three logs lower amount of bacteria DNA than in the upper airways. And this has been shown by us and others. So you can imagine that this situation of the superimposition or, or the contamination of the upper airway microbiome into the lower airway, into what you think is the lower airway microbiome, can only be worse. Now, I didn't put this slide to show that I might have infringed some copyrights when I put the, this figure after Ron published the, the Blue Journal article. But um, just to show that, you know, people have different approaches to, to bronchoscopy which is the main way we, we sample the lower airway microbiota. Um, one simple question is, uh, well, some people go through the oral cavity, some go through the nose. Is there differences? We know that the, um, those two environments, um, the, the nasopharynge and the oropharynge, have very different microbiota. Again, uh, the group from Penn showing that uh, how how samples from the oropharynx versus the neuropharynx differ, um, and you can see that in the heat maps that, that comes from the same paper that was referred before. So if we go through those two different 
routes for sampling the lower airways, are we infringing any bias on our lower airway microbiome assessment? There's no good data, nobody has done, at least to my knowledge, on the same patient, two bronchoscopies, one through the nose, one through the oral cavity. The only thing that I know is what Bob Dixon was able to squeeze in the, in the transplant paper, showing that in a, in a group of subjects that, that they were doing bronchoscopy, if you, they examine those that have bronchoscopy done through the nose versus those that have the bronchoscopy done through the oral cavity, there's no uh, bias, there's no uh, distinct microbiota based on, on the approach. So when I, when I started doing this, uh, there was uh, an NHLBI meeting and I had uh, I, I was lucky enough to run into uh, Ron Coleman, and he, that's where I learned that what we were starting to do was not probably the right approach, initial approach, and that we needed to understand what is the background, that we needed to understand what is supraglottic. So um, that's when we start doing also the two bronchoscope technique. Doesn't mean, like I agree, that doesn't mean that it has to be done on every single bronchoscopy, but at least at this stage where I was trying to understand what is the lung microbiome in healthy subjects, I felt that I needed. Um, so this, are, this is a PCOA um, that shows environmental samples that are basically the sterile saline uh, or, the, or the supraglottic samples obtained with a, with, with a separate scope. Um, and you can see that they are well defined into a, two spatial clusters. Um, when you look at what is the BAL microbiome uh, obtained with a separate scope, you can see, similar to what we said before, that either it's superimposed into the supraglottic spatial area or the background, the background area. Um, this, is not, this was not novel. I didn't invent anything at that time. The, the consortium came out with a paper in, in the, the Troferima paper had, in, had this uh, figure showing that when you compare oral, uh, oral, oral samples in, in orange, the background samples are not well projected in light green over there, your lung samples in blue superimposing those two areas. But we took a slightly different approach. We say, okay, let's get rid of the background and let's, see, let's treat those, those two areas as, as different and unique. So we had samples, BAL samples, that fall into the backgrounds, BAL samples that fall into the supraglottic. Let's call it something else. So we're gonna, we call them pneumotype BPT for background predominant taxa or, or, or pneumotype SPT for supraglottic predominant taxa. So then we're dealing with two, two situations. One, where your BAL samples can resemble a lot of the background, the other one, uh, where you have, uh, you have there, there resemble a lot of supraglottic uh, samples. So two different uh, scenarios, two different challenges. So what is enriched, already shown, I'm not gonna go too much on it, but super, the, just to show that supraglottic samples are very, trying to be very consistent, background samples trying to be very consistent on what they have. Uh, usually skin contaminants in background, or oral stuff such as Prevotella, Veionella, Strep in the, in the supraglottic samples, and then your lung samples can look either one way or another. You, they can look like supraglottic, they can look like background. Ron already showed you the, the, this approach of, um, uh, of looking with single outlier plots, what is enriched, what is not. Um, but now we have expanded this um, with, with a larger cohort, with obtaining samples from Pittsburgh and Ohio, and um, in a different platform, we look at the same thing. We look at, is, is this pattern of two different microbiota uh, consistent and, 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 and not just site-specific? And again, these are, in red, are the upper airway samples, in yellow are the environmental samples, and in blue are gonna be the BAL, and as you can see, they can, either cluster close to supraglottic or cluster close to, to background. And this is not just an NYU signal. Again, the colors are not very good, but uh, it's not site-specific. It happens in both centers. But what we found 
it, when we when we did this, um, we we switch platforms. We switch. Uh, uh, from a 454 approach to a MySeq approach, we switched primers from V1, V2 to V4. And what was interesting is that I, start, I stopped seeing the stacks that I used to see as background. So uh, that was a little bit of a puzzle. And, and um, so we, we compare, in pair samples that we have done, um, 454 sequencing and MySeq sequencing, we compare what, what are the taxonomic differences between those two taxonomic approaches. And since background and supraglottic are the most consistent microbiome, we did it for them. And these are cladograms that basically represent um, different, at different taxonomic levels uh, pair comparisons between one approach, in this case, 454 versus another approach, MySeq. And when you see red, it means that they are enriched in a 454 these are taxa that would be enriched if you do it in a 454 platform. If you sit in green, these are taxa that would be enriched in a MySeq platform. And in both upper airway and background, you see a lot that, that will differ depending on your approach. And you can, do, you can look at the relative abundance uh, on, on comparing these two. And, but I don't plan that you are able to read this. I just want to show you that those that are highlighted uh, that in the, in the squares uh, are taxa that are specifically uh, assigned to or, or, uh, or, or distinguishable for predicting that, that this is background. So basically, where you find differences when you change platforms, when you change your reagents, is going to be the background. Um, this is supported by others that have also done similar work looking at what happens in low biomass samples uh, when you change uh, reagents? And basically, um, there are. If this is in this uh, in this paper in Microbiome, um, there are samples that when you dilute your amplicons and you resequence, you get a linear correlation. So the more diluted, the lo the lower the relative abundance. Whereas there is other taxa that the relative abundance doesn't change. That's expression that you are diluting a contaminant uh, on, the, on, on the applicants before you put the sequence, whereas the others is probably revealing a true taxa. And that will impact your interpretation, either of your microbial community composition in a PCOA, or if you do these co-occurrence networks. And these are samples that were done in oropharyngeal samples and nasal swab. So this can only be uh, um, the same or worse in the, in the lower airways. An abstract was uh, uh, presented in, in this ATS conference showing something similar uh, where they test different kits and they show that um, you may have, uh, if you use different kits, you may have a differential clustering of samples and when you remove the OTUs that are identified as contaminants, your clustering disappears. So you have to be very careful about it. So I think I deliver a lot of bad news. This is hard, this is tough, and, 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 and we, we have to control for multiple uh, possible contaminants. Let me give you a better spin, a good spin. So this is what we published, that um, uh, if you have a microbiota that is enriched with supraglottic taxa, first you have higher bacterial burden, okay? You have higher bacterial load by 60s. Second, you have higher lymphocytes and you have higher neutrophils in those BALs. Third, we did the XLNO before the bronchoscopy, which was also higher in pneumotype SPT as compared with BPT, which supported that the inflammatory phenotype preceded the bronchoscopy. So we think this is real. So then, how are those two different microbial communities different? Okay, so to, now we are exploring about functional aspects of those two microbial communities. I show you in a PCOA, this is pneumotype BPT, this is pneumotype SPT. They're different in beta, beta diversity. If you, do, if you evaluate taxonomic differences in a cladogram, they're going to be very different. But what is interesting is that if you predict the metagenome um, uh, using a, a prediction model called PyCRAS, you're going to have um, also distinct uh, 
clusters based on what genes are present in those two microbial communities, okay? Uh, so using that, the KO database, uh, this would be pneumotype BPT, this is SPT, so genetically different. If you assign an annotation based on, on the database, uh, on the CAC database, uh, this affects multiple metabolic pathways um, uh, as shown in a similar type of cladogram. Um, so metabolically it should be different. So they should be doing something different. So we, we now needed to correlate this with an independent uh, system. So in order we have an idea of what's happening in terms of the microbial community and composition and what functionally they might be able to do, we now are trying to say, okay, let's see if that's true, if they are doing something to the lower our environment. So one approach was to uh, do a metabolome approach. With, we, we basically did a screening panel with the help of UC Davis, and um, we found that there was a lot of overlap in the metabolites. Um, uh, these were a total of 120 annotated metabolites, and then there were several spikes that we don't know what they are. So if you just analyze the ones that are annotated, you identify some metabolites that might be different between these two pneumotypes, but not a lot, a lot of superimposition. But if you now then use um, methods, uh, in silico methods, to try to identify which of to use are more predictive of having a significant correlation with those, me those metabolites that are differentially present in one pneumotype versus the other, you have, um, you have a significant number, you have a, a number of all to use that are predictive. We then look at what are the relative abundance are on those two, on samples from those two nemotypes. It turns out most of them are in nemotype SPT. And if you look at the annotation, again, it's not projecting very well. They're all streptococcus, prevotella, veionella, things that we find associated with SPT. So that helps us to now say, okay, let's look at the correlations between functional aspects by, by metagenome uh, analysis versus metabolome analysis. And uh, if you look at the whole group as a, as, as a group, those samples that are SPT or BPT, your, the correlations are kind of weak. But if you now eliminate those samples that are BPT, that are enriched with background, and you just do this analysis on samples that have supraglottic predominant taxa, you start finding correlations. Your heat map starts making sense, and this is a heat map basically where we're just displaying the RHO value of each metabolic pathway and metabolites. So another independent approach that we took was say, let's examine the host phenotype and let's see if there is evidence that if that is associated with a distinct microbial environment. So um, we've been doing flow cytometry to do TH17 and T-Rex out of VAL cells um, and consistent with what happened in the gut mucosa. You can see when you examine a balance of TH17, T-Rex, the VAL lymphocytes are um, favoring T a TH17 phenotype, whereas the, the systemic blood will favor a T-Rex phenotype. This is consistent with the lung being a site of immune surveillance. But now we ask the question, are, is the TH17 cells, a group of cells that are extremely important for, for, for mucosal immunity, is, are very different in levels between the two pneumotypes? And we find higher levels of TH17 in pneumotype SPT as compared with BPT. Using concentrated BAL fluid, we, we can measure cytokines in, in a Luminex platform. Similar thing, we find higher levels of inflammatory cytokines uh, associated with uh, pneumotype SPT. And when we, took, when we take the alveolar macrophages and we culture them for 24 hours in presence or absence of LPS, we can see that their response to LPS, uh, those alveolar macrophages that come from a subject that have enriched with supraglottic taxa, those alveolar macrophages behave differently. They produce less cytokines, like they have a blunt TLR response. Um, so we're trying to understand what, what each of this means, but I think the, the, the key here that I'm trying to get across is that I think there are multiple methods that we have to do, but 
looking at functional aspects and how those functional aspects of the microbiome may be impacting the host, I think is key. So just to summarize, I, we describe uh, nothing novel, actually. It's, it's pretty much what everybody else is now um, uh, recognizing. Um, and, and it was originally recognized in, 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 the, in, the, in what I consider the first micro, lung microbiome paper uh, in, in the Blue Journal, that you can have a lung that resembles a lot like the background, a lung microbiome that resembles a lot like the background. And in that case, what's happening? Well, maybe, you know, you get, um, you, you can see some bacterial DNA I'm not sure if it is dead or alive. There are some data that suggest that it might still be some, some alive, but I don't know. But um, it, it might be all, you know, just contaminant. Um, that maybe because you have a very good mucociliary clearance, and that maybe that's why we grew up believing that the lung was sterile. Um, in that sense, you have this situation where there's a lot of overlap between the background and the, uh, the, the lung a microbiome, and, and that's where background subtraction techniques are probably the way to go. And maybe it will be very, very hard to find a signal in those, uh, in those samples. A different challenge are the ones that have uh, an enrichment with oral taxa. Um, I think um, the risk of carryover is, is, uh, is very important and you need to measure somehow. Um, but I, I also think that uh, in those samples, if you find other surrogate, other factor that might be associated with it, a different reset in your host immune phenotype, I think that's important. So if that pneumotype is associated with higher inflammatory cells, higher inflammatory cytokines, we're very interested on the TH17 signal, on the control regulatory mechanism of alveolar macrophages, I think that's very important. And I think that may be may be able to dissect areas where we can actually impact with therapies. Um, and then we can try to tease those, those two microbial environments apart. They're interrelated. The source of entrance is the, is the upper airway. There are exceptions, certainly, where, where we don't know where we might be coming. The trophorema is one example. The, there might be bacterial translocation in, in, in sepsis. I'm talking in, in, in a healthy lung, uh, it's predominantly going to be upper airway. But then one approach is uh, dealing with, uh, with sub, sub, trying to subtract. I can tell you, if you try to subtract both the supraglottic, some, both the supraglottic and the background out of the BAL, so if you, if you do something like we call source tracking, you can subtract out all to use from background and from superglory, from your BAL, in a healthy lung, you end up with nothing. So, um, and the fact that this is associated with a distinct host immune phenotype and that it correlates with metabolic profiles, I think is very promising. So, with that, um, I, I, I want to acknowledge my mentor, Mari Blazer. Um, Jose Clemente is somebody that we have clo all close by. He's at Sinai. He's one of the developers of Chime, um, and, and he's a great resource. Um, and uh, collaborators at, at uh, like Alison Morris and Philip Diaz uh, uh, and, and the funding support. Thank you. here at the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences. And what I've, just as a, a slight sort of mind dump for you, what, what, what I sort of see here is that the work that I and my colleagues do in rivers and streams and um, groundwaters is really a matter of scale in terms of the microbiology, whereas what our colleagues have demonstrated is that their scale 
is this big. Our scale is this big, right? Um, yet, I think uh, we can learn from one another in terms of tools, techniques, and approaches because we're all microbiologists, so I'm stopping there, okay? Um, I have the pleasure of introducing the molecular analysis section um, this morning, and our first speaker is Jillian Waters. She's from Cornell University. Um, her doctorate is from the University of Illinois with Abigail Saliers, and um, she is now working as a postdoc with um, um, Ruth Lay at the Cornell Labs, and um, her presentation is what can we learn from the gut current methods in microbiome research? Right. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, so, um, as Lily said, I am currently a postdoc in Ruth Lay's lab at Cornell University. I've been there for, it'll be almost two years this summer. So, to quote Carl Stetter, I love bacteria. I think it's just amazing the diversity of where they can live and what they can do. Um, my background uh, up until joining Ruth's lab was in bacterial genetics. So I was used to thinking of just one organism and kind of what they do in a very limited context. So it's been a very fun transition um, to start thinking about how they're interacting with um, other organisms in their communities and within their hosts. Um, so hopefully also since I'm somewhat new to this microbiome field, um, for anyone else in the audience that also may be new about thinking um, of this Maybe I can hopefully share some of the things that I've encountered in my learning experience. Um, so in Ruth's lab, common uh, things that we're really interested in thinking about are how the microbiota affects the host phenotype. So one particular phenotype that I am particularly interested in is obesity. And as we know, um, different host phenotypes such as obesity can result in uh, a different community structure in terms of the gut microbiota. Using mouse transfers, we also know that the gut microbiota itself can also dictate host phenotype. And lately, we've been really interested in thinking how host genetics can also influence who's there and in what abundance in the gut microbiome. So I'd also just like to say after um, the talks we've had this morning, I have a newfound appreciation of just how much easier it is to obtain the samples that we're working with. Um, so, yes, that does not sound very easy. So although we're mostly focused on the microbes living in the human gut, we do have some collaborations and other projects that require us to think about working with low biomass samples. Um, so one uh, former postdoc in our lab, Anders, um, so he devised a method for how we handle our lower biomass, very high, um, highly sensitive samples. Mm -hmm. I think what he was actually working with in particular was some fact sorting um, 
And this has been really useful for other applications that we're using in the lab. So we call this the um, Anders Janssen clean PCR method. And this is where he's devised a technique where we can actually test to make sure that we can maintain samples that stay, that have no detectable amplification after 35 cycles. So having a clean PCR product at 35 cycles is not difficult if you're using gene-specific primers. But as I said, I love bacteria, and I think all of us in this room can probably appreciate how bacteria are everywhere. So if we're using 16S primers, it's a lot more difficult to keep those uh, amplification products clean at 35 cycles. So I'd also like to point out that when we are using the PCR for our microbiota uh, sequencing, we're doing this at 25 cycles. So if we can keep a product clean at 35, we're pretty certain we're not introducing further contamination for the sequencing performed at 25 cycles. So this came up earlier with the problem of um, reagents used for sequencing being dirty. Um, so we definitely would not disagree with that. So one of the other things that we personally do in the lab to ensure that we're not introducing any contaminants is we routinely test the reagents that we're using for sequencing. Um, we actually only do this at 30 cycles because to have a clean 35 cycles is very difficult. But again, since we're only doing 25 cycles, um, if it stays clean at 30 cycles, we're pretty sure that we're not introducing any extra contamination into our sequencing pipeline. So what we do in this case is we actually have a dedicated biosafety cabinet that is only used for very sensitive samples. We have a separate one upstairs that we use for when we're aliquoting our stool or using amplicons or anything else. So this BSC is on a separate floor, separate room. There are no amplicons whatsoever allowed into this BSC. There are no samples like stool or anything else. We also do not allow anything else that is high DNA to enter this BSC. So as you can maybe see from the picture, it is full of supplies. That is because we only allow a dedicated set of pipettes and tips that they stay in here. They're not allowed to go upstairs. Conversely, anything that comes from the upstairs, er, granted some things have to come from upstairs, but as far as the pipettes, tips, razor blades to open these supplies, those all stay down here. They don't go out, and we don't try to let anything else that could be dirty or contaminated come in. Um, same thing with the PCR plates, the foil, everything else stays down there. When we're setting up this BSC, um, everything is only touched with gloved hands. We use Tyvek sleeves. Those Tyvek sleeves are disposed of after each use. We also even have separate lab coats that are also disposable that only stay down here and don't come up into the main lab. Um, so that one of the other things that's very important too, um, so as you'll see here for a while, we actually had a lock on here. This is in a common use space. We didn't want anyone else trying to use this. Turned out that the lock didn't actually adhere to the glass very well, but we have a copious amount of signage all over saying to please not use this or if someone really wants to, to come and ask a lab member. Um, some of the other things that we think about with using this is that not only are we extremely particular about what's going into that BSC, how the hood is set up. Um, in addition, Anders took it one step further and if you have been in the mouse facility, if you have touched any amplicons, done anything else with a high DNA sample, you shouldn't be working with a sensitive sample on the BSC that day. Um, so this is why working with any um, particular samples to try and maintain ultra cleanness with them, um, he'd try and do it first thing in the morning. Um, so with that, so as I said, we're very particular about all the supplies. Um, I'm sure many of you in here also use this, but DNA out, everything is sprayed thoroughly in there. Um, when stuff is brought in, uh, I said gloved hands, Tyvek sleeves uh, to bring everything else. So let's say your ice bucket, that is also sprayed very heavily on the outside. We then UV any possible supply or reagent. Um, 
That does include the lab coat. It's folded in a way so that way the chest part that's the most likely to be exposed in there is what's being UV'd. The Tyvek sleeves are also UV'd. Um, they also like to work in a way where double gloving, obviously not touching the lip of the tubes that are being worked with. If you happen to touch the ice that's in that ice bucket, you have to change your gloves. Um, so the nice thing is, is, as you can see here from just looking at a gel analysis here, here's one example. Um, every single one of these lanes here is an actual PCR uh, product, which we can see nothing, along with the positive controls. Um, so Onder's method of stringency has worked out very well for minimizing any sort of contamination with the more sensitive samples that we happen to work with in the lab. As I said, I feel very fortunate that I tend to stick to stool. Um, so with this, so I'll also just kind of say now, I decided to kind of go over all of the things that we do in the lab that may be of use in here. So now jumping to the, so I talked about how we set up um, the PCRs and such. So with the DNA extraction methods, uh, we're using a 96-well plate format. Um, I know some people that are doing many, many amounts of samples that are actually doing like old phenol chloroform extractions. I'm very happy that we're able to use these instead. Uh, we personally are using the Mobio Power Soil Kit. It seems to work pretty well for us. Um, as far as performing the DNA extraction as well as amplicon pooling, we are using an EP Motion robot, which saves um, a lot of uh, repeat uh, error from, or not, excuse me, error, but uh, repetitive stress injuries. Um, the one thing I would say is I don't, uh, at least with the stool samples, um, because we try to dilute them out somewhat, but there, there's solid matter in them. So the one thing is that with our EP motion robot, I don't know if anyone else in here is using something similar, but we actually do have someone, we physically watch the robot as it's doing the DNA extraction, because what can happen is a tip can become clogged and it can sort of spit samples out. Um, but so at least as far as man hours, someone still has to sit there and watch the robot, but at least they're not getting a repetitive stress injury from all of the manual pipetting. Um, so for how we choose to set our plates up, we um, have one blank, uh, roughly one blank per column. We're using about two plates per MySeq run when we do this. One of the other uh, tools that has come in really handy in our lab is the use of an internal standard. Um, so because, so here I'm showing just a typical stool sample plate. Um, so in this case for our stool extractions, we do have a uh, stool sample internal standard. Uh, we usually tend to put about one to two per plate. So this was the idea of Julia Goodrich, who is a graduate student in the lab. She uh, works with numerous amounts of human samples. She has a cohort. She was looking at heritability of over a thousand individuals, multiple samples. So we have plates and plates and plates of samples that she's sequencing. So she's the one that came up with this idea of using an internal standard to see, because as many of us in here know, that you can have variation between sequencing runs. Um, Again, this is pretty easy because it's not too hard to convince someone to donate a stool sample. Um, so one person in the lab generously made a donation. Uh, that entire sample uh, was homogenized and aliquoted. So we have you know, about 200 Eppendorf tubes in the freezer uh, of a well homogenized sample. We tend to put about 100 milligrams of stool sample uh, into each reaction, which is uh, what this sample was aliquoted into. And again, we put one to two per plate. So a couple of examples um, of how this could come in handy. So this is actually some of my data here. Um, it's not too important exactly what it is. Um, so mentioned before, this is a PCOA plot. Um, so here, uh, this is a human donor stool. So this is actually from a mouse study. So these are our gavage samples. Um, so not surprising that this cluster is, this is human stool, this is after it's been put into a mouse. A mouse community looks a little different than uh, what was originally in a human, but when I first saw this, so right now I have them colored by time point. I was really excited to see that I have these two clusters here. I thought I had some breakthrough. <laughs> 
it didn't quite make sense why I was seeing a difference between these time points, knowing uh, what was going on between them. And then at first I was worried that because between these time points I had to go to a conference in Korea, so someone from the mouse facility was handling my mice, so maybe they did something. Well, turns out that this was actually based on the sequencing run. At this time, I had forgot to put that into my mapping file, so any other graduate students or postdocs, don't forget to put any, any minute detail, this is a pretty important one, into your mapping file. If I would have remembered to do that, that probably would have saved me about an hour. If I had this colored here by sequencing run, though, this, that's why this cluster is separate from this one or I anticipate that's what it is. So what happened is these time points were taken, um, were sequenced before we had the use of the internal standard on the lab. This actually right here is the internal standard that was put on that plate. Now if I would have had them in the sequencing run, I probably could have seen that maybe it would have clustered with these and that this is a genuine difference between my time points. But what I expect to see is that it's probably a difference between runs. Um, so now I have to resequence all of these samples. Another time it came in handy, so this is an example here of, so Julia who has plates and plates and plates of her twins that she sequences. So here is the internal standards. Uh, I think my pointer died. But as you can see on the far right there, one of them does not quite look like the others. So Julia kind of went back and looked at that plate because she's a little perplexed to see why that one looks so different. Um, and as you can see, I mean, we do see some amount of variation because um, it could just be the difference of maybe the sample wasn't quite as homogenized as we thought it was, probably just difference from DNA extractions and plate to plate mm -hmm. variation sequencing runs. But since that one looked so different, she kind of went and looked a little closer. Turns out one of the undergraduates working in the lab Instead of having the plate oriented like so, as we thought, they actually flipped it upside down. So we actually were very lucky in this case that um, Julia was able to very easy, easily determine that. Um, I think it just kind of happened to be from where it was located that she readily spotted that they flipped the plate around. Um, so it's been very handy. Hopefully, maybe um, others of you have some internal standard that you can kind of assess whether you're having a lot of variation by DNA extraction or sequencing runs. Um, so one of the other things um, that we do, so after the DNA extraction and um, we do the PCRs, we then run another gel to look and see if everything seemed to go well. Um, so as I'm showing you on the top here, um, we usually tend to do, I think, close to 12 um, of the actual samples, run them out, make sure that the amplification seemed good. Every single extraction blank and no template control is also run out on a gel. Fortunately, for the most part, we see that all of those blanks actually stay blank. Um, however, every once in a while what happens is that we do see some of them actually come up dirty. And what we do next is sort of a case-by-case -case basis. So we'll then, so after we do the PCR, we um, do cleanup and Pico Green to quantify the DNA. So we'll look at the Pico Green results and say, are some of these samples that came up actually kind of just what was close to background noise, or does it seem to be genuinely dirty? Um, I think in this particular sample, we, can, we determined that only one blank really seemed to be kind of bad off, but we still went ahead and sequenced anyway. Um, sometimes what we have had to do is just scrap the whole thing and start over, uh, whether it be just at the PCR step or even going back um, and starting over with the DNA extraction. Um, one of the things that I would like to point out, so I know that it's kind of come up about uh, with just the environmental contamination since your samples are much more sensitive than what we're usually working with. But what some people will end up doing is if one of their blanks on a plate looks dirty, they just go ahead and sequence it anyway and subtract that from their samples. That is not something that we do in the lab. Um, like I said, when we're actually working with a robot, we watch it to make sure it's not spinning things around. It's hard not to have 100% lack of aerosols um, generated from that process. But anyway, we personally do not subtract any dirty blanks. Um, so, after we've kind of passed quality control, make sure that we actually want to go ahead with sequencing, 
Um, we're putting in 100 nanograms of each PCR reaction. Um, our pool, like I said, we do about two plates per run. Um, we're using the Illumina MySeq 2x250. Um, I'd also like to point out, uh, so we're using the V2. There's been, uh, I think last November, a lot of talk coming out about use of the V3 kit. Um, I believe it was Pat Schloss says that those who want to go ahead and use the V3 are greedy. Um, I do know someone who is actually having a lot of trouble using the V3, so I don't know if anyone in here is using it, but if you're considering upgrading to the V3, I would do your research because I've heard a lot of bad things about uh, the updated kit. Um, so with that, and so lastly to kind of uh, finish up, so for analysis, we're using the Chime software. Uh, Mother, which was created by Pat Schloss, is the other main one that I know of. Uh, we're pretty lucky to have a couple people in our lab that came out of Rob Knight's lab, so I learned from some pretty amazing tutors. Uh, Julia Goodrich uh, was one of those people. Um, so if anyone else is also very new to this, so I had never done anything like this until I came into Rob's lab, or sorry, not Rob's lab, Ruth's lab. Um, so Chime has some very helpful tutorials online. Um, so one of them, even though it's a 4 by 4 tutorial, that's what I started with, um, just to practice. Um, I've seen that they've added some more options now for those who are just starting out. Um, the other thing that I personally really like about this is um, basically almost any question you have, if you go look online because of the help forums they have, most of them have already been answered. Um, but I know after speaking with people in the night lab, um, they have a rotating position, which I think they call it the chime master. So someone, it's their turn where I think they have to do this for one or two weeks, where they have to answer all of the questions that are put on these forums. For the most part, they seem to answer questions within 24 hours. Um, and all the people I've met from the night lab are very nice, uh, very helpful people. Um, so with that, as far as the OTU picking methods, obviously the three main ones are de novo, closed reference, or open reference. In our lab, we uh, use the latter two. Um, I personally use open reference. And just to finish up here, um, I just want to point out something that sort of happened in our lab where I think it's really important to take a good look at what's hiding in those unknown sequences that don't match anything in the database. So uh, the project that I'm working on in the lab kind of stemmed out of some of Julia's work, where, as I said, we're interested in host genetics. I won't go into the details of this too much, but the family in our study that was identified as being of any family under the influence of host genetics, this family Christensen Alatiae, seemed to be the most influenced. So Christensen Alatiae was something that I had never heard of. Uh, neither had Julia or Ruth. Um, but actually what came out of this study, it was pretty neat, so not only was it the most heritable, it seemed to form a co-occurrence network where this was uh, the hub of that network. It's enriched in lean individuals, and if I put this into a mouse, it protects against obesity, and it has significant, uh, statistically significant decreases in both weight gain and adiposity, which was pretty neat. But still neither of us had heard of this. So when we started looking into this a little more, we actually found a study in our own lab where this popped up and should have been kind of brought to the radar of the lab a few years ago. Um, so a 2011 paper where we were, they were looking at a long-term uh, time series of development of the infant gut. So this Christensen Alatiae family in humans is maybe about less than 1% of the community. So it actually ended up being 20% of the sequences in the meconium sample, and it was 8% of the mother's gut microbiota at the time of delivery, but it got missed because it got lumped in with those unknown sequences because it didn't have a name at the time. So I really like this because it highlights, one, our bias in the field of only really caring about something that has a name. And it also shows, again, any of you who might also be new to thinking about the microbiome or starting with this type of data analysis, go actually check those unknown sequences. And it also shows what you maybe could miss by doing closed reference OTU picking. Um, so with that, um, don't want to take up too much more time, um, but I would really like to thank my lab members. Um, as I said, I am entirely new to this field. I'm very lucky to work with a great group of people that I learn a lot from them. 
especially my wonderful PI Ruth that I'm sorry that she couldn't be here. She's on sabbatical in Belgium right now. Fortunately, we have her back in a couple months. Um, and again, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thanks for your attention. Okay, sorry, no questions. <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you, Jillian. Our next microbiologist, and the topic is use of isotopically labeled substrate to identify viable bacteria. Me just a sec, please. So, which one of these is green? All right, I'm going to be talking about some of the things that we've already discussed this morning. Um, the sampling issues. I'm going to be talking about also trying to track down. Is there any way to focus this a little bit better? I don't know. Well, we will keep going. Um, I'll be talking to you about also ways of trying to identify bacteria that we can pull out of the, the human body that are active. Mary Care Unit at Robin Wood Johnson Medical School. And I'm a marine microbiologist working with Laura McGinnis in my lab. And you're thinking, you know, where, where does the connection come in here? Well, it turns out that um, we've been doing molecular ecology on microbial populations for 30 years. I should say I have been. I, I, don't, I don't want to claim that for Laura. but. Um, but I've been doing this for 30 years. So I predate PCR. I predate kits. I predate next gen sequencing. So we go way back, all right? And we appreciate everything that everybody has said today. And we are gonna be showing you contrary data, okay? And part of that is because I do predate all of this stuff. Yeah, how do I focus this a little bit? Excellent. <laughs> okay, so what I want to do is we're going to go over just very briefly some of the stuff that we've talked about, right? My question initially when I got involved in this is, you know, how do we sample? And I was, I was worried with the contamination issue that's all been brought up as well. We have these robust communities that exist in the nose, the mouth, the throat, where you can see with the purplish stars. We want to get something inside the lung. And the nice thing about being a molecular ecologist for bacteria is bacteria are everywhere. Mm -hmm. We work in every environment. The human is just another microbial environment for me, right? <laughs> That's all. We just apply all the same tools and techniques that we've always done. But we want to ask, right? Can we get in there without contamination? Also, we want to use the least invasive manner to get these samples from the lungs that we can. So ideally, you have something that a patient, a subject, would be able to do in the office very quickly, very easily, not surgery, not any of the stuff that was talked about earlier, right? Um, but we will be taking a look at samples that Sabia has, has collected, lavage from the lungs, the nose and mouth rinses. She's provided a sputum sample, which I've lost, but we also have swab samples. We have exhaled breath condensate. Right now, we have you know, material in my lab from two subjects. So all the data I'm gonna to give to you today is mm -hmm. not like what you've seen this morning. We have an N of two, but we do have some different stuff that you'll see in a minute. Sabia has collected a lot more samples and we're gonna be able to address this, you know, um, a little bit more of replication. But before we go any further, I have to explain a little bit about the technology that I'm gonna be showing you because it's 
very old school. And I am very old school. So when it comes to extracting a, a sample, we only do the phenol chloroform method in my lab. And there's a reason for that. Number one, 20, over 20 years ago, I published our method as being quantitative, right? We get the highest quality and the largest yield by manually doing it phenol chloroform again. And I would rather have the most robust signal that I can get from the microbiota to begin with, because everything downstream is irrelevant if you don't have a really good extraction. So that's what we like to use. Um, we also use PCR, and what we're going to be showing you today is a, an old school, simple approach called T-Riflep. And the idea is this, that when you extract your DNA, and the first thing you have to do is quantitate that before it even goes in a PCR reaction. You then do an amplification. We typically do the low cycle numbers that Jillian had talked about. We actually published all of this as best practices with Lily Young back in 1998. What you do is basically you put a fluorescent label on one end of the gene. Wish me luck, right? I don't think any of these. Um, we put a fluorescent label, which you can see by the little red stars on the left, just basically. And you get this suite of 16S genes or any target gene that you're interested in. Now, we do a quick and dirty sort of these amplicons, and we do this with restriction enzymes. The idea is you cut up all these different genes. If the genes are very similar, they're going to have a very similar banding pattern with the restriction enzyme. If the genes are very different, they'll have different banding patterns. The problem is this, if you just run out all of the stuff that you have in this reaction on a gel, you get a big smear, lots and lots of bands, no way to tell two samples apart. But if you only focus in on the fluorescent bands, which are shown on the right with the, the red, here with this arrow, right, maybe you can tease apart what's going on between two different environmental samples. Oh, no problem. Thank you or samples, right, that come from um, different parts of the human body. Okay, so um, the old fluorescent ABI sequencers do this automatically, detecting only the fluorescent fragments, and they report this as a series of chromatograms. Think of it like an HPLC or a GC, where wherever you have a peak, you have a signal. So let's start taking a look at some of the samples that we have here, right? All right, so, God, it looks so much better on my screen. Come back and look at that, right? Um, so here's an example of, of two different lung lavage samples, right, from two different subjects. And you can see, essentially, right, a, a relatively simple chromatogram. Now, the difference between what we're reporting and what Ron and Leo had talked about is that if you remember that frequency plot that, that, that Ron showed of OTUs and frequency, there's a, a logarithmic decay. We're sampling just the high abundance stuff. We're not going out really far on the long tail. So we're looking at stuff between 1% and 100% and of the population, but, you know, or maybe 0.1%, but we don't go out to 0.0001. It's here. It's actually within these profiles. You just can't see them. They're teeny, itty, bitty, little peaks. But what we can immediately see in these two subjects are, right, two major peaks, or one major peak for each of the individual subjects. And contrary to some of the statements that we saw today, and me, I'm a neophyte to this, right? I'm just using the same tools and techniques that we always use in, in environmental samples. We find plenty of microbial DNA in lavage samples. These are extracts of 250 microliters from the lavage. And we get enough DNA out that we can do our amplifications. And it's, it's clean. It's remarkably clean. Um, so let's compare it to the mouth rinse, okay? So here you've got the mouth rinse, and now you can see a much more complex kind of fingerprint, right? Here you see much more commonality between subject one and subject two. Um, geez, you want to look at this? I urge you to come check it out. Um, here, right, there's a number of different peaks that are, that are common between both of these subjects. But, you know, you can see 50, 60, 70 peaks in this profile coming from the mouth, whereas from the lung, we had 12 and we had one major one. 
Let's do a comparison between the, the lavage from the, you know, just one subject, mouth rinse, nose rinse, and the lavage straight from the lung. And you can see that the mouth and the nose have all these complex patterns in the T. riflep. They have a number of peaks that are all shared, but they're different than the lavage sample. And this issue of contamination becomes paramount for us. One of the ways that you can tell if things are contaminated is that you basically get a mirror image of a sample. If we're pulling a lot of biomass when Sabia is collecting these samples from the nose or the mouth, we should see that all the major peaks that we see in the nose or the mouth will be the major peaks present in the lavage. They are not. We see suppression of very specific dominant peaks, which are shown kind of by these dotted arrows, which I apologize for the faintness of this, but at least this dark one here is one peak that's extremely enriched within the lavage sample. So my question is, how do you get something enriched by contamination? Right? And here you can also see, I mean, you can see things that are suppressed. If there was carryover, significant carryover in all of these samples, we should be seeing all of the same dominant peaks showing up here, and we don't. All right, so fundamental questions are, now that we're starting this, are there common microorganisms between these two different subjects? Um, you know, is the, is the lavage sample more similar or more different between the two subjects? And this is where you can wax eloquent having the N of two. <laughs> you know, but the bottom line is this. With this Sequencer, it's extremely easy to overlay the two different profiles. And you can see a blue and a black profile vaguely here. It's all pixelated. But clearly, the dominant peaks between these two subjects are different. In fact, there are only two peaks which are shown in these two arrows that were common between the two subjects. Now, Sabia, I didn't ask you, did you collect both of these samples within the same day from these two subjects? OK. So, so th they were collected separately, but I would imagine that at some point there's going to be samples that are collected with all the same reagents, everything else, and if it's a reagent contamination, that should be common kind of between the two. So basically, we only see a couple of things that are common, a couple of things that are dominant and different. We have done a little bit of pre preliminary work with breath condensate. This is a, a little more difficult to work with. Um, the microbial loads in there are going to be much smaller than we have with any of the rinses. And we have a technique, which I'll show you in just a little bit, to add a carrier to protect the rarer DNA that we see in, in um, low microbial load samples so that we can pull out the 16S genes and not worry about nucleases or loss on our tubes and things like that because the carrier will be focusing in on this. And, we have three different subjects here. Um, we see a difference between the breath condensate and these lung lavage samples. I haven't had the chance to do the breath condensates for the individual subjects that Sabi have collected yet. But preliminary evidence would indicate that there is some commonality. This peak here is detectable in the breath condensate from this subject, right? But others, we see, we see a lot of variability. All right. So the real question is, so you see these peaks, who in the world are they, right? And so we, going all the way back, still do things old school as well as new school. 20 years ago, people that were trying to identify bacteria using 16S genes would all tell you, you need big fragments. Anything smaller than 500 base pairs has no phylogenetic resolution. You really want the full gene. That's completely flipped in the community. Anybody doing, you know, this molecular ecology these days are all doing the MySeq runs, the 454 runs, all these different things. And everybody is very content with a 100 base pair fragment that's in the middle of a variable region. What we do is we're going to actually cover the entire suite for all of these samples. We've cloned nearly full length genes. The clones that we've identified that match our fingerprints are shown by hi highlighting the individual peaks. So you can see that virtually all of the big peaks, we now have examples, clones, 
1,100 base pairs that are going out for sequencing right now. But I think we can actually identify one of these immediately. And this is what Laura has done. It turns out that every time we do these fingerprints, in order to increase our resolution, it's very nice, and we were planning on doing multiple enzyme digests for every one of our amplicons. The top panel that you've been looking at so frequently here is digested with MNL1, but we also have HAY3 digests and RSA digests. Now what's interesting is this. We have this project going on with DuPont, and when we've done very similar kind of profiles and looked at clones, tried to match up individual organisms, we found that there was this one organism that gave us an MNL peak, MNL1 peak right here at about 274. And when you cut it with HAY3, it gave us a peak here and gave us a peak here. It turns out it's a chromobacter. This was an achromobacter that came from an environmental sample, right? And it basically has the exact three exact matches of restriction sites. So if I were to just calculate randomly, right, the odds of doing that, it's about one in a billion. But we do have the possibility to sequence these things. We have the thing cloned. It's going out right now. But it was delightful to see some of the stuff that Ron was showing earlier and things that, that Laura's pulled up in the literature showing that a chromobacter can be an opportunistic pathogen in these systems. All right, let's move on. Because really, here's one of, the, one of the other things that we've been interested in kind of taking a look at. We want to really understand the organisms that are residing in the lung, that are growing, that are living there, okay? We want to be able to separate those from the ones that have just been passively brought in, that may be an environmentally suspended microorganism that gets brought into the lungs and you happen to collect it, right? So the stuff that's part of the tidal volume versus the things that are really living on the lung epithelia. So I want to talk to you about a way that you can try and tease apart the active members from the non-active members. And this is a, uh, um, a methodology called stable isotope probing. It's predicated on this fundamental experiment that happened in the 50s by Messelson and Stahl looking at the mechanisms of DNA replication. They grew up in E. coli in two different medias, basically. They first grew it up in N15 labeled media, and then they switched it to N14 labeled media. And they extracted the DNA during various generations, during time courses of this transfer, and they can physically separate the N15 labeled DNA from the N14 DNA in cesium gradients. The process of stable isotope probing uses the same principle. And here's an example of gradients in our lab labeled with either C12 here, barely readable, <laughs> C13, right, or a mixture where you get two different bands. The stable isotope probing method stuck a mo molecular ecology pipeline on the end of this. And so the idea was to pull out this lower band when you feed things C13 substrates. Organisms that take up the substrate and are growing and replicating make C13 DNA. So what you do is you know, attach this cloning, sequencing, phylogenetic analysis pipeline to see who's active. We put a little wrinkle on this because the original paper out of Colin Murrell's, Colin Murrell's lab, in order to get that lower band, had to let things sit in soils for a long period of time. We added a carrier, and with work, and the carrier does this. It basically identifies exactly where this C13 band is. The carrier we use is, is made from an archaeum. It's a halo bacterium. It doesn't amplify with bacterial 16S primers. So it will identify the region of the gradient that is 100% labeled with C13, not partially labeled exactly what we want to find, right? And the idea is this. We set up appropriate controls where if you add C12, let's say here we're using C12 acetate, and you pull out this carrier, you should see no amplification at all. As Jillian was showing, a clean gel, zero kind of amplification. But when you add C13, you now get a signal. And what's more important, that signal also has to demonstrate this enrichment and suppression to make sure that it isn't a contamination from your upper band. So it's paramount to find peaks, right, that are enriched and peaks that are suppressed. 
So I want to talk about some very difficult environmental samples. We've tried this once with the lavage samples. We get them frozen. Sabia collects them. It takes a while for us to get them. We need to get them fresh. And our SIP experiment did not work the first time. But I'm confident it will because we do this in extraordinarily difficult environments. So here's an example of a SIP experiment that's done in conjunction with Getty Manalis, who's here, and Donna Fennell in, in Lily's department, where bacteria are aerosolized and put in rotating bioreactors where they can stay suspended for up to a week. And C13 labeled substrates can be added. And we're looking to see, can we even see DNA replication when bacteria are just suspended in the air? And yes, when you do a C12 treatment, you can see here there's nothing amplified. C13 treatment, we can now see the response of bacteria that are present, aerosolized, metabolizing when they're up suspended in the air. We've also been doing this work in other environmental samples. Here's a difficult sample, a permafrost sample, where the ground is frozen for more than, you know, essentially it's been frozen for 5,000 years. We grind the samples up. We add very quickly C13 acetate, C12 acetate. We have to thaw the samples for very briefly. We put them at different sub-zero temperatures. Here we actually could see DNA replication at minus 20 degrees in the soil. It took six months. Here's the control where we had C12 acetate, and you can see a clean profile, no PCR amplification. And this, by the way, is a um, two-step amplification. So if you're clean, you can push this out almost as far as you would like to go. And then here's the C13 amended sample, and you can see all these different responses. So I'll show you just one more thing and then wrap it up and turn it over to Leslie. So um, here's an example of doing the N15 SIP in the ocean. And these are doing very short-term incubations, two micromolar additions of amino acids into um, environmental samples, one liter, and letting it sit for just one hour and asking which organisms can take up this label, very quickly replicate their genome, which ones are the most active. So here's an example where we can always profile the top bands to know who's present in any one of the samples. And then when we profile the bottom band, we see just a single response, right? One particular OTU, one peak that took up this amino acid label. What, we, what I really liked, what made me most comfortable is we also, at the same time, had samples, right, that we collected immediately off of the boat, ones that we added the amino acids and let go, and we can look at the ribosomes. We can fingerprint ribosomes just like we can DNA. It's the same primers. It's the same molecule we're essentially looking at. Here, right, when you add this amino acid, you can actually see the peak in the RT-PCR, the profile from the ribosomes. And when there's no amendment, it's not there. So this gives us more confirmation that these organisms are growing, synthesizing proteins, synthesizing DNA. So let me finish up. Contrary to what we heard before, and that's because I'm a neophyte, maybe I'm completely wrong about this. We think there's sufficient biomass in all of these to directly characterize the microbiome. And I think that fundamentally the only difference, right, right now is between us using our traditional phenol chloroform and the kits. The kits usually have lower yields and some of that difference. I mean, the power soil kit does not work in our hands with most of our samples nearly as well as our old school traditional stuff. Dilute samples, such as these breath condensates, the swabs, which we haven't even tested yet, these would probably benefit from the addition of a carrier. So get some archaeal carrier, throw them into the sample, do the extraction. You can probably preserve and pull out the signal that you're looking for, right? So with this N of 2, we can say, right, these lung samples are more different than they are similar, right? So we're looking forward to increasing our N by a factor of, you know, 2, 10, 100, whatever, right?
I'm sure that as we start doing many, many more of these, our picture is going to change. But at least for right now, we're pretty optimistic. And then finally, what we really want to begin doing is looking at this host microbe interaction. And that's really where we want to have this understanding. Because as microbiologists, we say, no place is safe from microbes. Virtually everything is colonized, right? We live in a microbial world. For all of human evolution, we've been interacting with bacteria, as we said, on the outside, but anything that's interacting with the environment, including the lung. So there have to be these interactions going on. We want to begin teasing those apart. And part of it is getting back to what Leo said about the metabolome, is beginning to look at some of the substrates that the host is producing that is going into the microbes, or potentially vice versa. Same with the air pollutants, like Cliff had mentioned at the very beginnings. We have an acromobacter strain that will begin to metabolize phenanthrene, it looks like. So aromatics and things that will impact this lung tissue can be processed by that first layer of the lung microbiome and then begin interacting with the host. But we think tools like stable isotope probing can give us a better understanding of all of that. Thank you. that will um, ensue after this session is done. Okay, the um, next speaker is uh, Leslie Shore. Leslie is Oh, he took his dongle as well? Okay. So I'm an engineer. Um, I didn't start out that way, though. I started out with environmental science. I was interested in microbes and microbial habitats and in a soil standpoint as well, um, where the origin of all microbes, I guess, uh, they eventually get into the lung. But they started in the soil at one point, maybe many generations ago. And I want to ask you to think a little bit today about the lung microbiome and the lung in particular from the standpoint of the microbe, from the standpoint of the microbe that's colonizing the lung or living in the lung, and think about the lung as that habitat and what the features of that habitat are. So in terms of the physiology of the lung, of course, one of the important characteristics is that it is the gas exchange organ of the body. So this is where oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged. And from the standpoint of the microbe, there are steep gradients in oxygen with position. So within a space of a few hundred micrometers or a few millimeters, you're going to have different oxygen tensions in different positions within the lung based on proximity to the arteries and vessels that are in the lung. This is true in the soil as well, actually. And you can have aerobic and anaerobic microorganisms living in soil in very close physical proximity. And the really cool thing is that those communities are actually interacting with each other. They're forming a community, even though they're living in different microhabitats. And I think that's really important as we go forward 
to keep that in mind. So if we looked at some small region of this, we can look at um, different chemical conditions that may be occurring, different oxygen concentrations, carbon dioxide concentrations, and those are going to influence the microbes that are living in those different positions. It's going to affect the different distribution of species that may be present. And then even for a given species, it could influence the phenotype of, that, of those organisms because a different um, location means a different set of chemical conditions. This is known fairly well in several other fields of study. So for example, on the inside walls of vessels in the vasculature, the presence of shear stress along eukaryotic cells actually induces them to have a different uh, phenotype than if those same cells were cultured in a petri dish under static conditions. And so this is a known factor. So cells are doing different things based on their microenvironments. And one of the reasons why we're not able to very well understand all the functionality of these different cellular communities, of course, is that we're not doing a very good job of replicating their habitat. You know, panda bears don't like to replicate in captivity either. And if you're not E. coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Staph aureus, or a handful of other white lab rat strained microorganisms, you're not going to live very well under lab conditions. And we won't know as much about you. So in some of my work, particularly my early work when I first started my faculty position, I was very interested in this biofilm microenvironment. So this is relevant to the lung. The biofilm morphology is especially important in disease. Cystic fibrosis is the big example here. Um, and this is one of the major uh, morphologies that you have with poor clinical outcomes for infected lungs. The important thing with the biofilm is even when it's a pure culture biofilm, the fact that there's a different oxygen concentration in different positions actually causes a whole cascade of different phenotypic changes within that biofilm. And so this is some work from the culture lab from some years ago where they were actually able to show that I think this is serratia marcescens are expressing different genes in different positions within the biofilm. It's a clonal colony. So from the standpoint of microbiome, you would get the same answer a billion times, but these cells are actually doing different things because of the local environment. And this is what I'm interested in focusing on, and maybe thinking about how we can build this bridge from both sides. So one approach to understand a complex system, of course, is to understand the system as it is, to sample it, to understand who's there, maybe what they're doing, functional genomics. As an engineer, a lot of us are a little OCD, we want to create the system. We want to build a synthetic system and test the hypothesis. Can I predict functionality? Can I predict overall emergent function here? And we'll see how far we can get with that. So the motivation then is to understand real-time responses of live cells and cellular systems in this realistic microstructure. And I'm going to be talking to you about chemical gradients, about oxygen gradients, and about some other emerging things we're working on. So we can think about different approaches to replicate complex habitats. And so the simplest approach, of course, is the petri dish, the contents of your refrigerator and your labs, all those tubes and flasks and dishes of things growing on those labs. Those, of course, are poor um, emulation of complex features, and they don't allow you to do much of understanding interactions, feedbacks, or controlling this that you would be required to do if you really were emulating a system, these complex features of systems. We can look at different ways of looking at microbes in the lab, of course, flow cells, bioreactors, they get more and more complex. But at a certain point of complexity, there's a trade-off with your ability to do interactions, feedback, and control until finally we get back to environmental sampling. And I warned you, my roots are in the environment as well, um, in sediment systems, but sampling the lung is the similar, similar situation. It's a complex system, but it's a difficult system to manipulate. And so we want to try to get somewhere off this curve by trying to both have complex features and have the ability to control those features at the same time. So just real quick, some of the great capabilities of these systems, the very small length scales, so just the simplest case, you can put an oxygenated and non-oxygenated habitat really, really close together within microns. So you can have this, the steepness of gradients that you would have in a real lung or another real microbial habitat. They're 
Small physical structures can be built. You can do fluid handling. You could open and close valves like alveoli opening and closing. This has been done by other labs. You can integrate sensors and actuators. We do a lot with optical sensors, so you can actually see what's happening spatially in real time without prodding and probing the system. It's an intact system and you're observing it. And they've been used for a lot of different applications. Increasingly, the notion of an organ on a chip, building a tissue, building a cellular system in the lab that emulates some of these features. So the first quick area of work I wanted to share is to talk about how antimicrobial gradients influence antimicrobial tolerance. So most of the time, when you look at developing a minimum inhibitory concentration of an antibiotic against a bacterial population, you're going to put those microbes in a dispersed planktonic morphology, well mixed, and you're going to hit it with some antibiotic concentration, and you're going to find out what inhibits the, the microbiology that's in that vessel. Or maybe you get fancy and you're going to look at a, uh, a flow cell system or maybe a CDC bioreactor. So you're going to have surface attached bacteria growing as a biofilm. But again, once you get through the diffusion time frame for your antimicrobial to fully penetrate the biofilm, there's still really no change in the concentration of the antimicrobial with time. This is very different from the clinical case where you've got pharmacokinetics, you've got diffusion limitations, you've got also cells that are in a different physiological state. So what we tried to do in our lab, um, and you can look this up in the journal Analytical Chemistry from a couple years ago, is we actually arrayed bacterial biofilms on a surface. The surface was a functional oxygen sensor, and then we exposed these cells to a gradient of an antimicrobial that changed with position and time and looked at their responses. A few elements of this overall system, we had an oxygen sensing layer built on a glass slide. We had an array of bacteria in a biofilm morphology where each of the individual elements in that array was an identical clonal bacterial biofilm. And we basically have a whole bunch of replication in this system. And then we used a microfluidic device, which is a specified geometry to control the rate of diffusion by flux. So in different positions and at different times, the microbes were exposed to diff different chemical conditions. We use this optical oxygen sensor. It's a similar type of molecule that's used in the solid state oxygen probes you may have in your lab as well. Essentially, oxygen quenches the fluorescence intensity of this reporting molecule. We built it into a film that coated um, microscope slides, um, bound it up in polystyrene so it's not bioavailable, it's not toxic, and then we can look at quantitatively the effect of oxygen concentration on fluorescence intensity, and it's an inverse relation. The higher the oxygen concentration, the lower the intensity, and it's particularly sensitive at the lower oxygen concentrations, which works well for our purposes. Then we overlay all of that with essentially a chamber, a geometry that we know very, um, very exactly what it is. And there's a pinhole in one corner. And we load this up with an antimicrobial in this corner. And the stuff just diffuses across the field. Because the geometry is exactly known, we can then, let's see if it plays. We can barely see it. But these are lines of constant concentration over time. And so you see there's this front of antimicrobial that's going to diffuse across the field. So a given position at a given point in time is going to be experiencing a certain concentration of an antimicrobial. And then what we can do with our assay, as the antimicrobial diffuses across the field, we can image a particular biofilm in the array and say, OK, how is the local oxygen concentration changing? Now, oxygen is always being replenished from the environment. The the device itself is sitting in the lab, it's open. The material that the device is made of is as permeable to oxygen as water. So oxygen diffuses right through it. It's polydimethyl siloxane. It's what they use to make contact lenses out of, so it has to be gas permeable. So oxygen's going through that material with no limitation. The reason that oxygen is limited below the biofilm, the reason it's depleted, and the reason that the reporting molecule is glowing brightly is because of the respiration. 
The microbes are using up the oxygen faster than it can diffuse in from the environment. So what we've got essentially as we observe a change in the fluorescence intensity below the biofilm is a real-time sen real sensor of oxygen respiration within that biofilm. So as the antimicrobial comes in, it knocks back the respiration rate of the cells. They now are no longer able to consume all of the oxygen that is diffusing from the environment and the local oxygen concentration at the base of the biofilm begins to rise a little bit. And so the end result then is we have data that kind of look like this. These are color coded for the positions in the array from red to purple. So this is the closest to the source. The oxygen concentration drops off rather quickly. And the positions that are farther away, it takes longer before respiration starts to become inhibited. So what we did was we went back and we said, okay, at what point are the respiration of these cells becoming inhibited? And now what is the concentration of antimicrobial when that occurs? And so these are the data. So this is the time of the experiment, the concentration of the antimicrobial, and then color-coded based on position in the array, the biofilms that are closest to the inlet of the antimicrobial become inhibited of course earlier in time, but importantly, they also become inhibited at a relatively lower antimicrobial concentration. So hit them fast, hit them hard, and you're going to see effectiveness at a lower concentration. Now, if you're in the clinical field, you knew that already, but this is the first assay that we know of that's able to actually measure that in a lab setting. So I, I, as I understand, the reason you use IV antibiotics is to get a higher concentration more quickly. The microbes are less able to resist that. And so we saw a nice effect across our assay here of the effect of delivery rate on inhibitory concentrations. So the other thing to think about, this was a gradient of different concentrations of antimicrobial. The biofilm itself has different microenvironments simply because it's respiring and it's depleting oxygen in different positions. So we can even think of the biofilm itself as a heterogeneous microenvironment. In certain positions there's more oxygen, in others there's less. And so we looked a little more closely at just the biofilms themselves in a constant concentration setting. So here we're looking at the clinically important antimicrobial daptomycin. Uh, the mechanism of action of this molecule is believed to be aggregation near the membrane and it basically opens up a pore that causes the cell not to be able to regulate ion transport as effectively. The problem is if you look in the literature, the biofilm inhibitory concentrations, MBEC, minimum biofilm eradication concentrations, are all over the map and it depends a lot on whether there's any pre-exposure. <laughs> So here's just a couple of studies that found two pretty different MBEC values for, for different strains of Staph aureus. Depending on whether, let's see, the colony forming units here versus different concentrations of daptomycin, this plot is showing that even as you get towards extraordinarily high concentrations of the antimicrobial, you still have these persisting population of cells. You can't get below a certain threshold. So we wanted to look into this in a little more detail. We used our same system here where we have an array of bacterial biofilms and we're exposing those biofilms to now different constant daptomycin concentrations and we're looking at their respiratory responses. And I'm going to skip through this kind of quick, but the data as a function of different daptomycin now concentrations show how respiration is inhibited over time. We take these data, convert them into an oxygen concentration, and we can then actually calculate what the oxygen consumption rate, what the bulk oxygen respiration rate inside that biofilm was as a function of different daptomycin concentrations. We're going to scale this between the minimum and maximum respiration rates we see inside our array of different biofilms, and we can show here that based on the concentrations, we have, even at higher concentrations of daptomycin, continuing respiration that occurs inside these biofilms based on our modeling, and that this is dose-dependent continuing respiration that's occurring inside these biofilms. 
So it's giving us some nice insights then about what these cells are doing. Sure would be great to take these cells off of that slide though and do some sequencing and prove some of these things by doing some molecular tools. But I think this illustrates how controlling the microenvironment can allow us to get closer and closer to the structure and function of real organs and real systems and is a highly compatible tool set with different molecular techniques. Um, some data from the literature relatively similar with some of the things that we found in our system as well. So some of the main contributions, we've developed optical sensors, real-time tracking, uh, techniques to do arrays of intact biofilms with high throughput screening, varying dosing rates. Um, we're able to actually infer respiration rates optically without disturbing the cells at all and found dose-dependent respiratory activity persists even at higher concentrations. A couple other things we're doing in our lab, Lily mentioned something about the termite on a chip. So we're working with other colleagues at the University of Connecticut to actually try to understand the termite gut microbiome and how that is influenced by oxygen concentrations at a millimeter scale. So you can create oxygen concentration gradients inside a microfluidic device relatively simply because of course the oxygen moves right through. So if you have a source and a sink, you're going to have a gradient of oxygen across a particular growth area. Other folks have used scavengers. So you can have a scavenger for oxygen just like people that do anaerobic culture work would do, but you can flow the scavenger in a channel and that's going to be continuously drawing away oxygen from your microenvironment. It gives you a nice control over the oxygen conditions. We wanted to do something harder because it would be fun and actually create oxygen at, at a electrode surface um, and that would provide us the ability to dynamically modulate the oxygen concentration at the wall of the, of the microhabitat. So this is work that's ongoing, um, created the oxygen produce, production system and verified the gradients and now we're looking at the microbial responses of termite guts that have been extracted from a termite, loaded into the microhabitat. The Collaborators are doing the, the deep sequencing and all of the analysis of the microbial community, and we're trying to see how the microenvironment is influencing those communities. So again, the, the advantage of the system then is that you are able to, here's some modeling results showing what the oxygen concentration, the red and light blue color is a higher oxygen concentration, how that's going to change with position and time inside a microhabitat. The end result of a lot of this work is something you may have heard of in the literature perhaps is this organ on a chip notion, is that you're going to build increasingly complex systems on a chip. It's a silly cartoon, um, of course it wouldn't really look like that, but the point is that you're not going to replicate every single function of a lung, every single gradient, chemical gradient, oxygen gradient, physiological response, immune response, et cetera. But if you have a hypothesis of how your biology works or doesn't work or how it's interacting, there is a whole tool set out there for how you can emulate specific functions of that system in a lab setting and then test those different hypotheses and see if you're understanding the function. In our particular lab, the thing that I'm most excited about moving forward is the notion of optogenetic control. We just learned about a large DOE award where we're going to use optogenetic control in a microenvironment to actually turn genes on and off in situ in a complex microenvironment. The application is soil, the application is plants and rhizosphere and that type of a system, but these are tools that were developed primarily from the neurology, neurobiology field that we can now employ in a complex microenvironment, sitting on a microscope stage, different bacteria in different positions then are excited by lasers and turning on and off genes with different positions. It's another tool that's out there in the tool bag available for better understanding molecular influences on overall system function. With that, I wanted to acknowledge a bunch of collaborators, my PhD students, and a whole slew of undergrads that have worked in my lab. And later on, I'll be happy to answer questions. Thanks.
Kelly on human microbial ecology and how the composition and function of both respiratory and gastrointestinal microbiomes contribute to a range of chronic inflammatory diseases and disorders. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Susan Lynch, who will be talking to us today about the airway microbiome and pulmonary health. Dr. Lynch? Great, thanks so much um, for that introduction. So um, today, you've, you've heard a little bit this morning about uh, the tools that we have to interrogate the, the microbiome, and I'd, want, I'd like to expand that a little bit to some of the newer tools that I think are going to be critical um, to really understanding not just the composition, but the function of these microbial communities that exist in and on the human body. Next, and you've heard a, a bit about this as well this morning, we'll go through very briefly on the, the healthy airway microbiome and what distinguishes it from a disease state. And then I'll start talking a little bit about some of the, the airway diseases that we study um, and examine really a first pass that there are relationships between microbial composition and features of disease, and that these are not static communities, that they show and exhibit dynamics that are associated again with uh, features and phenotypes of the disease. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about um, upper airway microbiome as a, a determinant of infection susceptibility. And the really, to, to provide you with some data as to how we validate some of these findings and the real need for validation and that culture is king at the end of the day to study these organisms and to really prove some of the features of disease that we, uh, we uh, unve uh, unveil with these microbiome-based analyses that we really need to look at specific organisms and go back to some very basic microbiology to, to prove principle. And so you've heard quite a lot about uh, 16S ribosomal RNA and even the ITS uh, sequencing for cataloging the microbiota, just who's there. But the microbiome is more than just who's there. It's all of the genomes of these organisms and how these organisms interact with each other and the host. That's the microbiome, the ohm, the, the ecosystem and its component parts and their interactions. And so to, to do this, we need to have additional tools such as shotgun metagenomics, which allows us to really piece together the genomes of the specific organisms that we find in these communities. And this is no small feat, if you can think about it as kind of taking uh, Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace and ripping it to shreds and then trying to put the whole book back together. That's essentially what we're trying to do with a metagenomic analysis. Piece together the genomes of these organisms to kind of infer functional capacity of what these communities of organisms may do. But it's truly that, it's functional capacity. Just finding a gene there does not tell you that it's expressed. To understand that, we need to do something like RNA-seq or metatranscriptomics, where we take an RNA fraction, and again, shotgun sequence the, the, the cDNA um, from a community to understand what is being expressed off these genomes of these mixed species communities. And there's a couple of, of LC mass spec approaches that have really, you've heard a little bit about it from Leo earlier on today, that really are allowing us to look at the end products of this uh, gene capacity, this gene expression, uh, and what actually is driving the phenotypes that we see in our patients. And we can look at either proteins, so metaproteomics, where we can get a, an overview or a profile of the proteins that are expressed by a community, or metabolomics, again, the metabolic products that are being produced by a community. And in putting these together, these kinds of layered approaches, we get a much more fulminant idea of who's there, what they're capable of, and what they're actually producing, and how that is related to uh, host health. So while much of what I'll show you today, uh, pretty much all of what I'll show you today, is based on cataloging approaches, a multi-omics approach across these platforms and with these um, really powerful tools is where the field is moving towards to integrate composition with function and clinical phenotype or immune response in individuals. And this is where we, we need to move the field. And so you've heard much of this this morning, so I won't belabor the point, but the, the airways are obviously an immense site of contact with the external environment, and we have an inherent innate immune response that allows us to, to deal with these exposures, microbial and um, uh, non-microbial inhaled uh, exposures. 
The mucosal surface of the, the airway is inherently colonized by microbes, uh, particularly the upper airways, where we have a much higher bacterial burden and diversity. And this, as you've heard, diminishes as we go into, go into the lower airways in healthy individuals. We've also shown this with the transthoracic biopsies from individuals where we could find no evidence in the very lower airways of 16S. So there's probably a patchy, spatially distinct colonization pattern um, in the lower airways of healthy individuals, but this is a very low burden. And really, the, the, the critical study to show that these are actually biofilms in the very lower airways we're using something like fluorescence in situ hybridization profiling in humans has not yet been done. So we don't know still whether this is transient inhalation or whether these are colonies of organisms that are truly adherent to the mucosal surface um, and, and present there. And that's the, the ultimate validation of these kinds of findings. Um, we know that there, the community is, is distinct in specific niches in healthy subjects, and I will show you that in a little while, and that this niche specificity is lost in disease states. And you've heard again some of that this morning, where you can find upper airway organisms in the lower airway, and they, they're actually expanded in disease states. So uh, noting that, and this is a hallmark across uh, different sites in the human body, that translocation of species from one environment to another in, across ecology, that's a, a, a hallmark mark of perturbation um, and disease in, in the case of the human host. And I just want to show you, this is the upper airways, this is the mucosal surface. This is a study that was published by Healy and colleagues a number of years ago. And these are clearly biofilms of bacteria stained in a, with the universal 16S uh, probe, fish probe, and fungi with this red probe. So inter-kingdom colonization of the upper airway mucosal surface uh, uh, occurs. And this occurs in both healthy states and disease states. And it's about the combination of organisms that are there that dictates the health status. And so to, to provide some information on the fact that uh, there's niche specificity, this is a study that we performed a number of years ago now with Catherine Lemon at, at Harvard, where we took paired samples from the NAERS and the oropharyngeal site from seven healthy subjects. And what you can see is that all of the NAIR samples from the seven individuals clustered together here in this one group, indicating that they're compositionally similar and distinct from the oropharyngeal samples of uh, the same individuals. And you can see this with just a breakdown of the, the NAIR phyla uh, distribution versus the oropharynx uh, phylogenetic distribution, that there's clearly very distinct colonization patterns at each of these two sites in healthy individuals. What was striking to us, because we tend to kind of focus, and, and for good reason, on specific uh, organisms which we always think of as pathogenic, but we found these organisms, Staphylococcus uh, aureus, Haemophilus influenza, Streptococcus pneumonia, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa in our healthy individuals. So that began to make us think that pathogenesis is contextual, and that with the right microbial peer pressure, these organisms, which are known pathogens, do not express virulence gene expression. They do not have programs of virulence gene expression expressed. And so we become really interested in this, in what allows a, a pathogen to become a pathogen. Because in some contexts, in the healthy context, these bugs are not pathogenic. These patients, these individuals, these subjects uh, are not diseased. And so how is the microbiome related to features uh, of, of airway, lower airway disease? Well, this is a study that we uh, worked on with uh, a group at National Jewish. They, Jewish, they were uh, performing a trial of clarithromycin treatment uh, for asthmatics with a hard-to-control disease. And they were doing this because they had noted that uh, chlamydophila pneumonia and uh, mycoplasma pneumonia were more prevalent in the lower airways of their patients with severe asthma. And so they had a group of patients that they ran in on a standardized contro controller uh, corticosteroid therapy for four weeks. This was the point at which we got bronchial brushings from these individuals. They then went on to complete their, their trial or to randomize their individuals into these arms of their trial. Actually, the trial finished because they couldn't find enough individuals with those two specific organisms that were PCR positive for those two specific organisms. And I think that that's because probably it's a little too narrow in thinking that lower airway disease in asthmatics is driven by two specific organisms. <clears throat> 
But we received bronchial brushings after the patients had been standardized in this run-in period of, on corticosteroids. So these are uh, severe asthmatics with corticosteroid uh, treatment. And the first thing we did was we just asked, well, what does the, the 16S screen look like in these individuals? We had 75 subjects, 65 were asthmatics from the trial, and 10 were healthy individuals that we got, again, the very same type of mucosal brushing, bronchoscopically obtained uh, using a protected, triple lumen protected brushing of the mucosal surface. And what we could see was that 54 of our 65 asthmatics were positive for uh, 16S, so there was a signal there, and six of our 10, so relatively similar numbers of PCR positivity for bacteria. But what was really critical was that the burden of bacteria in the lower airways of the healthy individuals was significantly less than that of the asthmatics. Here you can see there's quite a spread um, in the burden of bacteria in our, in our asthmatic subjects, but it's significantly increased compared to the healthy control subjects. We went on to profile the, the bacterial community composition with the phylogenetic microarray in these samples. And one of the first things we did was ask, is the composition of the bacterial community in the lower airways related to any features of um, asthma? And so much as you've seen before, we have these principal components analyses that allow us to kind of plot bacterial communities based on their relative uh, composition similarity to all other samples. So for example, the composition of this individual's bacterial community is very distinct from this individual's community. The next thing we can do is ask whether this variation in community composition is related to any number of variables that we've collected in the study. So here we look at uh, metacholine challenger PC20, basically the reactivity of the airways of, of these individuals. And we could see a strong and significant relationship between uh, bronchial hyperreactivity and the type of bacterial community composition that was found in these <coughs> individuals. We also found the same with the bacterial burden and bacterial community composition. So uh, individuals who have a very high burden of bacteria in their lower airways have a very distinct bacterial community composition. And we actually subsequently went on to show that it's enriched for uh, proteobacteria, which has been uh, validated by other studies. But then finally, what we looked at were these two metrics together, bronchial hyperresponsiveness and the diversity of organisms in the lower airway of these individuals. And what we find is that as the patients have more reactive airways, they have much higher bacterial diversity in their communities. So if we put all of this together, what we can say is that the bacterial community in the lower airways of these individuals is related to a critical feature of asthma, bronchial hyperresponsiveness, and that individuals with a larger burden of bacteria in their lower airways, and these asthmatics, have a much dis more dis compositionally distinct community that's present that we think potentiates uh, disease processes in these individuals. And this is some work that is being followed up by Yvonne Huang, who's now at University of Michigan. But what about the fact that we, we tend to take a single snapshot of a community, and, and it, largely the, the studies that have been done to date have been um, cross-sectional. But these are not static communities. They change over time. And so we were interested in this in a study we published a number of years ago in cystic fibrosis patients. We didn't have longitudinal data for these individuals. This is a cross-sectional study. But we stratified our patients who ranged from a few months old to a, a, a lady who was 72 years of age and obviously had a very mild cystic fibrosis um, mutation, we stratified our patients by age. And we asked, as populations of CF patients are, are older in our study, are there relationships with the microbiome that we find in the lower airways? And the first thing we asked was, does our cohort look like every other CF cohort? Can we validate that this is a, 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 an appropriate cohort to study? So we looked at the, the um, pulmonary function of these individuals by FEV1. We clearly can't do this in the very youngest patients in our study who were uh, up to five years of age, but afterwards we can. And what we could see is this, as we would expect, significant decrease and decline in pulmonary function as our patient groups are, are in the older age bins. And to really summarize what we found in that study was 
quite contrary to what we expected, the children in our study had very diverse lower airway microbiota and they had the best pulmonary function. So it suggested to us in, in, in this site that competition between organisms in the very earliest stages of CF disease might actually um, be associated with, with maintaining or keeping a lower burden of those opportunistic pathogens that I mentioned in the upper airway studies earlier on. But the key take-home message was that as we went towards lower age groups in, these, in, these, uh, in this cohort, we saw a progressive loss of pulmonary function in community richness and community evenness and diversity. The richness is the number of types of organisms that are there. Uh, their evenness is how they're distributed within a community. So we're seeing far fewer types of organisms present and they're becoming more uneven, suggesting that they're becoming more dominated by organisms. And that's exactly what we see here. We see an establishment of phylogenetically related organisms in these um, patients as the, we go towards the older age groups, and a, a domination or an enrichment of kind of many of the typical cystic fibrosis uh, pathogenic families that we have associated for quite a while in these uh, individuals. So it really matters when you uh, what their timing in sampling the, the, the microbiome of individuals and that specific um, age groups may have very specific microbiome associations. And what was really wonderful was that John LaPuma actually did have the longitudinal sample sitting in his freezer to do this, the, the study that we really wanted to do at the start but didn't have 10 years to wait around for samples. But John had six individuals, they're again cystic fibrosis patients, three of which have relatively stable pulmonary function over a 10-year period over which he collected serial samples from these individuals, and three of which show this precipitous decline over that same time span um, in their pulmonary function. And what he showed was that the diversity of individuals who had stable uh, pulmonary function remained stable in these individual, individuals over this 10-year period, whereas those that showed the pulmonary function decline also showed, uh, again, uh, a restriction in diversity in the lower airways, uh, their bacterial communities in their lower airways. And he also looked um, over time at these individuals at their specific microbiota, and what he showed was that there was compositional stability in communities of pa lower airway bacterial communities of patients who exhibited pulmonary function stability. So, again, um, the distance traveled amongst these samples tells, how, uh, tells you how compositionally similar the communities are. And you can see these are the unstable patients with declining pulmonary function who show these very dramatic shifts in composition. This is upon exacerbation and, and treatment with antimicrobials. So they travel greater distances. They are compositionally more distinct. And these are the ones that are showing uh, pulmonary function decline. And actually, in his study, he showed that antimicrobial um, administration was the primary driver of this compositional variation um, over time and instability in the communities in the lower airways of these patients over time. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about the upper respiratory microbiome and how it may actually act as an ancillary mucosal protective barrier. This is based on studies we've been involved in in chronic sinusitis, which is clearly a, a major issue um, clinically. It affects about 30 million Americans annually with a huge healthcare burden associated with it. Uh, a number of clinical features, including sinus pressure, headache, breathing difficulties, and loss of sense and of taste and smell in more severe patients. And again, we've come up with the same short list of, of bacterial and fungal species that are implicated in the pathogenesis of um, the, this disease. And as we heard earlier on quite nicely, sinus mucosa um, support a very robust biofilm colonization. And biofilms are really one of the normal modes of lifestyle for most microbes. These are communities of organisms that exist on surfaces and are encased in exopolysaccharide matrix, which uh, prevents them from being um, susceptible to insults, environmental, or antimicrobial, or otherwise. And as I showed you before, uh, there are robust uh, bacterial biofilms on the, the mucosal surface. This is from our group, as Emily Cope has generated this data. 
But also we see in cystic fibrosis um, these, these very robust biofilms on the surface and in chronic sinusitis on the surface of the mucosa, but also these organisms seem to be invading the submucosal layer in these individuals. And this is a feature, though this is not the right view, that we don't see in healthy individuals, suggesting that there may be reservoirs of organisms in the submucosal layer that per participate in uh, re, re uh, populating the, the mucosal surface following perturbation in chronic inflammatory disease of the upper airways. And so we began our studies with a pilot study taking surgical samples and again mucosal brushings. We're really interested in what's driving the mucosal immune response in these individuals. So these are functional endoscopic uh, surgeries, and this uh, alleviates the issue of, of uh, potential contamination because they're open surgery samples. Um, we uh, use, again, protect, triple lumen protected brushings. We have 10 chronic sinusitis uh, patients, 10 healthy controls. All were go undergoing maxillary sinus surgery, and they had a variety of preoperative and uh, perioperative antimicrobial administration. First thing we asked, again, we always validate that our cohort is doing what we think it should be doing. And one of the features of chronic sinusitis is uh, mucin hypersecretion. So we looked at MUC5AC expression and healthy versus the chronic sinusitis patients and saw a significant increase in gene expression. So our cohort looked good. Next, we profiled the bacterial uh, communities present and, and essentially showed that there was this overt collapse of the bacterial community composition in chronic sinusitis patients compared to healthy controls. They had far fewer types of bacteria present. They were really uneven communities, again, suggesting domination by certain organisms, and they lacked uh, bacterial diversity. And the composition of the bacterial uh, communities associated with the mucosa of the sinusitis patients was very compositionally distinct from that of healthy individuals. Here are all our healthy individuals grouping here together and distinct and separated from these two clusters of uh, sinusitis patients. You might note that there's a single healthy individual that clusters with this group of sinusitis patients. And it turns out when we went back through the, the medical records for that individual, they didn't have chronic sinusitis, but they had nasal allergies. An N of 1, but we had an N of 2 study earlier on, so N of 1, um, suggesting that perhaps nasal allergies may be associated with the burn colonization of the mucosal surface of the upper airways. What we could see was that disease severity, as uh, indicated by the sinonasal outcome 20, or SNOT 20 score, really unfortunately named, um, really uh, correlates very well with uh, this distinct colonization pattern on the mucosal surface. What was also interesting to us, and we think that's because we're, we, it's because we're sampling biofilms on the mucosal surface, is it didn't really matter whether individuals had antimicrobials or not. If you, they were healthy individuals, uh, they still looked like other healthy individuals, even if there was antimicrobial administration, as shown here in orange. Same here with the disease state. You know, antimicrobial administered and non-antimicrobial administered mucosal associated biofilms seem to be compositionally similar and more driven by disease state. And so we, we next asked, well, with which organisms are correlated with uh, disease severity? And this was just a simple Pearson's correlation. And as we expected, given our, given our alpha diversity collapse in these communities, we saw that a, a, quite a large number of uh, bacterial taxa were significantly negatively correlated with uh, SNOT20 scores, suggesting that these are lost from the, these communities. Lactic acid bacteria, and in particular Lactobacillus sacchii, was amongst was the, the Lactobacillus that was most significantly uh, negatively correlated with, with disease severity. On the other hand, we only found two taxa in this cohort that were positively correlated with uh, disease severity: Coronibacterium tuberculosis duricum and Coronibacterium segmentosum. And Coronibacterium tuberculosis turcum has never been known as a pathogen. It's a skin commensal. Everybody in this room has it on their skin. Um, but it, it, not to stereotype, it hangs out with some pretty bad neighbors, Mycoplasma, uh, Mycobacterium, rather, uh, Rhodococcus, uh, and Nocardia, just to name a few. And some of its very close relatives are known to be associated with, um, with infections of the mucosal surface of the throat. So 
we wanted to move beyond a description of a community collapse and pathogen or potential pathogen overgrowth and try to prove that this organism that is a commensal of the skin can drive acute infection um, under the right conditions of microbiome depletion in the upper airways. So we developed a mouse model um, to do just that. These are controls that got PBS. These are uh, animals who did not have antimicrobial administration and had Coronibacterium tuberculosis jericum instilled into the, the upper airways. Um, all of these animals got antimicrobials to deplete the, the bacterial community as we'd seen in our, in our patients. And then they received either the, the potential pathogen, Coronibacterium tuberculosis jericum, the potential protective species, Lactobacillus sacchii, or a combination of the two. And as I'd mentioned earlier, uh, mucin hypersecretion is a phenotype that's associated with chronic sinusitis, and this is just from a, a study that was published in uh, 2004 showing that. It's one of four phenotypes that we see in, in patients with this disease. And what we could see was that the controls looked pristine, but the, the mice that received antimicrobials and Coronibacterium tuberculosis sericum had this goblet cell hyperplasia and pink stained uh, mucin hypersecretion on the mucosal surface in their upper airways. This was not the case when we depleted the microbiome and instilled Lactobacillus sacchii, suggesting that even in the context of an impoverished bacterial um, uh, presence on the mucosal surface of the upper airways, this organism is not seen as a pathogen. What was really striking was when we co-instilled the Lactobacillus sacchii with the, the, the uh, Coronibacterium tuberculosis sericum, again, we saw protection of the mucosal surface uh, presumably uh, by the Lactobacillus sacchii against the Coronibacterium tuberculosis sericum. And this was just all validated by uh, goblet cell enumeration here, which showed a significant increase only in the group that received the antimicrobials and the Coronibacterium. But I think this brings up a really good point that it's necessary to move beyond description towards proving that some of these organisms that we're now identifying as potential new pathogens are, are, are truly are pathogenic, but it's context driven. It's in the, the context of a depleted uh, upper airway, in this case, uh, microbiome. And so to summarize, what we can say is that healthy subjects exhibit niche-specific microbiota in their airways, that there is a much lower bacterial burden in the lower airways of healthy individuals, and that that is significantly increased in patients that have chronic inflammatory diseases of the lower airways, as asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cystic fibrosis, for example. We're showing, and we've shown, that features of uh, air, lower airway disease are related to microbiome composition. And that's not enough. We need to push this forward to understand which specific organisms or their products are driving the, the specific features of disease that we are describing. The cystic fibrosis airway studies have allowed us to see that these are dynamic communities. They're clearly influenced by antimicrobial administration and disease progression in our patients, and that taking a snapshot may not be sufficient, that longitudinal studies may be far more informative as we move forward. And as I, I've shown with the upper airway studies, that we can use these wonderful techniques, these culture-independent approaches, to identify potentially uh, organisms that we hadn't considered to be pathogenic before, and moreover, to identify contexts in which organisms we consider to be pathogenic are not pathogenic. And it's in teasing apart those idiosyncrasies that we'll actually understand how to manipulate these communities to promote appropriate immune homeostasis that really is the, the issue with many of the diseases that we study. And finally, that the upper airway mucosal microbiome seems to uh, dictate pathogen susceptibility, and this is a common theme across microbiome studies, be it in the gut, the airways, the skin, uh, the vaginal tract, etc. So it's really understanding these interactions between organisms and the host that I think will lead us down the path of uh, more personalized treatment and development of novel treatments that are associated with microbiome manipulation. So there's a lot of people to thank, um, uh, not least uh, Nicole Abreu and, and Nabitha Nagalingham, who led the sinus studies, uh, Mike Cox and Martin Alger, who worked on the CF studies with us, Homer Boucher and Yvonne Huang, who we worked with for the uh, asthma studies, and of course, uh, the people who keep the lights on. Happy to take questions during the panel session. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Lynch. It is my pleasure to introduce our second speaker for this session, Dr. Michael Surrett. He's the Farncombe Family Digestive Health uh, Research Institute in the Department of Medicine at McMaster University. Dr. Surrett is currently a professor and Canada Research Chair of Interdisciplinary Microbiome Research at McMaster University. He is also co-director of the McMaster Genomics Facility and chair of the Research Subcommittee of Cystic Fibrosis Canada. His research addresses polymicrobial infections and bacterial pathogenesis, the human microbe in health and disease, and culturing the microbiome. Specific projects of his are focused on cystic fibrosis, asthma, pneumonia, sepsis, ulcerative colitis, and irritable bowel syndrome. His lab is currently supported by grants from the uh, Canadian Institutes for Health Research, Cystic Fibrosis Canada, Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of Canada, and the Canadian Foundation of Innovation. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Surrett, who will talk to us about culturing the respiratory tract microbiome, special considerations for sampling. Dr. Surrett. Learning, learning, learning lots, and uh, um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I, I do run a sequencing facility rather reluctantly, and a lot of our work revolves around uh, sequencing and many of the things you've heard about today. But uh, a big part of our work and our focus initially was really based on, on cultural approaches, really before the microbiome was uh, so uh, accessible uh, through molecular methods. And uh, we sort of stuck with that approach and, and we use it as a complementary method. And so I thought I would focus on, on those approaches today because I, I think there's some important lessons to be learned. Um, and the first is that the, the great majority of the human microbiome is, is culturable with a little bit of effort. And it's particularly true of the airways. Um, and uh, it's something that I, I think uh, sometimes we, 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 we neglect. And uh, most of our work has, has really revolved around adult patients in chronic airway disease. And, and there's a difference between uh, how long patients have been colonized versus not colonized. And we do a little bit of work in the healthy microbiome, which I won't talk about. But again, in, in chronic airway disease, um, we're approaching a little bit closer to stool and that we have uh, much higher bacterial loads. And we don't have some of the issues that we have with, with really low bacterial uh, loads. But one of the things that we've always done is try to understand uh, the nature of, of disease and pulmonary exacerbations in these, in these, in these patients. And uh, our studies have informed many clinical decisions and altered, altered treatment in many patients. Um, but I will point out that all of that has come from the, the culture data and not the molecular data. And I think that's something that we need to think about. So we now know that in, in chronic airway disease, particularly in, in cystic fibrosis, the lower airways are colonized by this complex polymicrobial community you've heard a lot about. I won't dwell on too much, but that community is made up of organisms that, that come from the upper respiratory tract, if you heard, as you've heard, as well as a few um, uh, chronic uh, pathogens that are associated with lower air, airway disease that uh, sometimes are present, as, as you just heard from Susan, in the, in the upper airways, uh, but not generally associated with the healthy upper airways. So we have this mixed community. These, these communities are unique to each patient. Each molecular profile is different. Each community is different. Um, and one of the important things to remember, and there was a surprise early on, is about half the genera and, and about half the burden uh, outside of, of exacerbations is really obligate uh, anaerobic bacteria. Um, and these are viable growing in the lower airways, um, certainly unexpected. Um, and uh, this is sort of the top 10 genera of, of organisms once you get outside the, the chronic infecting pathogens like uh, Pseudomonas and Staph. And I just put this up to point out that, that three of the most prominent groups are obligate anaerobes and the rest are essentially uh, uh, facultative anaerobes, most of which really prefer to grow anaerobically than aerobically. Um, and these are present in significant burdens. They can be as high as 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 uh, CFUs per mil and sometimes higher. Um, uh, 
We work mostly in adult patients, and sputum is our, our sample of choice. We do look at BALs and, and brushings and biopsies and tissue resections. Uh, but for routine sampling, uh, sputum is, is what's available, and, and working with clinical samples, this is what we use the most. And again, in chronic disease, the sputum is, is, is abundant and uh, a readily available sample and um, uh, is, is really uh, rich in, in microbes, and it is distinct from the communities that you see elsewhere. Um, so this is just showing, uh, comparing, um, I have a, there's a pointer here. Um, what we see in healthy BALs, again on a PCOA plot, in uh, uh, chronic uh, neutrophilic asthma and CF sputum, you can see that these are distinct communities uh, um, that are quite separate from what you get in, in the healthy BAL. Uh, these are double bronchoscopy uh, uh, samples, but again, likely some contamination here. And again, these look very much like the upper airways, uh, but again, separate quite distinctly from these other communities. Um, and just to point out, we do a lot of culture, and this is pooled culture data from anaerobic and aerobic culture. And one of the things you do see is a shift towards a greater burden of anaerobes and disease, and you see also a shift towards uh, uh, some of the chronic colonizing pathogens. So th this, these two asthma patients, in fact, are colonized with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, as this group of CF patients is. So these are distinct communities that we see in the lower airways. Again, in chronic disease, where we're really getting bacterial growth in the lower airways. So our primary motivation has always been to try and understand pulmonary exacerbations in individual patients. What's making this patient sick? Sick. And our hypothesis when we started this now, about 12 years ago, uh, was really that the polymicrobial nature of the lower airways was really contributing to disease. And if we understood what was going on better, um, could we use this to more effectively treat patients? And so that's been our motivation. And our strategy is initially was to use uh, culture-based approaches uh, when we really didn't have access to molecular or many molecular approaches. Um, and, and we continue to do this um, using both approaches. And again, I will say that when, when we've had clinical interventions, it's really based on, on the culture data. Um, I'm not going to. I'm just going to summarize a lot of work on on uh, a lot of years of work in, in cystic fibrosis, and and we really can describe exacerbations or mechanisms of exacerbations in CF as really being driven by the conventional pathogens, Pseudomonas, Stenotrophomonas, Burkholderia, and so on. Um, but really, this this the standard model of explaining exacerbations in adults really accounts for less than half of the pulmonary exacerbations that we see. Uh, we've uncovered a number of, of pathogens that are really just missed by conventional um, clinical microbiology um, and are difficult to tease out of the molecular data for a, a variety of reasons, which I'll, which I'll mention briefly. These include things like uh, uh, the Streptococcus miliariangenosis group, which is an important pathogen in, in some CF populations. Gamella, again, in, in some individuals, uh, uh, an organism, a commensal organism of the upper airways that we would normally dismiss. Um, and we're starting to see a, a bunch of atypical group A streps, particularly in, in asthmatic patients. Um, and then we do, we do really see um, or believe that there are true polymicrobial infections, where it's really an interaction of, of microbes that we don't think are necessarily pathogenic on their own, that interact with the pathogens, and Susan's alluded to this a little bit. Um, we've done a number of studies, uh, first in rats and then with a Drosophila model, which is really a high-throughput model to look at microbe-microbe interactions in a host, which really showed that uh, you can take an organism like Pseudomonas aeruginosa and mix it with commensal organisms which you don't think are pathogenic and really enhance Pseudomonas pathogenesis, altering virulence gene expression in the context of a mixed community that you don't see in individual infections alone. And this, this is something that we believe is going on in, in our CF patient populations that studies now to try and tease this apart. One of the challenges is these synergens that really act with the pathogen can do so at a relatively low concentration relative to the pathogen. So in these complex polymicrobial, polymicrobial communities, it's hard to tease that apart, and we're trying to get at that through gene expression. So I'm not going to talk too much about that, but the strategies that we use to sort of look at that. So these sorts of caveats about the molecular methods have been mentioned. Whenever we get a sample, um, we've got sample collection, processing, DNA extraction, amplification, sequencing, DNA analysis. We've all heard in various 
talks today about how each of these can really influence outcome. Even the same data through two different pipelines will give you, analysis pipelines will give you different results, DNA extraction and, and so on. These are all serious issues. In lower airway disease in particular, the, the accumulation of DNA uh, versus viable cells is really problematic. Um, and uh, in, at least in our data, we've seen different stabilities of, of DNA from different organisms over time. So um, it, it adds to the challenge of interpreting DNA uh, versus viable organisms. In the context of culturing the microbiome, there's this, these, these are the two points that we really have to deal about, deal with the most, and these really will affect your molecular data um, as well. And the first is how the sample is collected and how it's processed. So microbial communities that are alive and dynamic change the minute they come out of the body. Um, microbial gene expression uh, changes within, within seconds and minutes. Uh, there's rapid turnover of RNA. Uh, bacterial growth in sputum is very different uh, outside of the lungs and inside of the lungs, so that community changes very quickly. Um, as I mentioned, the majority of the community is anaerobic, or a significant portion of it is anaerobic. Um, so one of the things that we do with all our clinical samples is they're, they're transferred to an anaerobic environment as soon as they're collected. And this is critical if you want to capture that part of the community. Uh, much more critical if you're interested in the gut microbiome, uh, which is predominantly anaerobic, but even in the airways if you want to capture everything, that's important. Um, and then we try and get it to the lab as soon as possible. So in a research study, this can be very quick, but in the context of clinical samples, we're sort of stuck with the routine um, systems for, for moving samples between hospitals. This can take up to a couple of hours. We try and keep it into a couple of hours, and that actually works pretty well if it's in an anaerobic environment uh, on ice. Uh, the community changes a little bit, but not too much, and, and maintains the viability. And then we do all of our sample processing in the anaerobic chamber. Um, and then the culturing for the aerobes takes place at the end. Um, the, the aerobes really the aerobic bacteria are really not perturbed seriously by an anaerobic environment, but the opposite is true. Many of the obligate anaerobes are exquisitely sensitive to oxygen, so you lose them very quickly. So we do all of our processing uh, of these samples in the anaerobe chambers. Um, and again, for clinical samples, we, we really can't control uh, much more than this. Uh, when we're doing a research study, we can be there and collect the samples and have them in the anaerobe chamber um, really within, within a few minutes. Um, and our strategy to look at the microbiome is, is something we refer to as culture-enriched molecular profiling. Basically, we start with a, a sputum sample or a, or, or a brushing or a BAL. Uh, we do our standard profiling to see what's there, um, but then we also played out on a number of different growth conditions, and we use both selective conditions and non-selective conditions. Um, and what we originally used to do is we'd look at the plates and pick every colony that looked different and find out what it was. But now what we do is we, we treat each of these plates as, a, as a, essentially a biologically binned community, uh, and we do the molecular profiling on the entire plate. Um, and then basically adding up whatever we've grown and, and comparing that uh, to, to what's in the original sample, we can decide how much we've cultured uh, versus how much is not cultured. And uh, we described this a number of years ago uh, for the cystic fibrosis airway microbiome. The same set of conditions and, and methods that we use there, uh, we use for all the respiratory samples, and it really works quite well. Um, so again, there's about 12 anaerobic culture conditions, about 10 aerobic culture conditions, really captures most of the, the microbiome uh, from the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. This works quite effectively. Um, uh, in any individual patient, a subset of these uh, culture conditions will work, but it varies between patients, and so because the microbiomes are different, so we have to use all conditions. Um, uh, we've been equally successful with the GI tract. We're getting, depending on how deep, deep you sequence, 95 to, to percent or, or more of the of the organisms, uh, not recovering really low abundant organisms in some cases, but but really culturing the great majority of it. There we use a, a few more conditions. Um, the culture conditions are all the culturing that we do is all done on solid media, um, and and people often ask us why we do this, and and it. it it's an ancient technique in many respects, but it, it has a number of features which I think are really important. First, if you have a slow-growing organism and a fast-growing organism, it doesn't matter. Um, you can recover both of them because they're spatially segregated. Um, and you know, here's an example. We have one fast colony and, and four small-growing small slow things. This means that there's four times as many of the small one in the lung 
as the airways, independent of the size which it grows outside. Um, and the, again, these seem like trivial things, but they really make a difference. Um, for really low abundant organisms, however, mm -hmm. the challenge is often not that we don't know what condition that they grow in, it's that they're always dominated by the fast growing organisms. So one of the things that's a trick to getting the microbiome to culture the low abundant organisms is getting the more abundant organisms not to grow. And for example, in cystic fibrosis, we routinely add colistin and allodixic acid to suppress pseudomonas growth under some very non-selective conditions. And this allows you to, to recover the low abundant organisms much easier. So, so it's often not that bacteria need special things to grow, it's that you need to get rid of the fast growing ones first. Um, another thing that ha we learned early on when we, when we did the single colony picking is that a lot of bacteria look alike, especially things that grow in, in minute uh, white and gray colonies. And so if you look at, if you pick a handful of colonies, you really underestimate the diversity. And again, by sequencing everything, you really get to see that. Um, and the other thing is, is that the, this culture method doesn't exclude syntrophic or uh, cooperative interactions that you can have mixed colonies or satellite colonies where one bug grows very well and the second organism will only grow in the presence of that, un that other organism under these particular growth conditions. So you still capture all of those kinds of interaction even on solid media. Um, and, and so it's really a powerful method. The other thing that comes out of this is also for each of these uh, conditions, each of these biologically bin communities, you have a taxa profile. This essentially gives you a taxa by condition matrix, which, which if you're not interested in, in culturing the entire microbiome, you can go back and, and culture uh, specific organisms much simpler. Um, and not a lung example, but recently we've been interested in the gut microbiome and, and uh, have an extensive matrix to look at culturing the gut microbiome. And with two con just two conditions not typically used uh, routinely in culturing the gut microbiome, we can really enrich for lacnose brecciae, which, which is a popular group uh, to look at these days. And in just looking at two patient samples with two condition media, we find essentially about 18 new species of lacnose, which, which haven't been recovered before. So again, this really opens the door to really get targeted culturing as well. Um, and there's lots of valuable reasons to culture. Of course, being biologists, we like to actually have organisms to work with uh, more than just sequence, uh, to move back into animals to look for interactions and synergies and so on. Um, um, uh, and, and again, as a clinical exercise, the simplest thing that we can do is look for dominant organisms whose population levels correlate with disease. Now. Um, or disease symptoms, and so we're looking for abundant organisms that change and correlate with disease. Uh, this doesn't mean that low abundant organisms don't uh, necessarily co play a role in disease and the, the community structure is important, uh, but as a first pass, uh, we're missing a lot of important opportunities to treat patients by not understanding what the organisms driving disease are, and I'll just give you a few examples of that. So uh, this is an example I, I mentioned earlier about the strep milleri angiosis group that's, a, that's an important airway pathogen that's just missed by conventional microbiology. Every clinical microbiology textbook and most clinical microbiologists will tell you that it grows on standard CBA agar, which every respiratory sample is going to see. Um, in our original study, we grew it on a non-selective media. Um, this is BHI. The big colonies that you see here are pseudomonas, these little tiny colonies around that are the strep milleri angiosis group. In this patient, that organism outnumbers pseudomonas during exacerbations about 50 to 100 fold, um, responds to treatment, and, and in a number of patients, that's the driver exacerbations. But just to show you uh, how you can miss an organism that, that should be routinely cultured, these are the, the concentration of everything that grows in red here is on a on different sputum samples grown on CBA agar. And this is a semi-selective media uh, uh, for this uh, strep angiosis group, and you can see that, it, that it's really missed by several orders of magnitude. So you have bacterial burdens of 10 to the 8 uh, CFUs per mil in the airways um, in, in these patients. Uh, we've never cultured this organism at 10 to the 7 CFUs per mil or greater unless the patient's in, a, in the hospital or being admitted into the hospital. So it really correlates with disease. And in many patients, fluctuations and dynamics in this organism really correlate with exacerbations. Um, this is an example of some of the challenges with the molecular data. This is a typical molecular profile from an asthma patient characterized by high neutrophil infiltration, uh, culture negative by standard clinical microbiology. This is what our molecular profile looks like. All the usual cast of characters uh, dominated by uh, streps, of course. 
Um, of course, we cultured a lot of streps because there's a lot of streps there. Uh, but the one at the top uh, was actually the dominant one here and not, the, not a commensal strep. So that's group B strep. This was entirely missed by the clinical microbiology lab. And the clinical microbiology lab's first pass is looking for a beta hemolytic organism. This is normally beta hemolytic. Um, so we looked at it to see whether it was beta hemolytic. Here it is on, in, on standard conditions, not hemolytic. Um, if you grow it anaerobically, again, thinking that the lungs are anaerobic, there's a little bit of weak alpha hemolysis that you may or may not recognize there. This is standard clinical microbiology done on sheeps or horse blood. Um, but actually, the, what's relevant to the patient is human blood. Uh, we don't routinely use human blood in clinical labs, but we do in my lab. Um, and if you look anaerobically, this is a beautifully beta hemolytic uh, group B strep, and this is just missed by standard clinical microbiology. And this has popped up now um, a few times in, in, our asthma, in our asthma patients, and I'm wondering if this is something we're just missing routinely. Um, by all of the features, this seems like a perfectly normal group B strep. It's just that the hemolytic properties are a little bit different. Um, this is an example of another CF patient. So this is a patient that was chronically colonized by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, this is two weeks before a pulmonary exacerbation. This is the soroinpharyngeal flora, the normal flora that grows on a blood agar plate, uh, consistent throughout the exacerbation, admitted for hospital here. Uh, in this patient, the Pseudomonas just dropped out, out of sight on exacerbation. So it actually disappeared. We couldn't culture it. The clinical lab couldn't culture it. It's there, but just at very low numbers. But we cultured another organism at 10 to the 8 CF use per mil, and this was an organism called Gamella hemolysense. Again, a, a commensal of the upper airways. Just dismiss it as a pathogen in, in, in uh, the airways. You wouldn't think of it as, as being pathogenic. And again, uh, beta hemolysis is a nice way to, to think about pathogenic potential. And if we just took 96 of our isolates of Gamella and asked whether they were beta hemolytic, both aerobically and anaerobically, and none of them, of course, are are, are hemolytic on sheep's blood, um, but if you put them on human blood, particularly growing anaerobically, over 80% 80, 80 of them are beta hemolytic. So here's an organism when it's present at 10 to the 8 CFUs per mil in the lung, um, even if a clinical lab noticed it, would completely dismiss it as irrelevant. And yet, uh, in some patients, uh, this really correlates with disease, and again, is readily treatable if you know that it's there and use the appropriate antibiotics. To get back to our, our commensal streps, which you know dominate all of our microbial communities, which we generally think of as, as non-pathogenic, again, we just took our collection of, of uh, uh, 300 uh, streps from the freezer. We, we left out all the pathogenic streps, the group A's, the group B's, the strep nemos, uh, the millerine anginosis group, and just ask, again, about beta hemolysis. Um, one out of the 300 is beta hemolytic on sheep's blood, uh, but 56% were beta hemolytic on human blood, again showing the capacity of these organisms to potentially be pathogenic in the lower airway. So again, organisms that, we, that are part of this lower airway community um, really have the potential to be much more pathogenic than we think. Uh, another challenge that we face is that the lower airways um, are colonized by diverse communities, uh, and that diversity can actually be at the strain level. And this is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, this is the primary plate cultured from an individual. You can see all kinds of different colony morphologies here. These represent variants of the same uh, species um, that have really, or variants of the same strain that have really adapted, uh, undergone adaptive radiation in the airways to form very complex communities. This was observed uh, quite a number of years ago by Julie Forracker, who showed that there's real heterogeneity in antibiotic resistance if you look in these populations. Um, and and uh, uh, one of the things that, that's really obvious is looking at antibiotic resistance. So this is looking at the resistance to a number of, of antibiotics uh, from isolates from the same patient that are, that are clonally derived. You see this huge heterogeneity uh, both in, in the resistance profiles and, and uh, across different antibiotics. So this letter, level of heterogeneity within a population is a whole other level of complexity that's very hard to get at by sequencing. You can get at it by metagenomics, but if you do metagenomics on sputum samples, you start by sequencing about 94% of human DNA. The bacterial composition is, is, is rather low. And to really get accurate data on a single organism at a population level by sequencing requires really deep sequencing. Um, and it's also hard to predict phenotypes 
from sequence. Uh, and antibiotic resistance, particularly in organisms like Pseudomonas, which has many different mechanisms, this becomes very challenging. Um, uh, I'm going to skip a couple of slides, but one of the other things that happens with all of this culturing is we essentially have generated all of these miniature microbial, exp microbial ecology experiments. So in a current study we're doing with 10 patients where we've done extensive culturing at two time points, um, we essentially have 440 different of these, these microecology experiments set up, and we can ask across this whole bunch of experiments for co-exclusion or co-dependence. And we're just starting to mine this data. My uh, bioinformatics student, Fiona Whalen, wanted to do an experiment in the lab, so she looked through this, very simply looked for conditions where two bugs that should occur together excluded one another on a plate, or one was abundant, the other one would always be low. Um, and she went back, picked out those two organisms from the cultures, and was able to show that uh, uh, this strep intermediate inhibits the growth of, of Prevotella um, uh, just by looking at mining the sequence data. And uh, this was really quite striking. And if you let the strep have a bit of a head start, this inhibitory activity is much higher. Um, this was in contrast to uh, other data we have where these strains can actually facilitate each other's growth. So again, depending on context, it makes a difference. But again, mining this culture data, we're going to be able to tease out lots of these uh, codependent and co-exclusion interactions. So I think the big, to end, the big challenge that we have uh, moving forward is, is it's very easy now to generate lots of molecular data. Um, in a clinical context, we have to turn that molecular data into to what's equivalent to really quantitative microbiology. Um, and I don't think we're there yet. The, the molecular data doesn't match the culture data. Uh, we can culture everything, and we certainly culture all the abundant organisms. And so we have accurate measures of, organ of the abundant organisms, and we can't get those to match. We need to be able to figure out how to do that. Um, and if we can do that, uh, we can both improve our understanding of disease, stratify disease, alter therapies, and also uh, use this as a, as a really rapid measure of, of effective therapies. In cystic fibrosis, as an example, change antibiotic therapy, you wait four or five days to see if the patient gets better. Um, the bacterial response can be very rapid um, by culture. It's a little bit slower by molecular methods. But again, if you knew in, in 12 hours whether your antibiotic was, was failing, you could, you could move on rather quickly. So I think this is a big challenge. We're not there yet with some of the, the molecular data. Moving forward, the molecular data offers the promise to do this in very rapid, uh, real-time ways. But I think this is the challenge that we have ahead. Um, a number of collaborators, but I, I mainly want to point out Harvey Rabin, who reluctantly got me to do a uh, uh, convinced me uh, over many years to do a couple of experiments in CF that, that I thought wouldn't work, and um, that's, it's now been uh, 12 years or so that that's become our passion. And so um, I'm going to mainly thank him for bringing me into this uh, area and the funders. So thank you.
becomes paramount. I think that, uh, that finding the best way of getting out the most amount of nucleic acids of the highest quality is key. And even though I disparage kits, if somebody can give me a kit that's better than what we do, um, I'll use it in a heartbeat. Um, well, let's see, I kind of gave an overview of what we do, but I guess the biggest thing, you know, is for someone that's learning is to really pay attention to all the little details and don't take something that doesn't seem as the most obvious, I guess, not to take any bits of information for granted. Um, the other thing that I guess, when you, when you initially said to say a sentence or two about what's important, I kind of forgot that it was supposed to be for our particular talk, but I'd just like to say as far as where the microbiome field in general could be going as I really like what came up in some of the other talks is uh, the role of thinking about the function as being really important more so than just who's there and simply just looking at taxa. The context is important. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to build on as well, that if, if the goal is functional understanding, then I guess the take home from my talk would be that there's more than one way to skin the cat and you can go from a molecular standpoint and understand that. But at the same time, in parallel, there can be the approach of, of culturing, of increasing the complexity of the culture system. And that can be a tool for testing hypotheses and also trying to build functional understanding of albeit simpler, more stripped down, cleaner systems, but to test certain features of more complex systems, it can be a useful approach. So I, I, I agree with all of those statements. I'd say, so for the two questions we were asked to think about, <clears throat> one is what do we need in the microbiome field? I guess I think there are two things. One is to continue to develop um, correlative data and mine that for hypotheses about causality. Um, and then I think, you know, as, as Susan beautifully exemplified, moving from correlations to functional questions. I think that's critical. I guess the, the other part is, you know, what would I, what would I uh, say are the key points of, of what I spoke about in our work? I would just say that the respiratory microbiome really needs to be understood in the context of its relationship with microbiota in other sites, the upper respiratory tract, and um, uh, particularly in order to understand what's present in the lower respiratory tract, and then also <coughs> recognizing the impact of environmental agents as well in our interpretation of the data. I think for me it's, it's um, just because we've shiny new tools doesn't mean the basis of good experimentation goes out the window. Um, you will always get an answer with these approaches. That's their highly sensitive, you will always get an answer. So the first thing to do is to check, are you looking at the right thing? Is there a batch effect on your sequencing runs with the, the data that you, you present? And that's a, that's a, a standard uh, quality control at the, the start, at the outset of your experiments. And then secondly, validate your findings. Don't just give a description of what you find. Mm -hmm. Actually prove that some of these organisms are enriched and that they're doing something that you think is relevant to the disease or the, the condition that you study. Uh, again, just good basic experimental principles should still prevail despite the fact that we have these amazingly technologically advanced uh, approaches to assay our samples. Yeah, so um, I think the, the, in terms of the microbiome field in general, I, I'd echo that comment that, that it's easy to establish a correlation, but we really need to move towards causality. Um, with respect to my own talk, I think I, I hope I've convinced you that, that culturing approaches can be a valuable um, addition to molecular uh, methods, and uh, um, most of the microbiome, I, I would say, is very accessible to culture, uh, which opens up huge avenues for validations in vitro, in animal models, and so on by having the organisms. Um, and the other thing I think from an infectious disease perspective is I think, um, you know, we've, we've really narrowed down our list of, of respiratory pathogens in particular, um, and we look for a handful of things. And even if you think of something like community-acquired pneumonia, if you try really hard in community-acquired pneumonia, you can only explain about 50 percent of disease. Um, there's a lot of these bugs that we just dismiss have a lot of pathogenic potential, either alone or as part of communities. And I think we, the microbiome, particularly in the lung, is an opportunity to really expand that. 
and this extends uh, well beyond the lung, but I think this is a good place to start thinking about what really is a pathogen in our pathogenic community. So we're going to open the floor to questions. Um, try to use the mic. I'm going to start here and then work my way around. Thanks. I I'm Howard Kippen. Um, here at Rutgers, we are very interested in environmental effects on people, and we're interested in the effects on the microbiome. And we do a lot of experiments where we manipulate people's exposure to the environment over, or we, we either observe it or manipulate it, and then look at outcomes. So in that context, I want to ask a kind of an upstream question, maybe mostly for Dr. Charette, but anybody else. You said that you rely a lot on, induce, on, on uh, sputum. I'm wondering how much, if any, experience you have with sputum in healthy subjects, presumably then having to induce it, and what kinds of specimens you get, and can they be relied upon? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, sputum is not a great sample, but it's a readily available clinical sample, and, and as a routine thing, it, I think it's valuable. Um, the quality of sputum as you go to uh, healthy individuals or even individuals that are sick but are, don't produce a lot of sputum goes down dramatically. The other thing, though, however, is you can wash sputum and you can clean it up so you're really getting the, the mucus and you can wash away a lot of the contamination. You mean like picking out the plugs, yeah. which was the technique that Freddie Hargreaves yeah. invented at your institution. Yeah. Um, that actually works very well. And uh, again, I think we haven't done a lot of that, but uh, um, uh, one of Freddie's protege, Per Amner, does that a lot in his, in his asthma clinic, and it, it's actually quite helpful. And again, we, it would be nice if every patient or every sample we could go in and, and bronc and get clean brushings and so on, but we can't do that routinely. And so I think we have to figure out how to work as best we can with the samples we get. But I, but I do think you can pick out plugs and clean up the sputum quite a bit. Thank you. Uh. I'm Jack Sundaram. I'm one of the clinicians and pulmonologists, and you just made our life much more difficult. <laughs> and the reason I say that is um, our infectious disease colleagues always ask us for samples, uh, and we give them the lavage specimens, and in the context of the disease, a lot of times we're not sure what this lavage specimen means in terms of colonization versus the true infectious organism. And after listening to all these talks, I think you just made it much more complex to figure that out in terms of colonization versus disease causation because it looks like uh, what we may be culturing may not be the agent that's actually truly pathogenic <coughs> versus what we think our colonizers are now becoming pathogenic. Um, so I, I'm not sure there's a question here, but a comment. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I think <clears throat> the point that you make is an important point, but I, I actually think that these techniques are going to make things easier. And I think that, uh, I, you know, as a, as a pulmonary clinician, I spend a lot of time in the ICU trying to figure out, you know, why someone who clearly has some infectious process has a negative culture or why another person uh, has a positive culture, and I'm not sure that that's really what's driving the process. So. You know, I think that these techniques um, have certain advantages over culture in that they can be very quantitative. So one example of the approach um, that, that I gave of showing whether something is enriched in the lung compared to the upper respiratory tract I think can be useful, but I see it all as a complement to culture. And so um, something that comes up by culture, if it's a respiratory pathogen, you may be able to determine whether it's actually growing in the lung. And you may be able to see things molecularly that the clinical lab is just not going to be able to culture. So, so this high stringency culture is fantastic for research purposes. It can't really be um, done clinically, but it can be very important to tell us what are things that are potential pathogens that we don't think about as pathogens. So I do see these as complementary. Um, and, and I suspect that before very long, broad range sequencing, unbiased sequencing, is going to be something that's clinically available. I guess my bias would be that it's important to think of lavage samples in the context of what's present in the upper respiratory tract, mm -hmm. 
But I, I think it's actually going to uh, simplify rather than complicate the questions. So Jillian had um, mentioned something about having an internal standard for what she was doing. It's something we do in science often is have pooled standards that are shared so we can compare our labs and analysis. Any thought of trying to introduce that into lung microbiome, and if so, how might we end up doing it, or is that too premature? This way we can compare results across different groups and maybe start standardizing results from different analyses. Well, you know, part of the problem is, <clears throat> if we're going to the characterization of the microbiome, um, as we've shown, there's multiple steps along the way. From extractions to however you're going to process your nucleic acids, typically in amplification, to ultimately how you're going to get them into some machine to determine the DNA sequence and everything else. And so, in reality, you could potentially have standards anywhere along the way. So, um, putting in intact cells that don't necessarily exist in the lung microbiome that you add a known quantity so that when you do the extraction, you can normalize across something like that. Um, putting in intact DNA when you're doing, you know, the amplification that you then can track to make sure everything is all right and then determining that that sequence is being reported at a reasonable abundance at the other end. Um, I think all of it's doable. It's partly um, just one extra step, a little painful, you know, but I think as we have a better idea of what type of samples we want to work with, you know, because I think across the board we have the invasive samples and the non-invasive ones. We're getting information from both. You know, we may find that we have individual organisms that we know exist down in the lung that we're targeting and seeing at upper respiratory, other levels that we begin focusing on with sputum, with swabs, with anything else. But it all becomes very, a little bit difficult, you know, to then consider, then not only collecting that sample, but then adding you know, but you can be done right before the extractions, right before the amplification. And I would add that it's kind of common practice in environmental microbial ecology to have spikins, have mock communities, spikins at the outset of your extraction. And it comes back to good experimentation. You want a well-controlled experiment, controlled at all steps for potential for contamination or extraction biases. Uh, in these kinds of studies. It just doesn't seem to be as pervasive in human microbiome research. It should be. Um, maybe this is where the environmental microbial ecologists could stamp their mark on the field in, in uh, providing their experiences. But there's even synthetic um, genes that yeah. you can spike in that are not known to be homologous to any known uh, biological genetic content of any organism. So there, there's ways to do this. It's just not widely uh, used in the field, and it should be. And perhaps what we need is some kind of a white paper on standardization, but you're inevitably going to get somebody's backup because it's not going to, you know, it, it, it adds to the, the effort, and the, but it, it is well worthwhile. It's something that we do throughout all of our studies all the time. I, I would add virtually every choice, every set of choices that you make and how you work up and process a community leads to bias. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what uh, 16S primer set you, pe you, you pick leads to bias. And so I, I think that there are three points uh, that come out of that. One is um, you have to just be uh, uh, aware of the bias and recognize that there is bias in any of the choices that you make. You know, I showed some virome data, and the way you prep the sample will bias you towards small viruses or large viruses. Um, so recognize the biases. Um, the the uh, second thing is just to make sure that all samples are treated similarly so that the biases, even if a sample is, is, is biased, you at least have comparability between samples. And then I think maybe the third thing you were suggesting, which is an interesting idea, is should there be some sort of generalized sample mm -hmm. standard? You know, I think most of us in, in, include internal spikes or internal standards in our own microbiome you know, workup so we can be com confident that there's comparability from one set of experiments to another set of experiments. But is there some value in establishing some sort of um, synthetic or, or large volume community to determine whether there is comparability in data between labs who use different approaches 
and a way to compensate for that. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, the potential issues with standardizing things is that really your choices should be dictated by what your primary question is. If I'm interested in fungi, I'll use a CTAB manual extraction. I won't go with the kit that's out there. So then having something that's a standardized approach that you use this one kit for every sample, the uninformed will use that one kit for every sample, be their question a fungal-based question or a bacterial-based question. So I think it's more about um, informing newer investigators in the field about what the options are and why you choose. It's, it's informed choice, really, which I'm a big fan of. Um, but just it, ha having a feel for, um, you know, depending on what your question is, these are the, the choices that you make and how you collect or process your sample. And I think there's a need for that in the field. I completely agree. But standardizing and saying, you know, you only sequence the V4 region of the 16S, I think that's a little dangerous. So I think... Right. So, so Susan and I were involved in a project, a lung HIV microbiome project, and before we had a six or, or, or seven clinical and sequencing centers, and before we launched the project, what we did was take one set of pooled, uh, I forget what sample it was, an BAL. Or BAL, and each site independently extracted and sequenced and determined that we did not see a site effect on the results, and that allowed the data to be used uh, uh, together. And there's a white paper that is being prepared from that consortium to try and, and give some sense of what you might do under some conditions for some questions, um, but it's not, it's not gospel, is what I would say. Stefan Schwander, Rutgers School of Public Health. I'm interested in the connection between air pollution and tuberculosis development, and Learning from the current ATS meeting, I'm just wondering if it is possible to control all variables as you and as we as experimentalists like to do, because I have now really uh, understood that, for example, in context of cigarette smoke exposure, we are screwing uh, <laughs> cigarette smoke, it changes both sides, host immune response, i.e. respiratory epithelial or immune cell toxicity and function as well as the bacterium itself by increasing virulence, drug resistance, or biofilm formation. And I'm just wondering how it will be possible in your mind to sort these things out in, out in the context of, of, let's say, human-directed environmental respiratory research. So I, I've worked with a lot of epidemiologists, and what they've taught me is that you embrace variability, and the way to deal with it is have large studies with large numbers, and have the variability actually inform uh, what's actually going on across the population. So I think that, that that's, rather than trying to control for the variability, um, and it's something I feel we need in the field, are much larger studies so we can see uh, patterns of be it microbial colonization in, in um, pollution exposed individuals versus not, um, to make those initial relationships or those initial correlations before we delve down into specific uh, specifics of the relationship. So one way, it's an expensive way to deal with it, is larger population-based studies. Well, you know, with, with really good metadata associated with them. Maybe a complement to that <clears throat> would be for example, cigarette smoke increases alpha toxin production by Staph aureus, right? So if you had a specific question related to that, then I'm your girl, right? So <laughs> culture the Staph aureus and specifically challenge it with different concentrations in a lab setting. Now it's a lab setting, of course, but it can help you look at um, selected features of your system and specific interactions that the the more molecular approaches have indicated are important factors or important interactions, and then those can be tested specifically um, as a hypothesis. I'll, I'll just follow up on that. As, as um, Dr. Shore was giving her talk, I was thinking tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, you know, high redox areas of the lung up in the apex, that's where TB likes to reactivate. Um, and I think that bringing together these type of mechanistic studies 
with this type of population-based studies is really ideal and maybe you know, start with the mechanistic studies that can help you formulate hypotheses. Developing correlations in outbred human populations is really tough when everything has to be corrected for false discovery and you just need huge numbers of subjects. Um, but if you start out with a hypothesis generated through you know, this lung-on-chip or whatever ex vivo mechanistic study, you know, then you can ask much more targeted questions in a much more feasible, statistically practical way. And I can't resist. I, 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 I completely agree with what Ron just said. And I said, thinking you can also totally flip it. <clears throat> so like what Susan said, once you, gen you have this really large data set and you generate these hypotheses, we've all heard this morning about techniques where we can actually test them either in engineered systems, <clears throat> if you think of a very specific substrate that's turning on a specific population, we can test that, you know. Um, and it's just back to money. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, Anais Sotolongo, uh, also pulmonary critical care uh, clinician. And you sort of touched on that, but as someone who's sort of uh, dipping her, her toes in, in microbiome, if you will, so let's say you have a, a, a population that you wish to study and you, you have some BALs. What would be the next step to say, you know, I want to see whether or not there is some kind of difference between this particular population and just sort of normal healthy? How would you um, talk to someone who's a novice to say, okay, this is what needs to be sort of your next step? Well, I guess it comes down to, you know, are you on a hypothesis generating mission or do you have a hypothesis that you want to see pans out within the data? Again, it comes down to what is your question? So, uh, let's say you're on a hypothesis generating. Okay. Let's then you're just fishing. Then you just sequence yeah, everything. Just trying to sequence everything. <laughs> but then also, I think you have to be, you know, really careful about what's the quality of the samples mm -hmm. that you have. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very easy to go into the freezer and say, you know, I have 50 banked BAL samples, but if you have, you know, samples that were collected in the bronchoscopy suite without much attention to cross-contamination, that sat at room temperature for a couple of hours as they were transported back to the lab, and then, you know, spun down and put in the freezer, that may or may not be an ideal sample to work with. It's, you know, it's a fair bit of work and money to do it. So think about the samples that you have, whether it can really answer the question that you want. And as Susan said, what is the question? Um, what, for us, for example, virome studies, we can use that type of a sample. Um, bacterial microbiome studies, we don't use those kind of samples because an hour at room temperature may really change. The viruses probably aren't going to change much. Uh, this is for Dr. Lynch about the asthma and the CF populations, and I was just curious as to what you thought may be the mechanism. In this asthma group, if I remember right, the diversity increased leading to greater hypersensitivity, uh, airway hyperresponsiveness, whereas in the CF population there was a drop in diversity that led to worse CF outcomes. Yeah, yeah, and uh, again, um, we see uh, that uh, recapitulated in, in our HIV uh, patients, infected patients with pneumonia, they have increased diversity uh, compared to, to normal healthy controls and they have, obviously they have pneumonia. So again, it's about context, but it's also about what these organisms are doing as they interact with each other and the host. And I think that that's the critical key. I think Leo's talk today, that, I mean, this is where the field needs to go. Um, it kind of, while you might have some signature for health of our disease based on a, a cataloging approach of who's there, really the, what's driving the phenotype you see is how those organisms are interacting with each other and, and the host, and maybe even just subsets of those, those organisms interacting with each other and the host. And that's, that's the next realm that we need to move towards. So yeah, we've got a signature that increased diversity in asthmatics doesn't seem to be good. Um, decreased diversity in CF patients doesn't seem to be good, but what are the mechanisms that underlie the pathogenesis of both of the, those diseases? And they may be distinct or there may be overlap between the two. And it's, it's understanding the functionality of that community, of those communities that I think is critical to understanding how we might develop novel therapies to uh, treat different groups of patients. <laughs>
and I, I think um, diversity is a complicated thing, mm -hmm. and I think you should really think about what it means when you when you work with it. And a, a good example is is actually from John Lapuma's uh, CF paper. The patients that were stable and didn't see a drop in diversity versus the patients that were sick and saw a drop in diversity. Two of the patients that that were stable and actually diver diversity didn't change had very low diversity, which was the end point of the patients that got sick. So diversity as a standalone measurement might not tell you very much. So again, I think you really have to think about what the diversity is actually telling you. And again, I think the context of the disease probably in the, the immune milieu that's set up in the airways is helping to shape these. And that, again, is something that we really have to incorporate into into our um, our phenotypes that we're looking at. All right, so, uh, all right. Uh, one real last qu question. I, I, uh, the first one I'm sorry, <laughs> yes, let me get you. <clears throat> Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, in, your, in your talk, you, you mentioned that you, you found two, two blind bacteria, one of them from the gut and one from the mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think that the Trophorema whippoli story um, is a very good example of something that could conceivably be macrophage dependent or, or migration. So um, T. whippoli is an intracellular uh, organism. It's thought typically as a gut pathogen. It is present in the environment. It can be identified in the environment. And presumably, it's ingested. Um, so uh, how does it get from uh, the gut to the lung, if in fact that's how it goes? I mean, it's conceivable it could also be microaspirated and set up housekeeping through microaspiration. But if it's gut-derived, perhaps um, it's migrating in macrophages uh, that uh, uh, circulate between gut and lung. Um, the next step along that hypothesis is um, the uh, uh, Lung HIV uh, Microbiome Consortium showed that this was markedly elevated both in prevalence and in abundance in HIV-infected people. And we know that one of the mechanisms of pathogenesis in HIV infection is a leaky gut microbiome bar a leaky gut uh, microbial barrier and you get microbial translocation. Mm -hmm. So that makes it equally plausible that it's enhanced translocation of bacteria and macrophages containing bacteria that then migrate up to the lung. So I think that what you suggest- they still alive? Are they still alive? I mean, still active? Um, well, uh, uh, we haven't looked to know because whether they're still- An interesting idea. Um, so I want to again thank our panel members. Um, if anyone has any one of the last words, they, they certainly can do it now. Um, last if not, words. we're going to move to this part. Of the, <laughs> okay. If not, we're going to move to, the, to, to our last two speakers. After, thank you. <clears throat> and again, after our next two speakers, we're going to break to a roundtable. <laughs>
to uh, discussion groups. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Christopher Evans. Uh, Chris is an associate professor in pulmonary and critical care at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Uh, he received his PhD in physiology uh, from the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, although maybe it wasn't Bloomberg then. Uh, from that point on, he began to look at regulation and functions of airway mucins during a postdoc at Baylor. Uh, he went on to MD Anderson, where he developed, uh, I guess, knockout mice uh, for the secreted mucins, MUC 5A and 5B. Uh, and more recently, he's been using these mice to explore their fun the, the, the functions of the mucins in homeostasis and in models of asthma and infectious pneumonia. Dr. Evans, a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and, and the introduction there. Um, I'm going to just jump right into it and, uh, and talk about the tremendous, uh, the tremendous effort the lung has to make to combat the world around it. Uh, so the, uh, given that the barrier in the lung uh, at the alveolus is something that's less than a micron thick, uh, or, or, or just a few microns thick, uh, and the need for oxygen diffusion across that barrier all the time, despite being exposed to the elements, uh, the lung has had to adapt a, a, a massive defense that is at the same time exquisitely gentle. Uh, so if you take into account that at rest, you breathe about a half a liter of air per breath, and you do that 16 times a minute, and you have this many minutes during the day, uh, mm -hmm. each day you're getting about 10 to 12,000 liters of, of air into your lungs. Okay, and that's without doing exercise. It's, that's just a, a simple, sentient American life for you. So if you take that then and throw in that each breath that you inhale has about 10 to 20 million particles per liter, uh, that comes out to 100 to 200 billion particles per day, of which a fraction, albeit a fairly small fraction of microbes, but again, that puts you in the hundreds of thousands to millions of particles that come into your lungs and come into the contact with the airway surfaces on a daily basis. So we've adapted several ways of maintaining defense against these. Well, with the first line of defense, uh, again, against these uh, organisms that include uh, or, or toxicants, do we lose this guy again? Uh, toxicants that include uh, pollutants uh, from exhaust particles and things like that to uh, microbes and, uh, and, and allergens. Uh, we've adapted a, uh, a barrier. Uh, in this case, it's an epithelial barrier shown here in a mouse uh, trachea. This is a, a, a freeze fracture scanning EM of the mouse trachea, uh, in which you can see that there are epithelial cells, uh, and the epithelial cells that are present sit beneath a layer of mucus. And this mucus barrier is propelled out of the airways uh, to eliminate things that get trapped in it. And so it gets propelled out through the mouth uh, actually, in the nose, it goes down towards the mouth, so you have it kind of going both directions, uh, with the end result being elimination by expectoration or swallowing. Uh, as we consider what happens in disease states, though, uh, we have to take into account the balance between the components that are present in the mucus layer. Uh, so the mucus layer is comprised by uh, uh, a whole bunch of things. Uh, primarily, it's water. Uh, but the chief macromolecules that are in there are airway mucins, uh, the mucins here shown as uh, MUC5B and MUC5AC, uh, where at baseline, MUC5B predominates. So it's an uh, uh, abundant glycoprotein in mucus. It's the predominant macromolecule present. Uh, but in disease states, MUC5AC is known to increase. So this occurs in asthma, COPD, cystic fibrosis, uh, and other diseases. Uh, and MUC5B expression varies a little bit. It can go down and it can go up. Uh, and in these cases, uh, it, it, it relates to host genetics as well as the pathogenesis and pathobiology of disease. Uh, but in the end, the, uh, the end result of having dysregulated mucus production uh, can be obstruction in the airways, changes in acute clearance of particles that do get inhaled, uh, and long-term colonization of the airways or uh, uh, chronic or acute infections. So with that said, what we're interested in understanding better is a um, interaction between things out in the environment, uh, and, uh, and that includes these uh, things that we talked about inhaling here, uh, and uh, the genes that regulate things such as mucins, but other immune factors, uh, and uh, the individual susceptibility to disease, uh, which in the end work together in conglomeration to give you a host response that's either uh, working in homeostasis uh, or dysfunctional under pathophysiological conditions. 
Uh, now, a question then is, to what degree are commensals and things like that present in the lungs uh, at baseline? Uh, and, uh, and to what extent are these dysregulated uh, beyond the acquisition of just brand new organisms that are known pathogens uh, in disease? So the approach that we took to get at this originally was, uh, was, was somewhat limited and, and, uh, and in scope a, a, a mistake from a, the standpoint of, of host defense. Uh, what we were considering was the situation that occurs in asthma, which is a process called goblet cell metaplasia. Uh, this is a situation where the airway surface is in a healthy state, which is shown here on the uh, left. Uh, in the healthy state, there's very few goblet cells present on the tracheobronchial surface in asthma, uh, uh, in health. Uh, but in asthma, their numbers increase dramatically. And so this mucin overproduction phenotype is something called goblet cell metaplasia or hyperplasia, depending on uh, some of the epithelial programming involved. It's something we can replicate in mice by having them inhale an allergen, uh, in this case an artificial allergen uh, that was used for this study to uh, generate a, a goblet cell phenotype across the airways. Uh, and we found that if you get rid of MUC5AC, you can protect against an asthma phenotype. Uh, in the mouse, this is a, a bit similar to what, uh, what Susan showed earlier with uh, uh, the methacholine challenge that was used to evaluate bronchoconstriction in uh, humans. But in the mouse, what you see here is with exaggerated, uh, you see exaggerated responses to inhaled methacholine, this bronchoconstricting agent, when mice are challenged, in this case with an aspergillus oryzae extract. Uh, there's no live aspergillus in here, it's, it's a pulverized uh, uh, a crude extract. Uh, but when they inhale that, uh, after repeated doses, they develop an asthma-like phenotype uh, that is not present in wild-type mice that were just exposed to saline and is not present in MUC5AC knockout mice. Uh, to, the ex to explain this change in phenotype, uh, what we found is that the, uh, the phenotype was actually fairly simple. And again, this is our simple strategy going into this, uh, which was do the airways change, does, air does airway plugging change in them? So does physical obstruction of the airway lumen change? And that's what you can see pretty distinctly in these two images here, is that the wild-type challenged mouse, this is in response to methacholine, uh, has an acute secretory response. So the airway has closed on itself uh, due to smooth muscle contraction and the accumulation of a mucus plug here. Uh, but in the knockout mouse, this is absent, and then we quantified it over here. Uh, but in the end, what we were able to determine is that there was heterogeneous plugging that caused that state. So we thought, okay, well, that's very interesting, and that, that explains one of the mucins in the lung. That's MUC5AC. And, we, we knew that it was important to look at in this disease because in models of disease, we see that down here wasn't significant. But it actually was already very high to begin with. Uh, and so MUC5B is present at high levels of baseline. And in the end, the, the two uh, were at about equal levels in the disease state. So this is a log two scale. There's about a 50-fold difference between these two uh, and about a 50-fold difference uh, uh, in the uh, expression of MUC5AC. So I'm tracking poorly here. Uh, and in the expression of MUC5AC in the asthma model. So they end up balancing each other out. So we asked, what about MUC5B? And what we found with MUC5B was that the question wasn't as simple as we would have uh, thought it was, at least as simple as it was for MUC5AC. Uh, and since we were able to get rid of MUC5AC, cure mucus plugs, and make everything look nice in asthma, we thought, well, we should try doing that with MUC5B. We generated MUC5B knockout mice and found that they had a very profound homeostatic phenotype. Uh, in this case, uh, in the summary slide here, it just shows uh, on the uh, far left there where there's a decrease in mucociliary clearance that results in the accumulation of materials in the lungs. I've drawn you know, very generic bacteria there, uh, but there's lots of different things that end up down there. Uh, and in the end, it results in an inflammatory response that doesn't come to a full resolution. In part, that's due to the accumulation of materials, but also it's in part due to the lack of the ability to clear inflammatory cells back out of the lungs by that same mucociliary escalator. Uh, so in the process of doing this, we became interested in how macrophages may play a role in that. Uh, so as we had de defects in mucociliary clearance, which are just shown here, uh, that were specific for MUC5B, uh, we found that the mice accumulated bacteria in the lungs. This occurred over a very chronic period. So it was uh, within three to six months we started to see differences in the mice. Uh, and in any point where they were moribund, in this case, uh, you know, mostly dead, uh, we found that they were, is, there was an even greater accumulation of bacteria in their lungs. Uh, so the assumption then was that they were dying of an infection. And if we put them on antibiotics, they survived. Uh, so the green line here is mice that were treated with uh, uniprim and batril and their uh, food and water from weaning onward. Uh, and you can see that the MUC5B knockout mice lived, but the untreated mice uh, failed to live, uh, since death isn't an endpoint. Uh, so the, uh, 
The interesting thing, though, that we did find from this was that in these untreated animals, despite having a complete absence of mucociliary clearance function at baseline, it, they, they survived for three to four months without any major problems. In fact, only half the mice were dead at six months. Uh, and some of these mice could make it out to a year. So it wasn't the only process involved. Uh, and what we found was that there was a, uh, a second effect that we had to account for. Uh, but as we, as we started to try to tease that out, it made us think, what, what is accumulating in the lungs over this long period of time in the, in the mice? So we started by using a culture-dependent method to do this. And in part, this because we started this project about 10 years ago uh, and, and really weren't in a stage where we could be doing anything uh, too sophisticated at a molecular level. So using cultures where we just ground up the lungs and plated them on TSA auger plates, and either grew them in a micro uh, microaerophilic or, a or aerobic conditions, uh, we found that the, uh, the mice accumulated over long periods of time uh, various species that were consistent with the oral uh, and nasal microbiota. Uh, so these were staph and strep species. But what really distinguished the ones that were dying uh, was the accumulation of staph aureus in the lungs. Uh, so whereas uh, with outbred families, uh, the, the, the homogeneity may be uh, something that's present in health but in disease uh, pretty bad, in our inbred mice that are in an otherwise path-free facility, it, it was able to stay fairly homogeneous. I assume if these mice were out in a barn or out in a cornfield, they would have a very different response than what we find in a, in a mouse facility. So in the end, though, what we're able to determine is that the accumulation of bacteria in the lungs of these guys uh, was somehow getting them to become more susceptible to a opportunistic infection, in this case with Staph aureus, uh, which is what we found in here, but we certainly did not prove it as the, uh, as the only possible cause. So a muck fight bee knockout mouse is an interesting thing from a biological standpoint. Uh, and uh, one thing that we were uh, uh, turned on to, in fact, I was told about this in passing uh, in a conversation with David Earl uh, when we were uh, uh, both standing outside of a room in a, at a study section when we were uh, recused for, for conflicts of interest. Uh, and, uh, and David said, well, you know, Chris, have you ever looked at the supplementary data that was in Prescott Woodruff's Blue Journal paper on TH2 high asthma? Uh, and, and the long story short is that where they had found that, yes, there was increases in muc 5 ac in uh, people who had very, I'll just call it very allergic disease, Something that was really remarkable in them is that they had an almost 90% inhibition of MUC5B expression levels. So you have two populations of asthmatic patients, one in which they have high MUC5B and MUC5AC, and one in which in their paper they talked about a MUC5AC to MUC5B ratio uh, that was predominantly driven by the absence of 5B. Uh, so this genetic diversity in the host is something that we think plays an important role, but it also says that exploring uh, phenotypes in a MUC5B deficient setting is, is not completely uh, uh, academic only. Uh, so it gets to the question of, of how might these th situations in which one chronically lacks a, uh, a given mucin, in this case MUC5B, uh, how does that relate to disease? And so we started looking into all of the background data on microbes and, and the development of asthma, and it starts with the risk side of things. So the Copenhagen studies that showed, look, people with asthma have a lot of, of these potential pathogens in the lungs. Uh, but then it carries on to things that are found in the steady state, things that we're learning more and more with the, um, uh, uh, the, the models and the molecular techniques that are being applied here, uh, as well as what's also known about exacerbations. And we heard a little bit about the chlamydia and mycoplasma studies, uh, as well as the, uh, the known roles of viruses in acute asthma exacerbations. Uh, which again, as you get this one polar side of thing where infections are bad, it brings back the other side of things where actually exposure to bacteria are, are, are quite good in terms of preventing allergy, and that's the classic hygiene hypothesis and the role of the gut microbiome in dictating the development of atopic disease. So it was quite confusing, uh, which I, I hope I've left you with that today. Uh, so what we've decided to do is to try to approach this from an experimental standpoint using our mouse models. Um, and at this point, what we've done is to just work for the last year and a half on building processes in which we can explore the microbiome in the mouse to try to dissect out a lot of these questions that have been asked about oral versus nasal versus tracheal versus lung uh, and, and in ways that are much more invasive and, and permanent than, uh, than can be done in a human. Uh, so what we've done is we've taken uh, two strains of mouse that are widely used for asthma studies, the BALB-C and the C57 Black 6 line. Uh, and we compared different body sites. Uh, so we had the, the bronchovial lavage, in this case through a tracheostomy. Uh, so we're able to bypass the oral cavity, in this case surgically. Uh, but then we also take oral swabs from the mice. 
After performing the oral swab, uh, the, the mouse had already been decapitated, uh, but we picked the mouse's nose by removing the hard palate and coming in there and, uh, and lavaging the upper sinuses uh, with a very small amount of, 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 of saline. Uh, and then we, uh, we tried also to, uh, to sample the trachea. In this case, when we put the tracheal cannula in, we would put it in, turn it a few times, take it out, dip it in a buffer, and then put it back in the, in the mouse. So it was to try to subsample out that way. Uh, and in the end, uh, what we're able to do is to find a lot of things that are very consistent with what are being talked about in the human, is that there isn't much there to be detected. Uh, so if you look on the left, we have C57 mice, and we look on the right, we have Balb Cs. Uh, and we had negative and positive controls, which in this case are PCR controls. Uh, I'll show mock controls in the, uh, in the MySeq data that we, we show and the results of, of sequencing. Uh, but these were just samples to just sort of show where our band should be. Uh, but what you can see is on the left, uh, on the far left there, you can see that in the saline group, there's really not much we were detecting in the nasal and tracheal samples. And I think this is in large part just due to the very sparse sample sizes. Uh, it takes about three microliters of PBS to fill a mouse's uh, um, um, uh, sinuses. So it's not something that we can really get a really rich sampling of, uh, at least at this stage. Uh, but the pulmonary and oral samples gave us uh, uh, better results. Uh, and we could see that in the C57 mouse, uh, there really wasn't that much of a difference uh, between the saline and the allergen challenge. Uh, and I should uh, tell you that these are all amplified out to about 40 cycles to be able to get the bands that we're seeing here. So it took quite a bit of PCR to, to get to where we were going. Uh, and, uh, and but what you can also see is with the valve C, there was this, maybe a slight difference in, in the two, uh, perhaps more in the nose and trachea, uh, perhaps more in the uh, bronchovia lavage fluid. Uh, so we see that there is potentially an interesting difference to tease out. Uh, so um, before I go on, I need to say that uh, the data generated from here on out is through a tight collaboration I had with Kathy Lozapone. Uh, who was recruited to UC at about the same time I was. And we have labs right next to each other and offices uh, nearby. Uh, so we, we, we've done a lot of this uh, together. And, and, and so the, the work that's being shown here is work that could not have been done without her assistance. So uh, just that acknowledgment, unless I forget at the end. Uh, but when we've uh, looked at the differences in body sites, what we find is that if you take, regardless of challenge and regardless of mouse strain, uh, when you take a look at these, it's very difficult to find much signal uh, and the unweighted uh, or weighted versions of these uh, when you compare mock controls. So the mock controls here are these sort of lighter, larger circles here, the, the, uh, the, uh, the translucent ones here. Uh, these are the mocks for each of those body sites. Uh, and the mocks in this case include the buffer that was used for the surgery. And then from each of the days we did this, uh, the surgeries, we did the extraction separately. And we also had a separate extraction mock. Uh, and those don't show up separately on here, but I'll show that uh, data in a minute. Uh, so each of these includes the controls of things that were exposed to the mice and exposed to our hands while we were working with the mice, and the other during DNA purification steps. But what we can see is that the, the richer uh, population, uh, the oral population, was something that was able to separate out from all the others. Uh, so we think that a, a big part of this is probably the abundance issue. However, the, the abundance issue did seem to follow some strain uh, differences, and that strain difference uh, could be seen irrespective of body site. So these same uh, samples that were shown here as being, um, I'm going to have to kind of go two-handed here, uh, the same samples that were being shown as, as either oral or the other organ sites uh, along this axis here are showing up with the Balb C line, uh, whereas the C57 is showing up over here. Again, a lot of this we have to control for variables in terms of what's in the mouse's cage with them, what's in the, uh, every other step that we do along the way. Uh, but it was a surprise finding that we didn't have a, a little bit more of a crossover distribution there. So when we take and look at this with a, 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 a clustering by body site, again, uh, what we found was that there was the, uh, a suggestion that there was a difference in the oral uh, group that was found in the, um, um, the Balb sea mice. And when we look at this, we could also find what appears to be uh, here on the, um, it's easier to see on the left side in the unweighted uh, unifrac uh, PCA analysis, you can see that the AOE challenge mice, these allergic mice, have a slight difference in the oral microbiome population compared to uh, the saline mice. Uh, but again, these other uh, body sites didn't seem to uh, show a difference. When we look at this with C57, uh, Again, because the data were so much noisier, it was really hard to find that, uh, that same thing. But there was a slight trend towards the oral uh, body site here shown with the yellow circles uh, 
uh, being different than the rest. Uh, but again, even the mocks uh, tended to show up in, in different places here. Uh, so we're still, trying to, we're still struggling with how to deal with this in terms of other uh, procedures that we might be able to do to improve that, uh, which I will, uh, I'll come to at the end. Uh, so I wanted to come back really quick, though, to talk about this issue of the mocks, because to us this was the most surprising and frustrating part of this. Uh, and what I'd like to do is to direct your attention over here to the right first. And what may not show up all that well here is that this down here it says E, that's a, uh, an extraction control. And this down here that says S, that's the surgical control from the same mouse, uh, from the same set of, of studies. So this is the sample where the lavage fluid itself and the, uh, uh, the, the pool of buffer that was used to, do the, uh, to work with the mice uh, was used uh, and, and extracted. And this over here is the extraction of the exact, uh, at, at the exact same time, of just pure water. And what this is showing is that when we look at the taxa level here, um, I'm just going to go over here. When we look at the taxa level here, they're identical. And this is a kit thing. Because if you look at the one right next to it that was done on a different day, you got this and this. The surgical control matches the extraction control, but they're both showing you a lot of noise, and it's that same noise that shows up as the predominant uh, 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 taxa in all of our samples. So we've got to figure out a way to increase our signal to noise. Uh, and at th that point, I'd, that's where I would really like suggestions and help from the people who are here. Uh, when we looked at that at the C57, uh, we didn't see much of a difference, though potentially a trend uh, towards a, um, uh, some firmicutes and, and bacteroides that might be showing up in the oral group. Uh, but this did appear to be different in the Balb C mice. Uh, the Balb C mice showed a little bit more of a background in the BAL fluid and the saline condition compared to the allergic condition uh, with organisms that didn't show up in the mocks. So that was kind of nice. Uh, but this also got confusing because these are plant. So these are, are rhizobiales. I, I don't really know what they are, but uh, we don't know if they're coming in from the chow, from their fruit, if they're coming in from something that likes to grow in aspen chips that they live in in the, uh, the mouse facility. Uh, we, we, or is it something in the water? Uh, so we're, we're a little bit confused as to uh, where they might be getting these things. But we know that these are different, uh, appear to be different between the challenges, but certainly different from the, uh, the controls. Uh, but what again is clear is that there is a, uh, a, a distinction of the, uh, the uh, oral group from these. So uh, we're pretty confident that when we have a, a robust and, and, and uh, um, a, a richer uh, population to choose from that we'll be able to see differences. Uh, and in the end, I think uh, uh, I'm going to just summarize by sort of going off on a few of these uh, potential ways that we can make improvements here and, and really ask for suggestions uh, as we go forward, uh, which is uh, can we uh, somehow figure out a best way, uh, best practice to get rid of some of these uh, plant, water, and soil associated uh, uh, contaminants? Uh, or are they real? I mean, again, is this in their food? Is it in the, um, uh, is it something that's an effect of, of their environment? Uh, at the same time, is this something that we are introducing with our challenge solutions? Maybe inhale, inhaling PBS in that particular mouse, uh, the water that we can't necessarily in an aerosol chamber control as being sterile and clean throughout the process. Uh, they, they get these challenges once a week for four weeks. We don't sack the mice until three days after the last challenge. So. There's been some time to clear it, but we don't know what gets into the lungs and stays there as well. Uh, however, that said, we don't know what gets into people's lungs when they're walking outside here in, uh, in New Jersey versus last week in Colorado versus next week in, in Boston. Uh, we, we don't know what ge geographic kind of controls to consider uh, in that case as well. Uh, so I'm going to actually just stop here. Uh, and just say that this is sort of where we're at with our, our background goals uh, in terms of procedures uh, and say that our long-term goal in the end is to really get back to the question of the mucins. Uh, MUC5AC and MUC5B being these essential genes that are involved in, uh, in, in asthma as well as in host defense. Uh, and the next step in this whole process is to use these more precious mice uh, to do our experiments. And in fact, we could argue that using a MUC5B deficient mouse may be a better way to be doing a lot of the experiments we're doing now in terms of having a mouse that already has a challenge to it and might be accumulating uh, uh, organisms in it. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Um, we have uh, one more speaker.
And I, I think we will hold questions for Chris until Dr. Shore speaks, and then we'll have a brief question period before we go on to the roundtable discussions. Dr. Shore is leaving. <laughs> um, it is uh, my great privilege to introduce to you Dr. Stephanie Shore, who's a senior lecturer at the Harvard uh, Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Shore uh, received a PhD in respiratory physiology from McGill and then did a postdoc uh, with Dr. Jeff Drazen at the Harvard School of Public Health and apparently never left. Correct. Um, how nice. Uh, her research is now focused on a mechanistic basis for obesity-related asthma and on the role of the microbiome in pulmonary responses to, uh, to uh, air pollutants, especially ozone, and I'm particularly interested in that, so I look forward okay. to this. Thank yeah. you. I just want to see if this, okay. She's set. Yeah, I'm set, thank you. So um, as you heard, my, my primary interest um, is, is in obesity as a risk factor for asthma. And it's been established now for about 10 years or so that that is the case, and we know that from large epidemiological studies showing that uh, the obesity increases the prevalence and incidence of asthma, and that weight loss improves asthma outcomes. Um, the, the key thing that is interesting to me is that st typical asthma therapeutics are less effective in obese asthmatics, and what that suggests is that the mechanistic basis for this asthma is not the same as what these asthma therapeutics were designed for. Um, and I was, I've been struck by the fact that the epidemiology says that the risk of asthma with obesity is greatest in people who are non-atopic, so they don't have allergy. And so um, when we were beginning these studies, we therefore searched for um, a way of inducing an asthma-like phenotype in mice uh, that was not an allergic stimulus. And we settled for various reasons on ozone, in part because we were already interested in it, um, because I work in a department of environmental health. And uh, we know it's a common air pollutant, and we know that on days when the, when the ozone goes up, asthma emergency room visits go up. It causes asthma symptoms, including airway hyperresponsiveness, and it induces a neutrophilic rather than an eosinophilic inflammation in the lungs. And importantly, it does cause greater decrements in lung function in obese than in lean subjects. Um, so these are some data from a colleague at the School of Public Health, Joel Schwartz. He did a, an epidemiological study in which he looked at changes in FEV1, so that's an index of airway function for those of you who don't um, think about such things. And when you inhale ozone, your FEV1 goes down, meaning that your airway is narrow. And you can see on the slide that that is true to a greater extent in obese than in lean individuals. Um, so we've been trying to understand the mechanistic basis for this. And we've been using obese mice to do that. And this is the one that I'm primarily going to be talking about is the DBDB mouse. It is a mouse that lacks the receptor for leptin, and so it eats voraciously, and it has a low metabolic rate, and even by the time it's eight weeks old, it is quite obese, as you can see from this. For those of you who study mice, they can weigh something like 60 grams by the time they're um, eight weeks old. So that's a really big mouse. And most of that 60 grams is extra fat. Um, so this is just to show you that there is, in fact, a, a lung phenotype to these obese mice. Um, I don't know if I can get the uh, pointer thing to work on this. I don't think I can. Yeah, okay. But, oh, I'm not very good with those things. Um, hopefully you'll be able to, to see what I'm talking about. Basically, the two lines on the bottom are lean mice. The two on the top are obese mice. And what you're, oh, you have a pointer. Okay. There we go. Okay. What, what's being measured here is airway responsiveness, which you've heard a little bit about already. It's a canonical feature of asthma. And so we plot pulmonary resistance as a function of methacholine dose. And when resistance goes up, it means the airways are obstructed. And so what you can see here um, are lean, and obese mice, the open symbols are ozone-exposed mice, and the closed ones are air-exposed mice. 
And there's several features here I wanted to point out. First, even before you give ozone, these mice are already hyper-responsive, so they already have a feature of asthma. And then even without giving the ozone, sorry, even without giving the methacholine, just giving ozone in the obese mice causes the resistance to go up. But that doesn't happen in lean mice. And then the last thing is that the airway hyperresponsiveness that occurs in response to ozone is much greater in the obese mice than it is in the lean mice. The other feature of these mice is that they get more inflammation in response to that ozone. So there's very few neutrophils, which is what's plotted here in air-exposed mice. When you give ozone, the neutrophils go up, and if you're obese, they go up even more. And so we've been using these mice to try and understand the mechanistic basis um, for um, the impact of obesity on the lung. Um, and one of the things, uh, sorry, the other thing is that um, the bowel protein, which is just an index of injury induced by ozone, is also greater. So one of the things that started to become quite clear to us over the last, I don't know, I guess it's five to 10 years period of time is that the gut microbiota in obesity are quite different. And here you can see that both in obese mice and in obese humans, um, there is a difference in the ratio of bacteroidetes to firmicutes um, that changes with obesity, and you can see the same kind of change in human subjects. And so it seemed like at least the gut microbiome could be impacting um, the responses that we see in the lung. And the reason that we started to really think that was, oops, sorry. We had done a metabolomic analysis of lungs um, from obese and lean mice that we had exposed to air or ozone. And what's listed here are just those metabolites that came up on the metabolomic analysis, analysis for which we knew that these were microbial mammalian metabolites. They needed microbes in order to get synthesized. And what was interesting to us is that for every single one of them, there was either an impact of obesity, or there was an impact of ozone, or there was an impact of both. And so it seemed like there was something about the microbiome that was contributing to this response. The other thing that was established from this metabolomic analysis is that the lung of an obese mouse um, has a very different set of nutrients available to any bug that might like to grow there. So this is uh, a whole bunch of different fatty acids. I, you probably can't see what they are. It probably doesn't matter too much what they are. 100% um, is what the lean mice had. And you can see that for virtually every single one of these fatty acids, there's more in the obese mouse. So they have more fatty acids. And this is a list of all the carbohydrates that were present in the lung. And again, 100% is what the lean mice have. And you can see that virtually every single one of them, particularly glucose, um, is elevated in the lungs of the obese mice. Now, these obese mice are also diabetic, so it's not that surprising that the blood would have more glucose, but the lung also has more glucose, right? So the things that bugs have to grow, the nutrients that they have available to them in the lungs are quite different uh, in obesity. And so we started to ask whether obesity-related alterations in the microbiome might be contributing to the asthma-like phenotype of these mice. And we started off with a really simple question, which was just, do alterations in the mi microbiome, and we, we were thinking mostly gut microbiome at that time, um, affect pulmonary responses to ozone in lean mice, and then we thought if that was true, then we could go on and start looking at obese mice. And so the way that we set out to answer that question was to uh, treat mice, lean mice, with antibiotics. Now, we could have used germ-free mice to do this. We were reluctant to do that because we knew that there were developmental changes in the immune system in germ-free mice, and we know that the immune system impacts the response to ozone. Um, so instead, what we did was we got mice in, in this case, there are C57 black sixes from Taconic. We let them acclimate in our barrier facility. 
We then started them either on regular drinking water or water that we supplemented with antibiotics, and the list of antibiotics is up here. We let them go for about two weeks. Uh, just before the end, we collected feces so that we could do some um, microbiota analysis. Uh, we exposed them to ozone, and then we, 24 hours later, we measured lung function. And this is just a very fast and dirty way to tell you that the antibiotics did what we thought they were going to do. In other words, they had an effect on the fecal um, DNA. So most fecal DNA is actually bacterial DNA, and you can see that that was reduced. Um, but it turned out that it wasn't uniformly reduced. So this is just a qPCR, phylum-specific qPCR. And you can see that for the most abundant phyla uh, in the gut, um, there was, in fact, uh, a reduction in uh, the prevalence of those uh, uh, bacteria with the antibiotics here. So this is just the CT value, so the inverse of that would be the prevalence. Um, but that there were other bacteria which were not terribly prevalent, which when you gave the antibiotics, they actually started to accumulate in the lungs. So we had created an environment in which they liked to grow, uh, perhaps because um, their normal um, uh, other bacteria were no longer present. So we like to now think about this treatment as being more an alteration to the gut microbiome than uh, a reduction in the gut microbiome. And so this is what happens um, to the airway responsiveness in these mice. So I want you to first just point your attention to what happens typically with ozone, okay? So that is the uh, air, are the air-exposed animals that got water, so they're the white bars here. You can see a small change uh, with methacholine in the pulmonary mechanics. And that if you get ozone, so that's this bar right here, you can see that there's an increase in airway responsiveness. Now, if you got antibiotics, it didn't affect your response to air. You can see that here. But if you got antibiotics and you were exposed to ozone, then you had a reduced response um, to the ozone. So clearly, the microbiome matters. Um, we've subsequently done an analysis using just one antibiotic instead of the sort of four uh, altogether. And so this is the four altogether versus water treatment. And you can see that pretty much you get the same thing with ampicillin, with metronidazole, with vancomycin, but that neomycin doesn't have that effect. And so we're now starting to do uh, 16S pyrosequencing on this in order to figure out which bugs are present and absent in, in each one of those groups. Um, you can also see that, that, uh, that the antibiotic treatment also affected the inflammation that we see. So here's the uh, inflammation that we see in ozone-exposed mice. It, again, air doesn't do anything. Um, and so you see this reduction in the number of neutrophils if the animals got antibiotics. Um, so our primary interest in all of this is to try and figure out why this happens. What is it that bugs do that causes this reduction in airway responsiveness? Um, and so one of the things we know about ozone-induced airway hyperresponsiveness is that in normal mice, these inflammatory mediators, IL-17, TNF-alpha, and osteopontin, all matter. And you can see, in fact, that they're all elevated in ozone-treated versus air-exposed mice. But what you can also see is that the antibiotics do nothing. So it isn't that they're affecting the inflammatory response at the level of the kinds of cytokines that are generated. Um, so what else could they do? How do they do this? Um, so we know that dietary macromolecules, metabolic precursors, can be acted on by microbes in the gut and to produce metabolites, and that those metabolites can get out of the gut, they can circulate through the blood, and they can affect basically every organ in the body. And we know that there's certain metabolites that have already started to be linked to certain diseases. So for example, Short-chain fatty acids uh, seem to protect against allergic airway responses. 4-EPS seems to be linked to autism-like behavior, uh, at least in mice. And there's now, uh, you know, an increasing recognition that TMA and its metabolite, TMAO, are linked to heart disease. And so we wondered whether there was a bacterial-derived metabolite that might be contributing 
to airway hyperresponsiveness. And so we did a metabolomic analysis of both the blood and the lungs from these animals. And it's a huge data set. I don't have time to show you everything. Um, but I thought I would show you one very tantalizing piece of data from that um, analysis. And that is that when we looked at the lung tissue, and actually we got the same data with serum, so these bile acids, which I'm showing you right here, come from the serum to the lung. We, we know that they're produced in the liver, so that doesn't, you know, it shouldn't be too terribly surprising. They get secreted into the gut, they get taken back up out of the gut into the blood, they circulate to the lung. And the main thing to note here is that in these antibiotic-treated mice that we exposed to ozone, so these were the ones that had the reduced responsiveness, what we found is a marked accumulation of bile acids. And I've shown you two, but every bile acid that was on our metabolomic list was elevated. Um, the interesting thing here, I mean, is first that bile acids are known to be, uh, you know, metabolized by gut microbiota. But the other thing is that they have receptors in the body. So there's receptors, FXR receptors, nuclear receptors that respond to bile acids. And there's also a G protein coupled receptor called TGR5 that responds to bile acids. And what's notable is that it's actually expressed on airway smooth muscle. And in other types of, of um, tissues, when you add bile acids to TGR5, it causes induction of cyclic AMP, which for an airway smooth muscle would result in bronchodilation, which is basically the phenomena that we saw. So that doesn't mean that these are responsible for the you know, reduced responsiveness that we saw, but this is where we're starting to go, is to use this kind of metabolomic analysis to try and understand what it is that the, um, the microbial metabolites do. So basically the bottom line was that the data suggested that there was in fact a role for the microbiome in regulating responses to ozone. And so we thought, okay, well, well then maybe we can use um, a lung, uh, uh, rather a fecal transplant to try and look at whether or not um, feces matter for the response that we see in obese mice. And so um, we knew that um, other people had shown that this could be true for other obesity phenotypes. So in this particular case, um, these were data in which people used a, a protocol in which they kind of did the same thing that we had done in the sense of giving antibiotics to reduce the fecal load in the gut, um, and then coming back with either feces from lean mice or feces from obese mice. And what you see here is the hyperinsulinemia that is typical of obese mice, uh, which are also diabetic, um, is reproduced in these mice simply by giving the mice um, feces, uh, lean mice feces from obese mice. And so we decided to do the same thing. So we took a whole bunch of mice, we put them on antibiotics uh, for two weeks, and then we started to do different things. We either then started gavaging them just with water, or we gavaged them with feces from lean mice, or we gavaged them with feces from obese mice. So they were all initially lean. Um, and then we exposed them to ozone, and then we measured pulmonary mechanics. And so again, what we're trying to re reproduce here, um, this is what happens, as I showed you before, in obesity. And I'm gonna just start with, in obesity, we see this airway hyper-responsiveness without doing anything to the animals. So can we see that if we just give obese feces to the mice? So the answer is, we certainly see an effect, but it's exactly opposite to what we would have predicted. So here, um, just focus on the, the blue and the red because those are the lean feces and the obese feces. If anything, the obese feces is actually reduced responsiveness compared to the lean feces. And we think that the potential mechanism of the, that may have to relate to short-chain fatty acids. Peter Turnbaugh some years ago showed that obese mice um, have increased production of short-chain fatty acids. Um, and we know from other data, this is a study by Trompette et al., that if you treat mice with a high fiber diet, the short chain fatty acids in the blood goes up and their airway hyperresponsiveness goes down. And so it's conceivable, we don't have the data yet, that the 
elevated short chain fatty acids in, in, the, in mice that got obese feces might be reducing the airway responsiveness, not elevating it. So clearly, the obese feces are not contributing to that aspect of the response. So what about um, the bowel protein? You remember that in obesity, with ozone at least, we saw elevated airway injury indicated by bowel protein. Can we see that with fecal transplant? So the answer is yes, we can. So here's the lean feces, um, and so here's ozone, here's air, and when we gave obese feces, we see an increase in the response to ozone. So we are reproducing that response that we see in obese mice just by giving the mice, the lean mice, obese feces. Uh, remember that in obese mice, you see that ozone on its own causes an increase in baseline pulmonary mechanics, and we can reproduce that too. In mice given lean feces, you give ozone, pretty much nothing happens. Uh, in mice given obese feces, you give ozone and there's an increase in the pulmonary mechanics. And then the last thing is that the airway hyperresponsiveness that you saw, the difference between this and this, this and this, is obviously much greater in these mice than it is in these mice. And so here what you see in these mice is that there's really not very much difference between air and ozone in the mice that got the lean feces, but in the mice that got obese feces, we're able now to cause an increase in airway responsiveness um, by giving ozone. So we could reproduce that part of the, ph the phenotype as well. Um, I don't have time to show you, but we know from studies that we've done in obese mice that IL-33 seems to contribute to that um, innate airway, assorted to that augmented airway responsiveness that we see with ozone. And we've shown the same thing here, that there's augmented IL-33 released in these mice versus these mice. So the bottom line here is simply that transplant of obese feces transfers aspects, clearly not all, of the obese lung phenotype, even though it, in this case it did not induce obesity at all. So you don't need the obesity, you just need the, the uh, obese feces and the, clearly the microbiota that live in that feces. Uh, and in closing, I just want to thank particularly a graduate student in my lab, Helen Cho, who did the first study uh, Jeff Brand in my lab, who did the second study, um, Kurt Curtis Huttenhauer and members of his lab who are now starting to help us with the sequencing of the feces from all of these mice. I would particularly like to thank the NIEHS who has been supporting this work, and I have a tiny piece of advertising, which is that we are currently searching for an assistant or associate professor of airway biology, and I personally would love it if that person was doing microbiome-related stuff or obesity-related stuff. And so I invite any one of you who is looking for a faculty position um, to apply. And the second piece of advertising is that there's a symposium on obesity and metabolism in, at the University of Vermont uh, this coming October. Anybody who's interested in obesity, we'd really like to have you there, especially if you do microbiome-related stuff. Uh, this is the website, but you can just send me an email and I'll give you all the particulars. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes of, for questions to either Dr. Evans, who can help, or Dr. Shore uh, before we uh, do our roundtable discussions. Does anybody have? I, I have one for Dr. Shore, um, and maybe this is just because of the way I look at the world. Yeah. Do 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 any of your experiments? I would guess they would be ones you didn't present. Address at all the effect of the ozone on measurement of microbiome on a aspects of microbiome. So we have not done it yet. We are certainly interested in doing it. Um, clearly, the fact that the metabolomic analysis of the lung changes so drastically with ozone in terms of microbial metabolites, it suggests that there is going to be a change. Now, you would think that that change would be in the lung, right, because you inhale the ozone through the lung. But I will tell you that the, when you give ozone to mice, there are some profound changes in the liver as well. And the liver um, is already known to be affected by and to affect via bile, bile acids the gut microbiota. And so it could be that either or both are changed. 
That, that's very interesting. And your ozone protocol is what concept, is how long, I guess? So our ozone protocol is three hours, and it's a 2 ppm protocol, which is basically very high for ambient concentrations, but um, it's what's typically used in mice to induce airway hyperresponsiveness. It's what we will soon use in humans. <laughs> <laughs> 2 ppm? No, don't do that. <laughs> I'm sorry, point two. Point two, yes. <laughs> Other questions? Questions for Dr. Evans? I could ask him one, too, because you mentioned it. It wasn't the thrust of your data. It was, it was about the hygiene hypothesis. Right. And what do we know about the interaction of the hygiene hypothesis and effects on the microbiome? Anything? <laughs> well, I mean, I think the, 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 the microbiome itself is really central to that, that concept of the hygiene hypothesis, which is that the particles and you know a lot of the microbes that get into the oral and, and gastrointestinal tract and uh, things like that play a big role in priming systemic immune responsiveness. Uh, whether that has a role in upper and lower airway tract, I think that's that's what uh, the, um, the the goals of our studies in mice and, and studies in human are, are really about. You know, is, is how much of a of a of a, a flora is there. Um, this concept of whether or not there's a live flora there, I mean, we certainly believe that in the case of cystic fibrosis and, and late stages of COPD and things like that, there's plenty of, of organisms living there. Um, that may be one side, but the other is this uh, sort of constant ebb and flow of bacteria that come in and out of the lungs during, during respiration. Uh, so things that get trapped in the mucus while they're in the mucus are, are in also being presented to the epithelium uh, but eliminated quickly, but they're being pre presented as well to alveolar macrophages and dendritic cells, things like that that are surveying the landscape throughout. Uh, an emerging concept that, that's been worked out fairly well in the small intestine, uh, and we're pursuing now in the lung, is that the mucin glycans that are present in the, uh, on the mucus layers in, in these uh, sites uh, uh, and I'll give an, a specific example of what happens in the gut. So MUC2, which lines the small intestine, is heavily fucosylated. Fucose residues on MUC2 are capable of binding a lectin, C-type lectin receptor called Dectin-1 that's present on dendritic cells. When they present fucose to Dectin-1, and then they, you can uh, also then expose to bacteria, to LPS, or even to a valgumin, an allergen. The dendritic cell responds to that by priming tolerogenic responses to naive lymphocytes. So the presence of the mucus layer there is what's telling the small intestine to not develop allergy to every single foreign antigen it seeks. It makes a lot of sense there. I argue that a similar phenomenon can occur in the lungs, uh, where the glycans that are present uh, on mucins, and in particular we've explored MUC5B, which is sialylated and, and found a, a receptor for it called Siglac F in the mouse or Siglac 8 in human is an alpha-2,3 sialicide receptor uh, that's linked to shift phosphatase and other dampening types of signal transduction pathways that will help to reduce inflammation. Uh, and again, it can be a very transient response. So the web is complicated. Yeah, the, oh, host, yeah. the host gets in the way of the microbiome. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Um, Sarah? Yeah, so I can tell you that we've done this with four different models of obesity. OB mice, DB mice, high fat diet mice, and CV fat mice. We always get the same phenotype. They have innate airway hyperresponsiveness and they have increased responses to ozone. For that reason, we don't really think that has anything to do with leptin. Right, well obviously it's a trend. Right. Yeah, so I don't know the answer to that question. Um, actually, you might know the answer. When, when you take an obese mouse and you make it, you make it lose weight, does the, do the microbiota go back to normal? Yeah, I know that in people who, who start, if they're obese, they have a, a different 
uh, gut microbiota, if you make them lose weight, their microbiota eventually goes back towards looking like more like a lean person's microbiota. So I'm assuming the same thing would happen in a, in a mouse. Well, thank you again very much. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Weisel to speak to our future schedule. Right, so what our intention was with the round table was to have uh, four different groups, one talk about sampling of lung microbiome, one on applications to environmental exposures, one on sequence analysis technique, and one on applications to respiratory disease and life cycle. And see if we can come up with an idea of what, where, from where we stand, what might be some of the most promising avenues to go towards the future with what's realistic, what's not realistic, um, to help move each of those areas forward. Um, and with the, um, we're not that far behind schedule. And I, we built in a, a bit of time here. We figured we'd try for about an hour. We're going to have a facilitator and a repertoire in each group. They'll come back and, to the whole group, summarize the concepts of that. And then we'll uh, thank everyone and depart on our way. So there's table set up in the other room. If you did not sign up for one of those groups, um, we'll push you into one of the groups. So we have enough. The idea is to have about 10 to 15 people in each of those groups so we have a reasonable amount of discussion. And hopefully this will uh, come up with some new ideas and introduce ourselves to others that, in a way that we can't in a larger forum. Right. So we'll, we'll go to the room right behind us. Oh, there, there should obviously take some coffee and roam around, go to the bathroom, and, and uh, with the idea of reconvening in this room.